principles, uh, high yield principles in microbiology, uh, basic bacteriology, bacterial structures. Um, we're going to do the structure, chemical composition, and function appendages. Uh, there are two appendages, flagellum and pilus fimbria. Flagellum is composed of proteins. Uh, its function is motility, pilus and fimbria. Its composition is glycoprotein. And its function is mediate adherence of bacteria to cell structure, uh, cell surface, sorry. And sex pilus forms during conjugation. Specialized structures, spore. Uh, it's made of keratin-like coat, diplo dipicolonic acid, peptidoglycan DNA. Uh, function is gram positive, it's only gram positive. And survival, its function is survival basically. So it resists dehydration, heat, and chemicals. Cell envelope, uh, the comp I guess these are like the uh, cell envelope. Uh, so capsule, discrete layer, uh, usually made of polysaccharides and rarely proteins. Uh, function is protect against phagocytosis. So that's very important. Know that the function for capsule. Uh, slime layer, that's loose network of polysaccharides. It mediates adherence to surfaces, right? Uh, plays a role in biofilm formation. Uh, this is going to be important because of uh, urinary infections caused by catheters. It's because of this component right here. So, I can, so this is also known as glyco calyx. So that's the component that's important. Uh, you need to know about the long reaction. Here it is. And and that anthrax as D glutamine capsule. Okay. In the capsule, so anthrax has D glutamine capsule and Coulomb uh, reaction. So, what is that? It's a chemical reaction in which antibodies bind to bacterial capsule. So that's what that is. Okay, so far that's it. For this uh, slime layer, glycocalyx, remember that uh, it's important for this. Uh, they ask you what component of uh, the layer or what is it called. So they won't give you slime layer, they'll give you this. Outer membrane, outer leaflet uh, contains endotoxin, LPS and LOS. Uh, we'll do LPS right now. It comes later, but we'll just do it so we know what it, that is. Oh. 
So LPS uh, effects complement system, macrophages, and tissue factor, right? So in complement system, it activates uh, C3A and C5A. We learned from Immuno that these are NFI lock toxins. Uh, and this is neutrophil chemotaxin. So uh, the C3A will decrease BP and cause edema. So that's why you get the swelling and I guess redness as well. That actually comes from this, but okay. Uh, C5A is neutrophil chemotaxin and that also causes edema. The effect on macrophages, uh, it attaches to CD14, that's the marker for macrophage. It was, they asked a question about this. Yeah, in the last block. Endotoxin receptor uh, will go activate uh, the inflammatory interleukins, so that's 1, 6, and TNF. Um, it also activates uh, nitric oxide, so that will cause decrease in BP as well. Uh, tumor necrospecta will cause decrease in BP as well, and both of these will cause fever. Um, the effect on tissue factor is that uh, coagulation, DIC, that can happen. Uh, okay, so I'm not sure what I wrote here. Endotoxin, uh, edema, nitric oxide, DIC death. Okay, so LPS can cause all of these uh, or has all of these, one or the other. DIC death, outer membrane, TNF alpha, uh, O antigen plus core poly plus lipid A, these are the components. Extremely stable, interleukin one and six, uh, neutrophilic chemotaxin and shock. So this thing here is here, so let's read that now. So outer membrane, outer leaflet uh, contains endotoxin, uh, LPS and LOS. Uh, this is only in uh, gram negative. You won't see that in any other types. So that's important. Uh, embedded protein points and other outer membrane proteins. Inner leaflet, uh, phospholipids, gram negative only. <coughs> uh, endotoxin. Lipid A induces TNF and interleukin-1 antigenic O polysaccharide component. Most OMPs or outer membrane proteins are antigenic. Porins, they transport across outer membrane. Uh, so this is the cell envelope, so this is what they're going on about. Uh, periplasm. So what is periplasm? That's the space between cytoplasmic uh, membrane and outer membrane in gram-negative bacteria. Okay. Cytoplasmic membrane. So that would be that thing right there. Over there. Uh, and outer membrane in gram-negative. So in this. So it's this space right here. Because that's the outer membrane. So the space between the outer membrane, this thing, and this thing is known as the periplasm. Um, there's peptidoglycan in the middle. So you see that right there. That's in the middle. Uh, so what's this function? It accumulates components exist, exiting uh, gram negative cells, including hydrolytic enzymes, for example, beta lactamases. So that's its function. Uh, cell wall. Peptidoglycan is sugar backbone with peptide side chain link cross-linked by transpeptidase. Okay, so this cell wall right here or this. It's peptidoglycan is a sugar backbone with peptide side chains cross-linked by transpeptidase. It's a net-like structure gives rigid support. So that's what that's important for. 
and protects against osmotic pressure damage. That's important too. So that's the function of cell wall. Rigid support and protect against osmotic pressure damage. Cytoplasmic membrane. That is phospholipid bilayer sac with embedded proteins. For example, penicillin binding proteins. Uh, we'll learn about that as well in pharmac of micro. Uh, so phospholipid bilayer sac with embedded proteins, for example, penicillin binding proteins and other enzymes. Lipotake acids, right? So that's this thing right here. Uh, gram positive only extend from membrane to exterior. So it goes from it membrane to exterior. Site of oxidative and transport enzymes. PBPs involved in cell wall synthesis. Okay, so that penicillin binding proteins are involved in cell wall synthesis. This is why penicillin attacks this thing right here uh, and destroys the cell wall and that's how you damage the bacteria in antibiotics. Uh, Lipotypoic acid induces uh, TNF alpha and interleukin one. Okay, so that's the virulence factor, I guess. So that thing right there. So we learn about the flagellum right here, pilots. We learn about capsule. Uh, we learn about cell wall, peptidoglycan, cytoplasmic membrane. This is gram positive. Notice how it has a it doesn't have an outer membrane. Right. So peptidoglycan, it's a uh, sugar and its components are N-acetyl glucosamine or also known as NEG, NAG. And another component is N-acetyl muramic acid or NAM, N-A-M. Uh, they're connected by peptide bonds and sometimes this is what gets stained. Uh, we'll learn about that. Immune response triggers uh, stimulate cell wall and cell membrane and lepatoic acid. Okay. Uh, and then gram negative outer membrane and LPS. Nice. I'm not sure what I wrote there, but okay. Okay. Ready to move on. Uh, for LPS, remember that the components are, where'd it go? Right there. For LPS, uh, the components are polysaccharide, lipid A. Lipid A is highly toxic and O antigen, which is a uh, target for antibody. Okay, uh, I think it comes, so don't have to worry about, about writing it down. Okay, uh, stains, gram stains. First line lab test in bacterial identification. Bacteria with thick peptidoglycan layer retain crystal violet dye. Uh, I think before we go on, we need to know how staining occurs. So I'll just go through that. First, there's fixation. Then you have uh, crystal. You add crystal violet. Then you have Iodine acid. So, uh, then you have decolorization. Then you add saffronin. This is the 
counter stain. All right. So that's how it works. Uh, this is in my colic tissue. Right, so that's how staining works. First you fix it, then you add the crystal violet dye, and then uh, you add the iodine acid, uh, which affects the mycolic tissue. Then you add the decolorizer, and then you add the counter stain. So that's how it works. So first line lab test in bacterial identification, bacteria with thick uh, peptidyl glycan. So that would be this. the gram positives. Thick peptidoglycan layer retain crystal violet dye, right? So this is only in gram positive because that is what uh, that is. And it will retain this. So what does that mean? Uh, it just means when you add the decolorizer, uh, it's not going to decolorize. So that's why these are like purple or violet uh, gram positives. Uh, bacteria with thin peptidoglycan layer turn red or pink. That's because after the decolorizer, it will get the crystal violet doesn't get retained in the uh, peptidoglycan layer here. So what it's going to do is it's going to retain the saffronin, the counter stain. And that's why uh, saffronin is red or pink, right? Like saffron. Uh, saffron is red. So you can think of it that way. So you get red or pink with counter stain. Uh, this is a mnemonic. These bugs do not gram stain well. Uh, these little microbes may unfortunately lack real color, but are everywhere. Okay, so these are like your uh, intermediates. Uh, the intermediates are these. So you have gram positive, you have gram negatives, and then you have intermediates. So gram positive, gram negative, and intermediates. So these are the intermediates, the Borrelia, Leptospira, Trypanema, Garnell, Chlamydia, Rickettsia, Mycoplasma, Bacteria, Mycobacter tuberculosis, uh, and Lepri. These are all your gram positives, uh, staph, strep, bacillus, clostridium, corny, listeria, nocardia, actinol, right? And then you have your gram negatives. That's your nazaria, pseudomonas, salmonella, shigella, proteus, yersinia, e. coli, klebsiella, and uh, others, etc. Okay, so these ones, uh, the intermediates, they don't stain well. That's why I have them in blue and green. Uh, so you have trypanoma and leptospira. Leptospira is actually uh, gram positive. Nope. Wait. Oh yeah, I mixed it up with listeria. Leptospira is also intermediate. Uh, why does it not stain? Because it's too thin to be visualized. Uh, for mycobacteria, cell wall have uh, has high lipid content. That's why. Remember that. This is why it doesn't stain well. Uh, mycoplasma and uroplasma, they don't have any cell wall. Legionella, rickettsia, chlamydia, bartonella, anaplasma, and ehrlichia. All of these, uh, why do they not uh, stain well? It's because primarily they're intracellular, right? Uh, they don't, what that means is that they hide inside a cell. So when you try to stain a bacteria, you would need to stain them by going inside the cell, which is not possible. That's why they don't stain well. Uh, so primarily they're intercellular. Uh, also chlamydia lacks classic peptidoglycan because of decrease in muramic acid. Uh, muramic acid is uh, again, uh, part a uh, component of peptidoglycan. Remember I told you about N-acetylglycosamine and that's NAG and N-acetylmuramic acid, that's NAM. Uh, 
NEM, which is held together by peptide bond. So that's why this is decreased. Uh, uh, you won't get chlamydia because it's uh, opportunist, no, not opportunist, sorry. Uh, Intracellular, but it can stay outer as well, I think. But it still doesn't, it's not going to stay in it because of decrease in mordecic acid. They do ask you this, so remember that. Uh, gym sustain. Uh, clumsy Rick tripped on a burrowed helicopter plastering gems. That sentence doesn't look natural, so it's not going to help. Just remember, uh, gym sustain is just. Chlamydia, rickettsia, trypanomas, trypanomes, um, Borrelia, uh, H. pylori, and Plasmodium. I don't think they test you on this stuff, like the stains. You just need to know why something wouldn't stain well. You need to know that. But they won't ask you, okay, which one of these are like gonna stain by gym stuff or something like that. Okay. Uh, Periodic acid shifts, uh, shifts test uh, stain. Stains glycogen, mucopolysaccharides used to diagnose Whipple's disease or Whipple disease. Uh, it's caused by Trophoferima Whipple or T. Whipple. So this is a better one. So pass the sugar. So periodic acid shift is for it stains glycogen and mucopolysaccharides and it kind of makes sense because like the mnemonic because whipple you can think of it like it's whip and it's sweet so that's what pass is used for then you have zeal nielsen stain or carbol fusion stain uh, it's used for acid fast uh, for example mycobacteria uh, no cardia as well. Okay, uh, no cardia as well. Uh, stains mycolic acid in cell wall. So that's this thing right here attaches to that. I think, uh, okay, I placed this in the wrong place. So the crystal violet is the thing that's going to. Mycolic acid or tissue. Okay, yeah, it's mycolic acid. Iodine is not an acid, my bad. <laughs> So then we have, okay, I'll do that again. Acid fast bacteria. So that's your mycobacteria, nocardia, stains, mycolic acid in cell wall, protozoa, for example, cryptosporidium, oocytes. Uh, you have ormine grunman stain is more often used for screening. It's inexpensive and more sensitive than zeal Nielsen stain. You have India ink. Uh, this will only show up when we're looking at Cryptococcus neoformans. Uh, Mucerimine can also be used to stain thick polysaccharide capsule red. Okay, so when you're gonna look at this, you're gonna think of this thing right here, but uh, they actually test you in a one where the background is white and this is red. And it's because of this. Mucerimine can also be used to stain thick polysaccharide capsule red. Right, so it's this one and it stains thick polysaccharides on cryptococcus neoformans and that's what it looks like uh, silver stain uh, you need to know about these uh, for at least legionella because that's where it's going to show up when they're talking about that uh, the silver stain are so what stains in silver right so it's hel helicobacter pylori or h pylori legionella bartonella Hensley and fungi, which is uh, coccidiidae, coccidiidae, 
the IODs, uh, Pneumocystis Jurovici, or Jurovici, or Eurovici, I don't know how you pronounce that. Uh, Aspergillus fumigatus, okay. Know about Aspergillus? That's the one where you, if you have a cavity because of TB, uh, and get a fungal growth there, it's because it's gonna be because of this. It makes a fungal ball in the cavity. Legionella is the one where it comes from, like AC and stuff. I think. Uh, fluorescent antibodies, uh, fluorescent antibody stain. So it's used to identify many bacteria, viruses, and pneumocystis, uh giardia, and cryptosporidium. For example. Example is uh, FTA ABS you do for syphilis. Okay. You do this because the VDRL, uh, it's non specific. Uh, RR and VDRL because they go after cardiolipin and Cardiolipin is the one where we came across when we were doing autoantibodies for uh, SLE, I think, right? Yeah. I was just trying to recall that. Okay, uh, special culture requirements. So I guess we don't have this. <clears throat> uh, special culture requirements bug you're going to do media use for isolation and media contents and other stuff uh, all of this gets tested on so know almost about everything over here I'll tell you which one's not important but if it's not if I don't say it that means it's important right? Uh, H influenza, uh, you use chocolate agar, uh, and the media contains uh, factor V and X. If you've done a sketchy, it's the one where the, the picture where the there's a chocolate store and there are kids inside and they're eating it and then they're coughing. So H influenza is that, right? This thing, what it does is it causes uh, epiglottitis. So you're going to have a child who's sitting in tripod position and leaning forward and coughing. And uh, when they lean forward, it's a little better. That's why they're doing that. Uh, you're going to see a thumbprint sign or a thumb sign in an x-ray, in a lateral x-ray of the neck. Uh, so they cough because they had a lot of chocolate, kind of like that. That was their thing. Uh, factor five. Uh, which is NED, and factor 10, which is hematin. Uh, remember these? Uh, they ask you what factors are going to be in that uh, culture's H influenza. It's factor 5 and 10. Uh, and gonorrhea and meningitis. Uh, it's isolated in their Martin agar. Uh, media contains uh, selective favors. Selectively favors growth of Neisseria by inhibiting gram growth of gram-positive organisms with vancomycin. Uh, for gram-negative organisms, except Neisseria, with trimethorphan and cholestin and fungi with neostatin. So, uh, know about know about their Martin agar. It contains all of these uh, things. It contains vancomycin for uh, gram positive. It contains trimethorphan and cholestin for gram negative. Uh, that will restrict growth of all of these organisms besides just Neisseria. And uh, fungal growth with neostatin. So that's how you get and go in this area.
right? So that's gone. That's for gonorrhea and meningitis. Uh, if for nasuria, another thing is just a side note. If you if they say it, uh, there's a migratory arthritis, it's usually going to be because of this. Another cause of something like that would be cancer, but I think that's like in step two, not one. Um, B pertussis. Um, Bordet gengal agar, Bordet for Bordetella, so that's easy to remember. Uh, Regan Lau medium, uh, they don't test you on these. Uh, this one they don't. The media contains um, potato extract, uh, charcoal, blood, and antibiotic. Uh, C. diphtheria, telluride agar, Leufler medium. Know that you might remember Leufler medium, but you won't remember telluride or one or the other. Remember both of them are for C. diphtheria, telluride, and I tell you right now you have C. diphtheria, kind of like that, and Leufler medium. M. tuberculosis, that's I think the most popular one. Everyone's gonna know about that. Lowenstein Jensen medium middle group medium and rapid automated broad cultures okay you would know about these two but not middle group medium that's the first time i heard that uh, okay uh m pneumonia mm -mm, cigar know that and know that it requires cholesterol uh, mycobacterium pneumonia i think of it like uh this usually happens in cold climates like Canada and Canada and Toronto has a Eaton Center, if you know that. Uh, so Inagar and Mycobacterium pneumonia. And everyone is fat in North America, so they require cholesterol. <laughs> no offense. Lactose fermenting uh, enteryx, Meconchi agar. Fermentation produces acid, causing colonies to turn pink. Right. Uh, this is important for this because this will pop up every time they're talking about, uh, you know, E. coli or something. Not E. coli, but like gram-negative uh, colonies that turn pink. So, yeah, I think E. coli too because it's a lactose fermenting. Uh, so, Meconchiagar. So, fermentation produces acid and causing colonies to turn pink. So, that's why you have E. coli that's pink. E. coli specifically for that is eosin methylene blue agar. Uh, it contains colonies with green metallic sheen. Okay. Uh, Brucella. Francisella, or Legionella, and Parsherella. We'll, we'll do this first. Uh, the Ella siblings, Bruce, Francis, and Legionnaire, a uh, Legionnaire, and a Pasher, or Pastor, built the Sistine Chapel out of charcoal and iron. Okay, so you got your Brucella, Brucella, uh, Francisella, and Legionella, and for Pasher, so the twins and a pastor build a Sistine chapel out of charcoal and iron. So Sistine charcoal and iron. Charcoal yeast extract agar buffered with Sistine and iron. That's what they use. Who used it? The Ella twins or siblings. Uh, yeah, definitely remember that. They ask you about that. Uh, then you have fungi, sabarod agar, sabs of fungi. That's an easy one to remember. Uh, just as a side note, um, the pigments uh, for Staph aureus is golden yellow. For Pseudomonas arginosa is blue green. Uh, this one is uh, important, the blue green, because majority of the time when they're talking about recurrent infections, they're going to say they had a culture that turned out to be blue and green. And that's going to be always Pseudomonas arginosa, because that's the only one that does that. 
Uh, then you have Seratia. Seratia actually means red in, I think, Latin or Greek. Not really sure, but it's red. So Seratia little has a pigment that's red. That's why it's named that. Uh, Actinomycin, uh, it will give you yellow-orange. Uh, it's because of the sulfur granules. Okay. Uh, so... I'm just going to go back a little here for the glycocalyx. I have a side note for that. It's similar to capsule. Um, I can't read my own writing. <laughs> Distinct firmly adhered gelatinous layer. Okay. It's something like that. So that's what it is. Bacteria with irregular slime fuzz layer having glycocalyx. So glycocalyx is used to adhere to catheter. Uh, it's found in S. epidermidis. So, yeah. and it's called the biofilm. So five biofilm formation on infilling catheters. That's why you get the infection. It could be IV catheter, I think, or. Did that. Uh, on to the next. <clears throat> so, example include Clostridium, Bacteroids, Fusobacterium, and Actinomyces uh, Israeli. Right? Actinomyces, uh, it's where the gums are. So, you'll have that infection in dental abscesses. Uh, bacterioids or infection uh, yeah and then bacterioids uh, they're abnormal abdominal abscesses uh, the treatment for that is metronidazole clostridium uh, that is botulinum uh, perfringes or titania can cause any of those and then uh, there's a thing for like a Side note for clindamycin and metronidazole. Any infection above the diaphragm, you use clindamycin. Any informing, uh, infection below the diaphragm, you use metronidazole. Right. And then I have a side note for appendicitis. It's usually caused by a fragilis. And that's it for that. So anaerobes. Examples include Clostridium, bacteroids, Fusobacterium and Actinomyces is really. They lack catalase and or superoxide dismutase and are thus susceptible to oxidative damage. Right. Uh, so if you remember that, that we did that in the respiratory burst, uh, both of these things. Uh, generally foul smelling, short chain fatty acids, are difficult to culture and produce gas in tissue, uh, carbon dioxide and H2. Uh, the important thing here is just this, like you can probably know this just by common sense that there are gonna be foul smelling, right? Uh, they are difficult to culture because they're anaerobes. So, and when you culture something, you need to like vacuum out the oxygen and stuff. So, which is not possible every time, right? So that's why they're difficult to culture and they produce gas and tissue, right? So that's the one where you have like perfringes uh, happening. So uh, why it bubbles is because of this. It causes CO2 and H2. Uh, anaerobes can't breathe fresh air. Anaerobes are normal bi microbiota and GI tract, typically pathogenic elsewhere. Uh, aminoglycosides are ineffective against anaerobes because these antibiotics require O2 to enter into bacterial cells. And if the bacteria doesn't have O2, then it's not going to gain the entry it requires to be effective. Facultative anaerobes. That's the, what I was looking for earlier. Facultative anaerobes. Uh, it's facultative. Uh, no, that's not the word. This is the word I was looking for. Obligate. That's going to be your chlamydia. Obligate intracellular. Okay. So what are facultative anaerobes? 
they may use oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor to generate ATP, but can also use fermentation and other O2 independent pathways. Streptococci, staphylococci, and enteric gram negative bacteria. So these are your facultative anaerobes, I guess. Uh, okay, that's pretty cool. So they can use O2 to generate ADP, but they also have other ways to ferment it and other, uh, that doesn't require O2. So just like us, right? Um, we make ATP through glycolysis, but then if we don't have O2 available, uh, it uses the 2,3-BPG pathway to make uh, ATP, uh, but then you end up with a lot of lactic acidosis, or lactic acid, sorry, which causes lactic acidosis. So similar to that. Intracellular bacteria, obligate intracellular, rickettsia, chlamydia, coxiella, rely on host ATP. They stay inside cells when it is really chilly and cold. Uh, facultative intracellular, salmonella, nazaria, brucella, mycobacterium, listeria, francisiella, legionella, and eucernia pedis. That's uh, the plague one. These are your intracellular. Uh, just know which ones are intracellular because these are the ones that, are, at least these ones are the ones that don't stain well. So you need to know why something doesn't stain well. It's because they're intracellular. Facultative, they don't test you on this uh, facultative intracellular, but when you look at it, just know that it could be this. And Listeria would be the most important one out of these. Uh, encapsulated bacteria. Okay, so please shine my skis. We did that earlier as well. Uh, are opsonized and then cleared by spleen, asplenic. No spleen here. Have decreased opsonizing ability and thus increased risk for severe infections and uh, need vaccines to protect against N meningitis, S pneumonia, and H influenza. Okay, so that. the P is for Pseudomonas arginosa, uh, S in shine is for Streptococcus pneumonia, H is H in influenza type B. Remember, it's type B. Don't confuse it with the other type. Uh, so HI, and then you have N for N meningitis, and then E for E. coli, and then Again, S for salmonella, and the other S is for group B strep. So there are three S's, uh, strepto S, uh, streptococcus pneumoniae, and then group B strep as well. And I think they both are, no, they're not. <laughs> so S pneumonia is right there, and group B strep is beta hemolytic. And this is alpha hemolytic. That's what I do. Okay. Uh, all right. And then you have E. coli, salmonella, Klebsiella, and group B strep. Their capsules serve as antiphagocytic virulence factor. That's the important thing. This is how it avoids uh, immune response from our body it's because the capsule they serve as an antiphagocytic virulence factor so capsular polysaccharide plus protein conjugate serves as an anti engine and oh i got a uh i believe we just finished this right so i'll move on from there uh the and okay i think we need to read this and capsular bacteria are opsonized and then cleared by spleen uh, so if you're a spleen, splenic and have decreased opsonizing ability and thus increased risk for severe infections, uh, you need uh, vaccines to protect against N meningitis as pneumonia or H influenza. 
they do question uh, question you on this uh they'll be like um uh, this person went under uh splenectomy like uh, a year ago and now he has some kind of infection on uh, and uh, some kind of infection what's the most likely cause it's always going to be one of these three so if they give you all of these three uh it's going to be this one this would be the most popular answer because that's the most common one uh because this thing has other symptoms uh and this one is more common in uh kids so this and an adult would be the reason unless they give you other reasoning for these then think about that but mostly it's going to be just one of these three in the option so if you're asplenic uh you have to protect yourself against uh these and if they say that they don't have mac complex or there's a mac complex uh uh deficiency and they're asplenic then it's going to be this one this area cuz mac is for this right but if they don't they say mac is okay then it's going to be this for this okay uh encapsulated bacteria vaccines some vaccines containing polysaccharide capsule antigens are conjugated to a carrier protein enhancing immunogenicity by promoting t cell activation and subsequent class switching a polysaccharide antigen alone cannot be presented to t cell uh pneumococcal vaccine uh pcb13 polypneumococcal conjugate vaccine ppsv23 polysaccharide vaccine uh pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine with no conjugated protein okay uh we give this in kids but we give this in elderly uh why we give it it's going to come but just know that it's better to give this to uh have a t cell mediated response so then you have a longer memory of this so when you have it you know because uh this only contains a certain virulent strains of pneumococcal that it goes like the surface markers for them uh here there are more so that's why you don't need it to be conjugated with anything so that's why it's not conjugated uh h influenza type b uh, conjugate vaccine and meningococcal vaccine is also conjugated but this is the one they're going to test you on right there uh urease positive organisms uh when we get through it it's really obvious but it's protease cryptococcus h pylori neuroplasia plasma that's in the name so that shouldn't be hard nocardia klebsiella and s epidermidis and s cyprophyticus so both of the uh staphylococcus then you have klebsiella you have h pylori uh you can this is the stomach one so that helps this is in the name uh protease is pretty famous for being in stomach as well right so all of these you can remember the ones you probably wouldn't would have a hard time with cryptococcus and nocardia so remember that uh urease hydrolyzes urea to release ammonia and carbon dioxide which causes increase in ph predisposes to struvite right protease is known for that the struvite struvite is magnesium ammonium phosphate AMP is how I remember it cuz people who play guitar they use a the amp and they're all about you know rock and roll so struvite looks like a stag horn so I connected to that and remember that way um particularly protease so I'll do this in the next one I'll come back in like 5 10 minutes after we finished this uh i added this so facultative intracellular uh where do they go right so salmonella goes in the intestinal cell nisseria goes in the urethral epithelial cell brucella uh hides in neutrophils and macrophages 
Uh, Listeria does it in monocyte and macrophages. Uh, and these are all about macrophages. So Mycobacterium, Franciscella, Legionella, and Yersinia pedis. They all hide in, are, or they are in intracellular in macrophages. Uh, for aspiration pneumonia, you're going to have a question about a person who was found unconscious or he was, and he's known to have history of alcoholism. Uh, and then they did a chest x-ray and they found some kind of abscess in there or some kind of cavity or not cavity, but an abscess in the lung, right? Uh, it's going to be because of uh, the dude was getting drunk and then when he would vomit and he's laying down, he can't spit out, so it goes in the lung. So that's what causes the aspiration pneumonia. And along with that, you have mouth anaerobes entering the lung. Uh, these anaerobes are going to be pepto uh, streptococcus. Uh, pepto streptococcus, uh, physobacterium, and prevotella. Uh, the treatment for this is clindamycin. Uh, catalase positive organism. It's uh, catalase degrades H2O2 or peroxide into H2O and bubbles of O2. Uh, this is very important because uh, it affects how the respiratory, uh, sorry, respiratory burst works. That's why. Uh, so it wouldn't work on in uh, bacteria that have their own catalase because then they can just, you know, neutralize uh, hydrogen peroxide by themselves. Uh, so catalyst degrades uh, hydrogen peroxide into H2O and bubbles of O2 before it can be converted to micro biocidal products by the enzyme myeloperoxidase. Uh, this thing makes bleach, right? Or hypochlorite or something. Um, people with chronic granulomatous disease NADPH oxidase deficiency won't be able to make uh, superoxide, right? Superoxide is when you have O2 and when you add NADPH oxidase, you get superoxide. And then you have superoxide dismutase making H2O2. So uh, oxidase deficiency have recurrent. So these people with CGD uh, have recurrent infection with certain catalase positive organisms. Big catalase positive organisms include uh, Bordetella pertussis, H. pylori, uh, Bucroldia sebacea, Nocardia, uh, Pseudomonas, Listeria, Aspergillus, Candida, E. coli, Seracea, and Staphylococci. Uh, I would say no these three. Uh, Staphylo, Bordetella, H. pylori, and Yeah, that's the one they will test you on. Um, I'm not sure about this, but just when you look at something like this, just know that they could be catalase positive, right? So Pseudomonas, Listeria, Aspergillus, and Candida and E. coli and Seratia. I don't think they test you on that, but definitely know about Staph, H. pylori, and Bordetella. Uh, pigment producing bacteria, actinomyces. Right. So also important thing for about Pseudomonas is it's encapsulated as well, right? Um, pigment producing bacteria, actinomyces is really yellow surfer granules. Sorry, where was I? Right, pigment producing bacteria. I already went over these earlier, but here we have it. Actinomyces israeli is yellow sulfur granules, which are composed of filaments of bacteria. S. aureus gives you golden yellow. Uh, P. arginosa, blue green pigment. It's because of pyocyanin and pyoverdin. These are the ones that cause it. Uh, Cetacea. Marcescence or red pigment. 
think red sriracha hot sauce. You can think of that. Uh, then you have in vivo biofilm producing bacteria. This is your S. epidermis uh, catheter and prosthetic device infection. Uh, it's mainly known for this one. Uh, it's because this lives on the skin and then when you do uh, valve replacement or something like that, um, you go through the skin, right? Uh, and if it's not properly sterilized, uh, you'll get infection of this in your heart. So that's why it's prosthetic device infection. Uh, they'll give you all the, like, is it gram positive or gram negative? If it's gram positive, is it like, whatever the thing is for that. Uh, Verdin streptococci, S mutants, and S sanguinis. Uh, Dentaplex, this is what it's known for. Uh, when it gets confusing, it's between this and uh, actinomyces. Actinomyces was uh, abscess, dental abscess, and this is dental plaque. So because of this, uh, you can get infective endocarditis. That's what it's known for, infective endocarditis. So they'll have a history of pl uh, plaque or, you know, of uh, dental procedures done. So after the dental procedure or something, they had infective endocarditis just because of that. Uh, you have Pseudomonas arginosa, producing biofilm. Uh, respiratory tree colonization in patients with cystic fibrosis. Uh, this is what it's known for. Uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. That's good to know too. And contact lens uh, associated keratitis. Recently, they started testing you on this as well. So there are questions on this as well. Uh, this is why you have to use, uh, when you clean your contact lenses, you don't clean it with just normal water. You clean it with uh, a contact lens solution because it prevents this buildup of pseudomonas arginosa in the, there. And so you don't end up with keratitis. Uh, non typable encapsulated H influenza. This will cause otitis media. So remember that uh, type B is the one I think causing uh, epiglottitis and the non-typable one uh, is the one that causes otitis media. Uh, spore forming bacteria. Okay. Some gram positive bacteria can form spores. When nutrients are limited, Spores lack metabolic metabolic as activity, and are highly resistant to heat and chemicals. Core contains uh, dipicolinic acid, responsible for heat resistance. Must autoclave to kill spores, and is done to surgical equipment by streaming at steaming at uh, 121 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes. So remember that number. Right there 121 degrees celsius for 15 minutes so a question might have like they have uh let's see they said that the instruments were autoclaved at 100 degrees celsius for 20 minutes but uh the patient that was operated on started having infection after the procedure or there were signs of infection uh -huh. why it's because they didn't heat it uh at 121 degrees Celsius, they only heated it at 100. Uh, right, so yeah. hydrogen peroxide and iodine based agents are also sporicidal, so you can use that as well hydrogen peroxide and iodine based agents. Uh, examples are B anthracis uh, or anthrax, B cirrhosis, that's the food poisoning one when you reheat fried rice. Uh, C. botulinum or botulinum, uh, that's food poisoning as well. C. difficile, uh, that's the one that causes diarrhea. It happens when you're on in hospital on antibiotics and people end up with this. Uh, there was a South Park episode on this as well. Pseudomembranous colitis. Uh, 
Yeah, it has uh, it forms a membrane in the GIT or tract. Uh, GI tract. Uh, C perfringens is the one that causes uh, CO2 and H2 gas, uh, gas gangrene. That's why it bubbles. And then you have C titani or clostridium titani uh, causes tetanus. So all of these are spore form. So if you make a chart or something like that, it's going to be these ones. Okay. B anthrax, B series, C titani, C botulinum, C perfringent, and C difficile. Okay, uh, now we're going to do bacterial virulence factors. Uh, this is the most important paragraph right here. They will test you on everything here. So these, what are these? These promote invasion of host immune response. So these are the reasons why bacteria survive in a body, right? So capsular polysaccharide, how does that help them? Uh, they're highly charged hydrophilic structures. So they act as a barrier to phagocytosis and complement mediated lysis, major determinant of virulence. So anything that has capsules uh, is gonna av avoid or you know not get phagocytized. Then you have protein A. Protein A is different than IgA protease. So remember that. IG is a uh, immunoglobulin protecting the GI tract. Protein A binds FC region of IgG. It prevents opsonization and uh, phagocytosis expressed by SREs. IG, okay, so it's expressed by SREs. REs has A. So that's your protein A. Uh, remember that it binds FC region of IgG. So it prevents opsonization of and phagocytosis. So if we remember, FC region is the part that, let me just go to that. Uh, right here. This is the FC region. So I'll just click that. And go back to. So right here. So how does that matter, right? It binds the FC region of IgG. It matters because FC region is the one that binds to macrophages, right? So if it can attach to macrophages, uh, macrophage cannot opsonize this. Like macrophage is unaware of what's going on if this doesn't bind to it. So that's how protein A works. It binds the FC region of immunoglobulin G. It prevents opsonization and phagocytosis. It's expressed by SREs. Then you have IgA protease, uh, enzymes that cleave IgA, right? IgA is the one that protects the thing, uh, GI tract. So now if it just cleaves it, then IgA doesn't work. So it allows the bacteria to adhere, right? IgA is the one that stops it from adhering to the GI tract. So this allows bacteria to adhere to and colonize mucous membranes secreted by S. pneumonia, H. influenza type B, and Nizaria. This is the most important one they'll test you on. Uh, I don't think they'll test you on this for IgA protease at least. But they might, I don't know, since everything's changing now. Uh, so just remember the mechanism. IgA is, it protects the GI tract. Uh, it prevents anything like Giardia as well. Giardia, S. pneumonia, H. influenza, and this area from attaching to the GI tract. But when it's deficient or you don't have it, you're going to have infection 
that you know cleaved this in the first place so that's how you get GRDSs. That's why you're going to be, when this is in question, uh, it's usually going to be about GRDSs. But if it, other than that, it's going to be this one, they're going to be like, how is this possible? It's because as pneumonia sheds uh, IgA proteases. Okay. And protein. Uh, this is the most interesting one. It helps prevent phagocytosis. It's expressed by group A streptococci. Okay, sequence homology with human cardiac myosin. Molec that's why it's called molecular mimicry. Possibly underlies the autoimmune response seen in acute rheumatic uh, fever. So basically, uh, group A strep is the reason why people end up with heart problems, right? Uh, you have the vegetation is growing and stuff. It's because uh, group A strep has M protein and M protein uh, is similar to the cardiac myosin. So when you have your body making antibodies against M protein and it takes care of the M protein, what's it going to do? It's going to spread out through the throughout the body looking for M protein, right? But then what's going to end up is they're going to find cardiac myosin and it's going to think that it's M protein. And that's uh, when you, it starts attack, attaching itself to it or, you know, doing its thing there. And that's why you have heart complications because of that. And that's how you end up with just from uh, strep throat to a rheumatic fever to rheumatic disease. Uh, bacterial genetics. Transformation. Uh, these are all important. They test you on all of this. So bacterial genetics is transformation. Transformation is known as competent bacteria can bind and import short pieces of environmental naked bacterial chromosomal DNA from bacterial cell lysis. Right. So common bacteria can bind and import short pieces of environmental naked bacterial chromosomal DNA. So these things. How do these things end up in the first place? It's from bacterial cell lysis. Okay, so now you have naked DNA in your body. Then the transfer and expression. So then the bacteria will pick that up. Uh, the transfer and expression of newly transferred genes is called transformation. So when this starts getting expressed, these genes, it's called transformation. So these genes will then attach to the DNA of the new bacteria. And that's how you have, so you have recipient DNA and the donor DNA right here. And that is known as the transport cell uh, or transformation, this process is called. A feature of many bacteria, especially S. pneumoniae, H. influenza type B, and Neisseria. Adding deoxynucleus, deoxyribonuclease degrades naked DNA, preventing transformation. Conjugation, F plus by F minus, okay. So that's F plus, it has the F plus plasmid, contains genes for sex pilots and conjugation. F minus doesn't have genes for sex pilots and conjugation. So what happens is F plus plasmid contains genes for required sex pilots and conjugation. Bacteria without this plasmid are termed F minus. Sex pilus on F plus bacterium contacts F minus bacterium. So then you have contact between F plus and F minus. Sex pilus forming conjugal bridge or mating bridge. A single strand of plasmid DNA is transferred across the conjugal bridge and the or the mating bridge. So here you have single strand going from F plus to F minus. No transfer of chromosomal DNA. So that's your chromosomal DNA right there, the circular one. That doesn't get transferred. What gets transferred is just the plasmid DNA. Right? Across the conjugal bridge. So once it transforms, uh, F minus becomes F plus as well. And then it's going to continue doing that with the other ones. That's the... 
simple way of doing it. Uh, the complex way is right here. Uh, it's called high frequency or high frequency recombination. Uh, cell contains F plus plasmid incorporated into the bacterial DNA. So bacterial DNA or the chromosomal DNA here is incorporated in that. The F plus plasmid can become incorporated in the bacteria chromosomal DNA termed high frequency recombination cells. Transfer of leading part of plasmid and new flanking chromosomal genes. High frequency recombination may integrate some of those bacterial genes. Recipient cell remains F minus, but now may have new bacterial genes. So when that bacteria gets, you know, broken down or something and then the chromosomes are naked, maybe they will get added to a different bacteria and transform, something like that. So how does this happen? You have um, plasmid in the F plus cell and you have F my, minus cell, right? So high frequency recombination. So this thing is going to get combined with over here. And then it's going to shed the chromosomal DNA this time through the conjugal bridge or mating bridge. And then it's going to get incorporated to the other bacteria. Okay, so yeah, F minus cell bacterial DNA plus the F plus cell bacterial DNA. And now you have plasmid copy. Okay. Uh, know these terms because that's how you're going to figure out what it is. Uh, know the difference between plasmid and chromosomal DNA. Uh, plasmid is still a DNA. So if they give you a DNA was past, you need to know if it was a plasmid DNA or a chromosomal DNA. Because if it's chromosomal DNA, it's going to be the high frequency one. But if it was the plasmid DNA that went over, it's just the normal one, F plus F minus happened. Right? And if the DNA was naked to start off with, it's going to be transformation. Uh, okay, uh, transduction. So we did transformation. Uh, that was this conjugation. That's with the mating bridge. And now we're gonna do transduction. Uh, generalized a packaging error. That's what it is. A lytic phage infects bacterium, leading to cleavage of bacterial DNA. Parts of bacterial chromosomal DNA may become packaged in phage capsid. Phage infects another bacterium, transferring these genes. Right. Okay. Let me get that under try. Lytic phage infects bacterium, leading to cleavage of bacteria bacterial DNA. Parts of bacterial chromosomal DNA may become packaged in phage capsid. Phage infects another bacterium, transferring these genes. Uh, you have the lytic phage come in and infect the bacteria. Uh, there's a bacteria, and then there's cleavage of bacterial DNA. So the infection has now cleaved the bacterial DNA. Okay. Then what happens is bacterial DNA are packaged in phage capsids. Okay. And then the phage capsids are now released, release of new phage from lice cell when this is destroyed. Because now, how does it get destroyed? Because all of its uh, DNA that was maintaining the bacteria itself is packaged, so it's non-functional now. So if it's non-functional, this is going to break down the bacteria, right? So then you have release of new phage from lice cell. This will now go on to infect other bacteria. And that's how genes transferred from to a, how you get gene transfer from, you know, this. And this is how mutations occur. And this is how resistance occurs as well. Uh, so this was the general one, okay. 
Uh, so how does how this becomes uh, significant is right here when it's specialized an excision event okay lysogenic phase infects bacterium and viral dna they're not going to test you on this one they're going to test you on this one the specialized one uh, so know about this an excision event lysogenic phage infects bacterium viral dna incorporates into bacterial chromosome when phage dna is excised flanking bacterial genes may be excised with it okay uh, DNA is packaged into phage capsid and can infect another bacterium. Genes for the following five bacterial toxins are encoded in lysogenic phage. So this is not how it always was. It's when these bacteria got infected by a virus. And that's when this happened, right? So that's how you got group B strep uh, erythrogenic toxin. That's how you got botulinum toxin. That's how you got cholera toxin the diphtheria toxin and sugar toxin. Okay, so A, B, C, Ds. A for A strep, erythrotoxin, B for botulinum toxin, C for cholera toxin, D for diphtheria toxin, S for sugar toxin. They will ask you this. They'll give you this description and they'll ask what kind of uh, bacteria is this or what, where did which bacteria did this come from or what kind of toxin is this? So. It could be any of those questions. What happens is lysogenic phage viral DNA is infecting the bacteria. Then the viral DNA incorporates into the bacteria. That's similar to this, right? Uh, but here it was cleaved off or broken down. Okay, it's broken down here too. So viral DNA here, it's incorporating. Here it wasn't incorporated to start off with, right? Uh, it was incorporated in the, wait, okay, I guess it, it was incorporated then, because it's bacteria, if the bacteria is the capsid, then there's viral DNA here, if it was viral capsid, then it was the chromosomal DNA of the bacteria here, so I guess it's the same thing, while DNA incorporates in the bacterial DNA, phage particles carry bacterial DNA, and release of new phage similar to this it infects other bacteria and now you have genes different from donor and recipient because now you have everything you have the viral dna you have the chromosomal dna and the you have the dna that you had when you started off with in the bacteria so you have all three of them here you only have uh both the chromosomal DNA from both the bacteria. Okay. So if you have three different type of bacteria, uh, chromosomal DNAs, then it's specialized. Two is generalized. Okay. So if the wild DNA is being expressed as well, it's specialized. So now we did, again, transformation. That was to start off with naked, and then it got expressed in the another bacteria we have conjugation as the one with the mating bridge uh, with simple one and the high frequency one high frequency one was sharing the bacterial chromosomal dna whereas the simple one was just the plasmid dna uh, we did transduction generalized is the one where only the bacterial dna's are expressed but it's different in the next bacteria Specialized one is the DNA from the wires, uh, the previous bacteria and the new bacteria, all three being expressed. Okay, now we're going to do the last one, transposition. Transposition is a jumping process involving a transposome, a uh, specialized segment of DNA, which can copy and excise itself and then insert into the same DNA molecule or an unrelated DNA. For example, plasmid or chromosome. It's critical in creating plasmids with multiple drug resistance and transfer across special lines or species lines. Sorry. For example, TN1546 with when A from Enterococcus to S. aureus.
Okay. Now uh, we'll give that under read. Just listen, understand this diagram. Uh, plasmid, and this part is known as the trans transposome. Um, this is the bacterial DNA. Uh, this is the target site. Uh, so, okay, so you have the plasmid, and this part is going to get incorporated within the bacterial DNA. So, if this is the target site, this is where it's going to integrate, right? So, that's what transposition is. It involves transposome. So, when you have a plasmid going into bacterial DNA, that sounds a lot like this one, right? Conjugation. But this one, remember, it involves mating bridges. And this is from one plasmid from one bacteria to the other bacteria. This one is the same bacteria, right? So don't confuse that. A jumping process involving a transposome, specialized segment of DNA. That's what it is, a transposome. So a jumping process involving transposome, which can copy and excise itself and then insert into the same DNA molecule or an unrelated DNA, right? For example, the plasmid or chromosome. Okay, so it's saying that this thing can jump from here to maybe this side or it can jump from here to this. <clears throat> and that's called transposition. Uh, and this is significant because this is how you get multiple drug resistance and transfer it across species lines. Okay, so this resistance with when A from Enterococcus, it came to S. aureus as well. Okay, that's done. Now we're going to do main features of exotoxins and endotoxins. Uh, exotoxins are in gram positive and negative, but endotoxins are only in gram negative. That's the most important part of this. Okay. Uh, source for exotoxins, species. Uh, certain species from gram positive and gram negative bacteria it's secreted from cell uh, chemistry is polypeptide right uh, locational gene is in plasmid or bacteriophage we already know what that those are now this is the bacteriophage or the plasma would be this uh, toxicity is high fatal dose on the order of one microgram so even my, one microgram can cause symptoms that's why the toxicity is high clinical effects are various effects see following page mode of action is various modes see following page antigenicity is uh, induces high titer antibodies called antitoxins right uh, vaccines toxoids are used as vaccines and then you have heat stability. Uh, these are, this get uh, destroyed rapidly at 60 degrees Celsius, except staphylococcal enterotoxin and E. coli heat stable toxin. Typical disease, tetanus, botulinum, diphtheria, and cholera. And these are the diseases that cause exotoxin or do exotoxin or have exotoxin. Right? So that's C. tetany, uh, C. botulinum, uh, C. diphtheria, and cholera, vibrio cholera. Okay. Endotoxin, this is your LPS as well. Outer cell membrane of most gram negative bacteria. It's not secreted from the cell. Uh, the chemistry is it has lipidic components of LPS. Uh, structural part of bacteria released when lysed. Okay, so it's not excreted from the bacteria, but when the bacteria is lysed, that's when these can get released. So location of the genes are in bacterial chromosome, whereas for exotoxin, it was in the plasmid or bacteriophage. Okay. Toxicity is low. Fatal dose on the order of hundreds of micrograms. 
whereas this was one microgram. So that's the difference. Clinical effect for these are fever, shock, right, and DIC. We already looked at how that happens. I'll do that again. Okay, so fever is caused by interleukin-1 and, and TNF, and the uh, hypotension or the shock is caused by TNF, reducing the BP here and the NO over here. Okay. Uh, mode of action induces TNF, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6. So interleukin-1, interleukin-6. Uh, antigenicity is uh, poorly antigenic. A vaccine is no toxoids formed and no vaccines available, right? Because if you wanted to do that, you're going to have to find a way to put it inside the bacteria itself because that's where these are and it only comes out after the bacteria dies. So if you kill off the bacteria, that's when it gets released. So it's really hard to form a vaccine for that. Heat stability, it's stable at 100 degrees Celsius for one hour. And then you have typical diseases, which are meningococcemia and sepsis by gram negative rods. So this is the diagram for that. Endotoxin gets released from the bacteria, right? Secrete from the cell. And this uh, attaches to the CD14 uh, marker and causes all this stuff to happen. Because when it breaks down, that's when it gets released, right? It doesn't normally secrete it, that's what it means. Then downstream cellular reaction. Here, the downstream reaction is TNF, interleukin 1, and interleukin 6. If you remember from the previous chapter, interleukin 1 was hot, so it's known for the fever. Interleukin-6 was acute phase uh, protein, so that's what that did. Now uh, we're going to do the, learn about the exotoxins. So that's this stuff right here. Okay. Uh, bacteria toxin and mechanism and manifestations. So, okay, I'll just, I guess I'll try it out here so it's easier to understand it. See, toxin. So, okay. This actually be longer. And you have NAD, and you have elongation factor two right here. So what this does is this. Right. 
P. Okay, done. You had enough time to reflect on your life. Now back to this. Bacteria with exotoxin. Bacteria toxin mechanism and manifestations. Uh, inhibit protein synthesis. Quirny bacterium, diphtheria. It uh, gives off diphtheria toxin. And you also have Pseudomonas arginosa, exotoxin A, right? So how do these function? Uh, they inactivate elongation factor E2, right? So what does E2 do normally, right? So the toxin with E2, it causes ADP, uh, ribosyl elongation factor two, which then leads to no protein synthesis. So because of this, you get pharyngitis with pseudomembrane membranes in uh, throat and severe lymphadenopathy or bulmac with myocarditis okay and you get whole cell death because of that too uh this will come up in questions so just know how that works okay. adp Gives off virus protein. Okay. Uh, sugar toxin and uh, from sugar love, and also EHEC or enterohemorrhagic uh, EHEC or hemorrhagic E. coli, right? Uh, they do sugar toxin and EHEC does sugar like toxin. Uh, their mechanism is similar, so. It inactivates 60S ribosome by removing adenine from R RN. That's ribosomal RNA. Right? Uh, this will do what? This also. Halts. Protein synthesis. So. It damages GI. Uh, which causes dysentery, enhances uh, cytokine release. So you get Huss syndrome, uh, hemolytic uricemia, uremic uh, syndrome, or Huss. Prototypically in EHEC, uh, serotype O157H7. Unlike Shigella, EHEC does not invade, ho invade host cells. Okay, that's the only difference here. So, uh, know this because this is what they'll give, and they'll say that there was bacteria found. Then it's important to see where the bacteria was found. Was it found invaded into the cell, or was it just found on top of it, right? And that's how you differentiate between the two because. It's going to sound the same otherwise because they both cause dysentery and they both have the same uh, mechanism of action. Okay. If you remember from cystic fibrosis, probably don't, but GS. GS and you had enzyme cyclase which makes uh, CMP from ATP Uh, CFTR 
over here. So when then this will cause this to leak out. Okay, so that's the general. Thing. That's how that works. So with the uh, GS and NS, I place ATP turns into a CMP, which uh, goes on to activating CFTR to leak the chloride or chlorine ions. So in enterotoxic. Uh, E. coli or E. tech. Uh, heat li you have heat level labile toxin and you have heat stable toxin. Heat level toxin, how that works is it overactivates enmylate uh, cyclase, this one right here. So that will increase uh, CAMP, this thing, which will cause increase in uh, chloride ion secretion in gut. And H2O efflux. This is why you would get watery diarrhea, right? So watery diarrhea, liba in the air, adenylate cyclase, stable on the ground, is guanylate cyclase. Okay, so that's how this thing, whoops. This thing uh, works. Uh, heat stable toxin, what this one does is uh, overactivates uh, guanylate cyclase, so it increases CGMP. Uh, okay. Uh, this will cause decrease in reabsorption of NaCl and H2O. That's just straightforward, so I don't have a diagram for that. So it overactivates guanylate cyclase, CGMP. This will cause decrease in reabsorption of NaCl and H2O in the gut. So that's how you get the watery diarrhea because of a heat stable toxin. Okay. So stable is good. So good is for G. G for good, right? Stable is good. That's how you remember that. And L is, uh, labile is lane. So LA. I guess remember that one. Or you can do this thing, Lival is in the air, so adenylate cyclase and stable on the ground or guanylate cyclase. Okay, that's what that is. Okay. That makes sense too. You're stable on the ground, so G for G and GMP and air. I'm not sure what this means. It's tendency to undergo change, liability, okay. It refers to something that is constantly undergoing change or is likely to undergo change. Um, bacteria that increases CMP include chlora, cholera, anthracis, uh, pertussis, and E. coli. Okay, so these ones cause CMP to include uh, increase. These are your cholera, that's right there. Anthracis, that's this, and pertussis, that's over here. And E. coli, that's this. They all increase CMP with CAPE, okay. Uh, Bacillus anthracis, anthrax toxin, uh, mimics adenylate cyclase, so it increases CMP, right, this thing, is like this, the adenylate cyclase. So if you have a lot more of this, you will have a lot of conversion from ATP to CMP, right? And when you have a lot of CMP, it's gonna activate CFTR a lot more and a lot more chloride goes off. Uh, why is chloride important? It's cause chloride is proportional To water in the body. Okay. Uh, 
That's why you get weak when you keep releasing chloride ions. And that's why people were dying in that time when cholera was rampant. Anthrax toxin mimics adenine cyclase CMP, uh, likely responsible for characteristic characteristic uh, edematous border of black eshar and cutaneous anthrax. Uh, this is the one that causes the edematous border in eshers or black eshers and cutaneous anthrax. Vibro cholera or cholera toxin overactivates adenine cyclase, increase in CMP by permanently activating GS. So this thing works on this, right? Overactivates adenine cyclase by mimicking this GS. Okay, so GS is your VC and AC is your BA. So that's where you get voluminous uh, rice water diarrhea this way. Notice how all of these are watery diarrhea, right? This thing just works at a different place, but it's similar. So we'll come back to that. This diagram is what this is. So what GS does, it stimulates adenyl uh, cyclase, right? Uh, what GI does is it inhibits uh, adenyl cyclase, right? And what GQ does is contracts vascular smooth muscles. Anyways, so when we have overactivation of adenyl cyclase, that's what it means when uh, this is a transmembrane. Uh, proteins right here, gamma, beta, and alpha, uh, anchoring down the receptor. So when you have something coming here that activates the, like the second messenger, it activates this. The alpha will convert the GDP to GTP. And then uh, this will cause the complex to activate GS, right? So that's GS right there. That's how the GS gets activated then the GS is going to go attach itself to adenyl cyclase. And this is how you get the ATP to convert to CAMP. And the CMP then uh, sends out the protein kinase, which activates CFTR here uh, for this chlorine. Okay. Uh, when you have heat stable toxin, Here we have, uh, so instead of NO, just think of uh, ETEC, right? Uh, the toxin, heat stable toxin. So it would come in, attached to guanyl, uh, guanylate cyclase. That's what they're talking about when they're saying guanylate cyclase here. Uh, that will overactivate CGMP. So GTP then gets converted to CGMP. And then it, this will cause, in this example, it's PKG, but this will cause what that will do is uh, decrease reabsorption of NaCl and H2O in gut. Okay. Uh, this is again, this thing is going to mimic adenylate cyclase right away, so it doesn't have to go through all of this. Uh, it's just going to do this thing right here. This thing, Vibrio cholera, uh, it over activates adenylate cyclase, this thing, so it mimics kind of GS thing, right? by permanently activating GS. Okay, that's how it does it. So permanently activates this. And this complex then makes this. So that's how that works. In Bordetella, pertussis is the other side. Right. Uh, pertussis activates adenylate cyclase, CMP, by inactivating inhibitory subunit. Right. So what GI does is it inhibits adenylate cyclase Okay, so that's like the other side of other spectrum of this. So adenyl cyclase is normally inhibited by GII is for inhibitory, right? So it inhibits the ATP conversion to CMP, which inhibits uh, PKA, right? But how this works is it permanently inactivates this. So now this thing is not inhibited. So it's constantly activated adenyl cyclase. So it constantly makes ATP into CMP and constantly gets, uh, you know, protein kinase A. So activates adenylate cyclase CMP by inactivating inhibitory subunit GI. You get whooping cough, child cough, uh, whooping cough because of this, child coughs on expiration and whoop on inspiration.
Child coughs on expiration and whoops on inspiration can cause 100 day cough in adults. It's associated with post tussive emesis. Right? So after the coughing, they feel like puking. Yeah, so know that. I'll just go over this because uh, someone on the other step group were asking. They were developing a drug uh, that was trying to inhibit PIP2 or uh, phosph inositol phosphate or something like that. Uh, and the question was, uh, which one of these is going to be diminished because of uh, blocking of PIP, right? Uh, or IP3, IP3, I think. It was one of these two that they were testing drug on. And uh, no, yeah, it was definitely this. And the options were, uh, which one of these will get diminished? What is it phospholipase C or IP3 or other things, right? So these two, you knew that it was part of this uh, chain. So you get uh, GDP convert to GTP attached to alpha, which uh, uh, activates GQ. So what GQ does, it contracts vascular smooth muscles. That's what it's known for. So GQ then attaches to phospholipase C, and then with the help of PIP, uh, with the help of this complex, PIP converts into IP3 plus DAG, right? And the person picked uh, phospholipase C. So they were confused. Why was this not the answer? It's because this and this makes IP3, right? Without this, uh, you're going to have leftover phospholipase C. So what you get diminished is this thing. So if you block this, uh, you're not going to get IP3 DAG. So you're not going to get calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum to come out and cause the vascular contraction, right? Uh, and when it does come out though, uh, from the thing, then it activates PKC under the influence of IP3. Okay. So again, GS, adenocyclase, ATP, CMP, PK, GI inhibits adenocyclase, ATP, CMP, PA. Uh, this thing gets directly into the system. Uh, it doesn't require any uh, complex in the alpha complex. So guanylate, GTP, CG, MPN, PKG, okay. So it inhibits the inhibitor, inhibits phagocytic ability, okay. Uh, inhibit release of neurotransmitter, clostridium titani, uh, titanospasmin, uh, and you have clostridium, uh, clostridium botulinum. They both work the same way. Uh, they cleave the snare. Uh, what that is, is, let's see, they have a photo for that. So this would be the snare, I guess, the vesicle itself, right? Which contains the acetylcholine inside, right? So, uh, what titanospasmin from Clostridium titani or Clostridium botulinum botulinum toxin? They both are proteases that cleave snare soluble uh, NSF attachment protein receptor. A set of proteins required for neurotransmitter release via vascular fusion, right? So what snare protein does is uh, this vesicle, it requires snare to release neurotransmitters and do this process right here. So what that thing does is it inhibits this thing right here, the attachment. So if this doesn't happen, neurotransmitters will not get released. In this case, it's acetylcholine, right? So if acetylcholine doesn't go on to get released, then it's not gonna be picked up by the postsynaptic synapses. Uh, and it's not gonna do its thing where you know, sodium goes in and then does the depolarization of the synapses. So that stuff doesn't happen. 
So when that doesn't happen, what you get is, you know, either a constant state of, we'll just read that about here. Uh, toxin prevents, inhi of, uh, prevents release of inhibitory, which is GABA in this case, right? So GABA is inhibitory. So if you don't have inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters, what acetylcholine is going to do, it's constantly going to activate or depolarize this muscle. So you're going to have a constant state of contraction, right? It's the GABA that comes in and then inhibit, like balances this out so it doesn't do this forever and closes the channel and whatever. Same thing with acetylcholine esterase, it breaks down the acetylcholine. Uh, toxin prevents release of inhibitory GABA and glycine neurotransmitters from Renshaw cells and spinal cord. So now you have spastic paralysis, right? That just means contracted paralysis. Uh, rhesus, uh, sarcoidosis, uh, that's just, uh, it's pretty cool. Not really cool, but it's sad. But this is what it's like. They're constantly look like they're smiling, right? It's because the inhibition is not there, so they're constantly in a state of like that. It comes from the, it, the name comes from rhesus monkeys. Right? It's because their face is like that. Like that right there. Constant state of smiling. So that's why it's called rhesus uh, sardonicus, sardonicus. And trismus, that's just locked jaw. They can't open their mouth. This mouth is going to be constantly closed. And uh, this, you see that? They're smiling, but they're not laughing kind of thing. And then you have opsitonus that goes on to saying spastic paralysis as well. So opsitonus is what? It's like a extreme contraction, I think, like that. Full body contraction. Okay. Then comes Clostridium botulinum. So botulinum does the same thing. It prevents the snare from attaching to the vesicle to do that. So it cleaves the snare. Remember that. Uh, infant botulinum. Botulism uh, here, uh, it inhibits the acetylcholine. So when you don't have acetylcholine, you're going to be inhibited. So there's no contraction happening at all, right? So infant botulinum caused by ingestion of spores from soil and raw honey. Uh, this is going to be in, given in the question stem that the baby was fed some honey and then uh, they have the floppy baby syndrome kind of thing. So it's going to be because uh, it contains botulinum toxin that cleaves the snare protein. So toxin produced in vivo. Foodborne bot botulinum uh, for adults is going to be from canned foods. It's caused by ingestion of preformed toxins from canned food. For adults, it's canned food. For uh, babies, it's raw honey. Uh, okay, that A over here, botulinum tetanoplas tetanospasmin. Okay, and AB toxin, uh, also called two component toxin or or three for anthrax, uh, with B enabling binding and triggering uptake endocytosis of the active A component. The A components are usually. ADP ribosol transferase. Okay. Yeah. Others have enzymatic activities as listed in the chart. I don't know this, so I don't think it's important. So I'm just going to move on. 
and not bother with it. <laughs> bacteria with uh, exotoxins continue. Bacteria, toxin, mechanism, manifestations. Now we're going to have lice membranes, cell membranes, right? So these ones are going to do that, lice cell membranes. Close radium perpharynges, uh, alpha toxin. What it does is uh, phospholipase, lysitin, uh, also known as lysitinase, degrades the tissue and cell membrane. That's where you get the gas gangrene. And also remember, uh, it also produces the gases, CO2 and H2 gas. Uh, phospholipids. Uh, degradation of phospholipids and leads to myonecrosis or gas gangrene and hemolysis, double zone of hemolysis on blood agar. Uh, we'll come across that uh, when we do it. Uh, degradation of phospholipids. That's what happens and it causes myonecrosis. Remember everything about this. Everything gets tested. Phospholipase, myonecrosis, hemolysis, uh, or so known as double zone hemolysis on blood agar. It degrades phospholipids. Okay. Uh, streptococcus pyogenes, uh, streptolysin O, protein that degrades uh, cell membrane as well. Lice RBCs contributes to beta hemolysis. Host antibodies against toxin, uh, ASO, used to diagnose rheumatic fever. And so for us, it's known ASO titer. Do not confuse with immune complexes of post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Okay, that's not what this is. This happens in kidney, causing a nephritic, I think, syndrome. Uh, this one used to diagnose rheumatic fever, okay? So you check the ASO titer, and that's how we know if it's rheumatic or not. Uh, this one causes streptolysin O, causes lice, uh, contributes to beta hemolysis, okay? Uh, so know this. Know all the toxins. Streptolysin O, alpha toxin, what it does, uh, what these toxins do. You know, know all of them. Okay, now we are at uh, super antigens causing shock. Staphylococcus aureus has uh, toxic shock syndrome toxin. Uh, this is, I think, common in uh, question stem when they're talking about a uh, girl trying on tampons and then after a day or something, uh, she stopped responding calls from her mother. So the mother calls in the cops and they find her found on the floor. And then they're wondering what it is. Uh, and they ask us. So then first thing you would think of, if it tampons are included, it's going to be this more than likely. It's either tampons or it could also be uh, tampons used for uh, epitaxis. So bleeding of nose uh, to prevent uh, bleeding. So when you clog the nose with not even tampon, tampons are just like even cotton or something. It's going to have cephalococcus aureus on it and it's going to cause this. So just look out for that. Uh, for streptococcus pyogenes, it's going to be erythrogenic exotoxin A, uh, cross-links beta region of TCR to MHC class 2 on APCs outside of the antigen binding site. It leads to overwhelming release of interleukin-1, 2, interferon gamma, and TNF-alpha, which leads to shock. And that's how you get shock. So exotoxin A and TSST. Uh, toxic shock syndrome, fever, rash, and shock. That's what you get. Uh, so if you have this, it's going to be toxic shock syndrome. Uh, shock is easy to understand because if you have decrease in VP and systolic and diastolic, then it's going to be shock. And then you look for, do they have fever? 
then you're going to then get sepsis. Do they have rash? Then you're going to come to this. Right? Other toxins cause uh, scalded skin syndrome. They might give you this, then you don't even go to sepsis. You go straight to toxic shock syndrome. Exfoliative toxin and food poisoning. Heat stable enterotoxin. Toxic shock like syndrome, fever rash, uh, shock, and scarlet fever. All right. Uh, endotoxin. LPS found in outer membrane of gram negative bacteria, both cocci and rods. Uh, composed of O antigen uh, plus core polysaccharides plus lipid A. The toxic component, uh, Nazaria, have LIGO oligosaccharide. Right. Uh, I already went over this with my notes, it's the same thing here. Okay. LPS found in outer membrane of gram negative bacteria, both cocci and ROJ. Composed of O antigen plus core polysaccharide plus lipid A, the toxic component. This is the toxic component. Remember that, it's lipid A. Uh, Nazaria have lipopolycosaccharide released upon cell lysis or by living cells by blebs detaching from outer surface membrane versus exotoxin, which is actively secreted. Three main effects macrophage activation. Uh, LR4, CD14, complement activation, and tissue factor activation. So I'll just do that from here. Because this is what I'm used to. You can look into this, it's fine. So we have LPS, it does three things. It attack, uh, attacks the complement system the macrophages, and the tissue factor. For the tissue factor, it goes into coagulation cascade and causes uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation, right, or DIC. For complement system, it attacks the C3A and C5A. C3A uh, causes decrease in uh, BP and edema. Here they have said uh, C3 and C5A both cause the histamine release, hypotension, and edema. C5 by itself also does uh, neutrophilic, uh, neutrophilic chemotaxis. And then when it attacks the macrophages on CD14 or TLR4, toll like receptor 4, okay. It attacks the interleukin 1 and, well, it uh, interacts with interleukin 1, interleukin 6, TNF alpha, and nitric oxide. Uh, right, that's tissue necrosis factor, right, TNF alpha. Okay, and nitric oxide. So nitric oxide is known to cause hypotension anyways, or vasodilation of the vessel. So NO will cause decrease in BP. Uh, for TNF alpha, it causes fever and decrease in BP or hypertension. And interleukin-1 is hot, and interleukin-6 was acute phase react uh, protein right so they both cause fever so that's how that is done uh, endotoxins uh, stand for edema nitric oxide dic death outer membrane tnf alpha o antigen plus core polysaccharide plus lipid a extremely heat label uh, stable interleukin one and six neutrophil chemotaxis and shock they don't test you on any of this. So it's just know what, uh, which bacteria have endotoxins. So it's gonna be misery, right? That's the main one they're gonna test you on. It's a uh, virulence factor. Microbiology, clinical bacteriology. These are gonna be your gram positive lead algorithm right here. So it's going to be your gram-positive bacteria. Uh, we already know how they get their color, right? Because the crystal violet gets stuck in the peptidoglycans. And then it doesn't get washed out. So it retains the color blue. Uh, we have bacilli, cocci, and branching filaments. We need to just memorize this whole chart. 
uh, and that really helps with the questionings. So we'll do that. Uh, we'll do the cockeye one first because that's the important one. So they'll give you that it's gram positive. Then they're gonna you're gonna ask, is it bacillite cockeye or branching filaments? They'll give you this as well that it's a uh, cockeye, right? So if they give you that then you're going to ask, is it catalase positive or negative, right? Uh, okay. um, catalase positive or negative? If it's positive, it's going to be your staphylococcus. Uh, the cocci are going to be in clusters, so it's going to look like that right there. Uh, if it's catalase negative, it's going to be your streptococci, right? Because you strep... Uh, when you have chains, you can strap stuff in it. So you can remember it that way. Uh, if you're done the questions, uh, you really don't have to memorize that stuff. It just, just comes to you now. Uh, so cluster is staphylococcus. If it's catalase positive, right? Then you're gonna ask, is it coagulase positive or negative, right? If it's coagulase positive, then you have your staph aureus. Uh, staph aureus, uh, if it's negative, then you're going to ask, is it novobiosin sensitive? Yes or no, right? So if it's not novobiosin sensitive, that means it can grow in novobiosin. Then you have Steph cephrophyticus. But if it does have uh, sensitivity, uh, you have staphylococcus, uh, sorry, staphylococcus epidermidis, right? And then we go all the way back. So we did, again, cocci, catalase positive, coagulase positive is staph aureus. Uh, coagulase negative is, uh, then you do novobiosin sensitivity. Uh, negative is cephrophyticus, and positive is epidermidis. Okay, cephrophyticus is uh, usually in a reproductive age of women, common in them. S aureus is common in... Uh, people who had their valve replacements. Okay. Uh, no biosin if you done sketchy, this was like the, you can see the navel on skin. Uh, so they're sensitive for that. Uh, catalase negative uh, would be your streptococcus. So streptococcus uh, pairs. So how do we differentiate between that, right? So then what you're gonna do is, uh, you culture them, right? So you're gonna culture these, okay? Uh, all of these bacteria, And then you're gonna either get partial hemolysis, complete hemolysis, or absolutely no hemolysis, right? So what they mean by hemolysis is when you culture it, this is blood, then do you see uh, see through it, then that is complete hemolysis. If you see partial hemolysis, uh, you, you can only see like a little bit of the back, but not all of it, right? So here you have beta hemolysis that's complete. So you can see the background, complete background. In alpha, you only see a little bit of the background, right? And then if it doesn't, there is no hemolysis and it grows in bile, it's gonna be this one. Right. So that's your beta, alpha, and gamma, okay? So that's what they mean when they say partial hemolysis or complete hemolysis or no hemolysis. Uh, okay, so if it's alpha or partial hemolysis, uh, then you're gonna see if it's optogen sensitive or bile solubility and bile solubility, sorry. So are they soluble in bile or not? So if they're not sensitive and they do not, uh, they're not bile soluble, then it's gonna be S mutants and S mutants. Okay. Okay. Um, then it's gonna be your S mutants and S midis, okay. Viridins, viridins again, that was the one with the plaque and causes endocarditis, infective endocarditis. Right. It doesn't have a capsule. Uh, that's mostly what it's known for. Uh, 
we can just go through this while we're doing it so it, we don't have to spend time during the whole chapter. Um, we're on Verdance. Where's Verdance? Right there. So it's known for subacute endocarditis. Uh, it comes from cavities or plaques. Uh, as sanguinis. That's what it is. Uh, it's alpha and it's optochain resistant and bile soluble. Right. This is, whole chart is just basically what's important for the questions. It doesn't have anything other than what's important. Okay. So like cephrophyticus, I told you its common cause is uh, UTI and sex active females. It's coagulase negative and no biasin negative. It, uh, it is urease positive and it is uh, catalase. It does have catalase, so it's catalase positive as well. Those are little cats for catalase. So, uh, for S. epidermidis, it forms biofilm on uh, prosthetic valves. I told you that's common in people who had valve surgeries. Uh, they might even say they open up the heart and they checked and then there was some kind of uh, filament uh, or like some kind of layering on top of the well. It's going to be because of this. It's also co coagulase negative. Uh, no biasin positive, this one though, right? Because it's epidermis and you can see the navel on epidermis, so it's positive for that. Uh, extracellular polysaccharide matrix. It has that. It's catalase positive again and urease positive. Uh, for coagulase positive, uh, we have staph aureus, right? Because that's coagulase positive. Uh, you have lung. Okay, so this thing is more complicated because it has a lot more things it's associated with. It looks, it's in clusters, so it's great like clusters. Uh, presents on skin to nasal area. That's where it resides, right? Skin and nasal area. What it causes is cellulitis, pneumonia, and food poisoning. Food poisoning, so they're gonna be having like a lunch picnic or something, and then six people at the picnic got food poisoning. And then they did a survey of what they ate there. And the most common thing will be something that has mayo. So it's gonna be potato sa uh, salad that has mayo in it, and that's going to be the culprit. So if they had this, this is why the, they have food poisoning, because food poisoning happens for like three different things. This is one, the other one is be serious, and then you have botulinum, right? So that's how you differentiate between them. Uh, for mayo, it's going to be this, staph aureus. Uh, also, most importantly, it's, a, it's the most common cause for osteomyelitis. That's inflammation of the bone. Okay. Uh, its virulence factor is protein A. We already went over it. It attaches to FC region. Uh, why is that important? It's because uh, the immunoglobulins FC region is the one that attaches to the macrophages. So what happens is Staph aureus uh, has protein A that attaches to the part that part. So then it can attach to macrophage. So this is how it escapes phagocytosis so there's decrease in phagocytosis because of that uh, it's involved in lung neurosis i guess i guess there was maybe a question for that and i couldn't figure it out so it's on here now lung neurosis uh and it's cultured on maltose salt agar okay uh it does have beta hemolysis properties so when you see this over here, you don't see it here, it's because it's here. But this is uh, beta hemolytic, SREs, complete hemolysis, right? Uh, and we did that. Uh, we did uh, virden streptococci. Uh, it's optogen sensitive and biosolubility. If you did sketchy, it's the one where they have uh, pneumonia and virden's and against each other as knights. And the knight is wearing uh, uh, the armor, because his chin is very sensitive to being stabbed, so he has armor on that. And uh, the Verdance is a clown or jester, and he's standing on the grass, so his shoes are green. Right, so uh, he can stand on the bile, basically, and it's not going to affect him, because it's not bile soluble. That's how they explained it in Dirty. Uh, sorry, sketchy. Uh, so 
S Nimoni. S Nimoni is known for mops. Right. Uh, mops is uh, known as meningitis, otitis media, pneumonia. Okay. And S was for something or not, I don't remember. But most common cause of mops, okay? Uh, it's a common infection, uh, sickle cell anemia, and asplenic. That's where you'll see it. You'll see it in asplenic people. Uh, when we did asplenic, uh, splenectomy or asplenic uh, spleen or whatever, we went over that in immuno. So strep pneumonia is most common on that. No, we actually did in this one. So it was between this and uh, other encapsulated, which was, I think, H influenza and what was the other one? Uh, this one, N meningitis, uh, S pneumonia, and H influenza. And here I told you guys that it's uh, going to be the most common is this because Nizaria meningitis, they're going to have other stuff they're going to give as symptoms. So you can figure out if it's that or not for ACE clinic. And H influenza is more common in kids. Uh, they have uh, epiglottitis, they have the tripod position and all that stuff, right? Uh, so encapsulated, that's it. It's a uh, virulence factor that it's encapsulated. Uh, and then you have this optogen sensitive and biosoluble, both of them. Uh, this is the one that causes rusty sputum. Okay. And it's lancet shaped. So if they say it's a bacteria that's staining and lancet shaped, uh, cocci or whatever. Uh, it's going to be strep pneumonia because they only use lancet shape for this. They don't use it for any other bacteria. Uh, okay. So it's alpha. Uh, and then S radians, we already did that. Never did any of that. Okay. So we did alpha. Now we're going to do beta. Beta uh, is complete hemolysis and it's clear. Uh, so there, you differentiate by doing uh, bacteriocin uh, sensitivity testing and also PYR status or PR status. Uh, group B, S, L, T is for babies. So in Sketchy, they had that baby on, on the moon with uh, like an astronaut. An astronaut has a dome on their head. Right, so that was the capsule. That's how you remember it's encapsulated. Because remember, there were three S's, strep pneumonia, uh, group B strep, and other S was for salmonella. Uh, the positive, uh, if it's positive for, if it is sensitive to bactericin and has a uh, PYR status, is group A as pyogens. This is the one that causes strep throat. And that's why this one is very important. So you have to remember how to differentiate between these. Okay. Also remember what's their deciding factors. They might say, how are you going to decide between group A, S, pyogenes, and S, newborn? And they'll give you all these tests. You know, are you going to do coagulase, catalase? Are you going to do, uh, you know, PYR status? Or are you going to do bactericin sensitivity? Right. Uh, they won't give you, they'll give you either this or this, and then you have to know that it's this. You don't do hemolysis and test, right? Because that's very vague. It could be any of these if you do that. So, group B strep. Uh, and so, group B strep is strep uh, A galacti. Uh, it causes meningitis in babies. Uh, it comes from moms. Uh, its virulence factor is uh, poly polycapsule, polysaccharide capsule, I guess, or uh, it is bacteriocin negative and uh, can't test is positive. CAMP is not the same as the one that gets converted from ATP. 
This is a different camp test that's named after the person who had the last name that was camp. So camp test positive. Uh, this thing colonizes in vagina and anus. That's why it they get it from moms. Uh, pregnant women to be tested at 37 weeks. This is important. Uh, they're tested for this at 37 weeks. And this number is important to remember that. If positive, intrapartum penicillin is given. Intrapartum penicillin, right? While they're delivering as well. Uh, camp factor, they have the camp factor and hydrolyzes hippurate. Right, that's just something to know about this. Strep at letter T, hydrolyzes hippurate. Uh, we did strep pyogene. Strep pyogene is known for strep throat, uh, which leads to rheumatic fever. And uh, it has, remember, I said strep throat goes to rheumatic fever, which causes rheumatic disease because it has M protein, which causes molecular mimicry, and it is autoantibody formation. Uh, swab immunoassay for uh, gas antigen, I guess, GAS antigen. Uh, it's also known for impedical, uh, which is which causes uh, post-strep glomerulonephritis. Okay, uh, impedical. If you don't know what that is, let's look at it. Cause they won't say this person is impedical. They'll say they have honey crusted lesions around the mouth, right? So that's what it looks like: honey crusted lesions around the mouth. And that's in pedicle, and that happens because of strep pyogenes. Uh, it's bacteriocin positive, and it has PYR status. Right. Uh, I'm not sure what that is there. Something exudate. Okay. Uh, do rapid immunosay to diagnose this. That's the test for this, a rapid immunosay. Uh, cellulitis, I've written twice, so it's important to remember. This is the one that causes cellulitis, not this. This one causes osteomyelitis. Oh, it does cause cellulitis, never mind. So cellulitis caused either by Steph aureus or strep pyogenes. So you're gonna have to differentiate between these two. Uh, you differentiate it by, you know, is the coagulus positive or not? Is it have bacteria sensitivity or not? That's why you differentiate it. Uh, then uh, this is the one that causes scarlet fever. Scarlet fever is known for strawberry tongue. Only two things cause that. One is scarlet fever. The other one's Kawasaki. Uh, necrotizing. Also, there's magenta tongue that was in riboflavin deficiency. Right. Uh, necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, necrotizing fasciitis is also does also have a presentation. It looks like this. So you're gonna confuse this with uh, toxic uh, skull syndrome from Steph Aureus. Uh, don't do that. This is what it is. It's usually gonna be on the legs, whereas the other one is all over the body. This one's limited to a limb, as you can notice. Okay. Uh, and it looks like, again, toxic shock leg syndrome, but it's not TSST, right? That happens here. Uh, they do ask about that. Uh, so you need to know how to differentiate between TS level and TSST. Okay. okay, so we're done with that. And now the last one, gamma. This one is a little complicated because they recently added uh, a lot more for S. bovis. S. bovis now is known as uh, Galacticus or something like that. That's the one with uh, colon cancer that causes heart problems. Okay. Uh, this one also was I Love Trees. That was this thing. So it causes UTI, heart problems, and biliary tree problems in biliary tree. So I Love Trees. That's what it was. And sketchy. Uh, gamma. Again. Uh, you check growth in... Uh, 6.5% uh, sodium chloride, and does it have PR, PYR status? If it doesn't grow or doesn't have a status, it's gonna be your S bovis on the left side. 
And if it does, then it's going to be this Enterococcus fasciam and fecalis, right? Uh, I don't think I have much on it, but yeah. So when I say I love trees, this is what it is. That's how you remember for fasciam and fecalis. Uh, I for UTI. Uh, love is heart, heart for endocarditis. And trees, that's your biliary tree infection. Okay, it grows in 6.5% NACL, uh, nosocomial infection, right? It happens in uh, hospitals. It is vancomycin resistant, this thing. Treatment is tigrisillin and linozolid. These are your heavy hitters, right? Uh, you use it in MRSA as well, and also in uh, vein resistance or vancomycin resistance. Uh, for strep ovis, uh, we added a lot this time, so it's in the book. We'll go over it there. All right, now that's done. Now the easy stuff. Everything here doesn't look like anything else. Right, uh, that's why it's easy. For bacilli, uh, it could be aerobic or anaerobic. Again, that's just, uh, does it use oxygen? If the bacteria uses oxygen, we can attack it with... Uh, making drugs that require oxygen to get activated, right? Once it goes in. Uh, and if it's something that doesn't use oxygen, we gotta use drugs that don't need oxygen for that, right? So, and aer aerobic ones are Listeria, Bacillus, and Corynebacterium. Your Listeria is important in pregnant women. Uh, it's, uh, Listeria likes the cold. It's very, uh, easy to pick out and uh, question them that they're talking about listeria because they'll give you that they have tumbling motility. That's what it is, tumbling, tumbling motility. If they use that word, you know it's listeria for sure. Nothing else has tumbling motility, right? Uh, listeria monocytes. If they like the cold and can, uh, can contaminate uh, refrigerated uh, cheese and dairy. Right, so it's gonna be a uh, pregnant woman who eats a lot of deli cheese or something like that, right? Uh, that's how you're gonna remember it. But they're not gonna ask about that anymore. They ask about the this other thing I'll talk about. So pregnant women should stay away from unpasteurized dairy, as baby can get meningitis, right? So if a baby is born with meningitis, it's usually gonna be because of listeria. Okay, that does happen. Babies are born with shit. Uh, a lot of stuff. I was going to say shit, but a lot of stuff. And uh, sometimes they have umbilical cord that's uh, necrosed. That happens, happens because of syphilis. Sometimes they're born, again, if it's syphilis, they're going to be going to have teeth that are crowned, kind of like that. Uh, it's a lot of things, right? So... Listerous, uh, listeriolysin, uh, they have, listeria has this. So what that does is uh, it makes pores and phagosomes, phagolygosomes, right? So if there's a, a macrophage, it's going to make pores and escape out of it. So that's why it doesn't get phagocytized. Even if it does, it escapes it. It can also happen in old people, okay? But this thing also happens because of animal uh, contamination or something like that. And uh, we'll read that in the book when we get to it. Uh, then we read about what? Uh, bacillus, uh, right. So bacillus are two things. B series is the easy one, like, because uh, that's all it's known for. Someone who had infection because they reheated uh, rice or reheated fried, fried rice, right? Anything with rice, it's reheated, you have be serious in the question stem, okay? Not in reality, it's okay to heat rice in reality. <laughs> You're not gonna get that, but in step, if they're mentioning this, this is the one that they're going for. Uh, why is it important? It's, uh, their villains factor is spores. It's an obligate er errors. And the other one is Bacillus anthrax. We already did the mechanism. 
it was elongation factor, uh, increase in CMP, causes edema, prevents phagocytosis, right? Uh, lethal factor, it cleaves the MAP kinase, uh, no cell growth. Okay, MAP kinase is, uh, it's, it's in the, if you bear with me, I'll just, or actually, I'll just search it up. So this is what map kinase is. So you're gonna have, let me just understand how this is happening. Okay, so you have receptors here with tyrosine kinase here, right? Then tyrosine kinase gets phosphorylated with P's. Uh, they get cross phosphorylated. So that's why it goes here and here, this one over here. So that's just saying that it's cross phosphorylated. Then you have GRV. Okay. Goes to actually I'll just do my diagram. This one is, doesn't have the terms. So give me a second. Okay. There's this thing right here. Okay, so you have uh, tyrosine receptor tyrosine kinase over here. Uh, there's dimerization, and um, that's just simply saying that these two get attached. Uh, how they get attached is cross phosphorylation of tyrosine residues, so they both get uh, cross phosphorylated. Uh, phosphorylated SH2 domain is a binding site for various enzymes. Growth factor all local signal molecules cause formation of dimer. Uh, so then, when, once this happens, you get SOS and GRB2 uh, and ROS and GDP complex, all of these uh, attached to it. So when this happens, GDP becomes a ROS uh, GTP complex, and then they separate up from here. From there, it makes RAF, MEC, and ERC, right? So RAF is MEP kinase, kinase, kinase. MEC is MEP kinase kinase and then you have ERK which is MEP kinase and that's how you get it right so RTK and ROS3 kinases okay uh, recently I added this to it so let's just sidetrack a little and see what that is okay it's just insulin one we already did this but anyways, protein kinase A uh, inhibits glycogen synthase and it activates glycogen phosphorylase, right? Uh, threonine and serine phosphorylation, glucagon and epinephrine inhibit what? So insulin receptor, receptor phosphorylation and tyrosine phosphorylation of IRS, that's what they inhibit. Uh, glycogen protein and lipid synthesis as well, okay. Uh, PN3K, RASMAC, that's what tyrosine uh, phosphorylase of 
uh, IRS does cell growth and DNA, DNA synthesis. That's what this is known for, RAS map. Okay, so RAS binds to SH2 domain and becomes activated like that. So this was uh, receptor tyrosine kinase. There's also one that's non-receptor tyrosine kinase that's used by growth hormone prolactin EPL, right? So that's your downstream signal phosphorylation of tyrosine kinase that is bound to intracellular JAK, right? So that's your JAK stat pathway, activates JAK stat pathway, activation of transcription factor factors okay so these things use check step pathway gh prolactin and epo what uses ras pathway or tyrosine ras pathway or whatever insulin uh, igf fgf pdgf egf these are the growth factors that use it i think that's enough sidetrack okay so back to Lethal factor, what it does is um, cleaves MAP kinase, right? So it's MAP kinase that is known for uh, cell growth, right? We just saw that. So when you don't have that, there's no cell growth. And that's what causes the Escher, uh, Escher ulcers or whatever, right? Oh, yeah, that's what's in through. Corny bacterium, corny bacterium, uh, diphtheria is known for its uh, toxin. And uh, when we did the cultures, we remember from that that it's Leuchter media and tell you right, tell you right now you have diphtheria. Right? Uh, okay, so these ones are club shaped. So. It's, uh, you can tell just by looking at it. Corrine bacteria, diphtheria. Right, so it looks like a club, right? That's what it means. They might just give you straight out that is club-shaped bacteria. Uh, it stains with aniline dye stain. Okay. Uh, pathogenesis is toxin-mediated uh, bacteria. It came from bacteriophage. Uh, got infect the bacteria got infected by a virus and then it spread throughout. So, toxin. Uh, it leads to ribosylation of elongation factor. That's the mechanism of diphtheria toxin, ribosylation of elongation factor. So it doesn't grow anymore once diphtheria is there. Uh, it causes pseudomembrane exudate in the oropharynx. This is different from clostridial difficile that makes the pseudomembrane in the GIT. This makes it in uh, oropharynx. Uh, this one is known for as a classic presentation or buzzword for this. They have a neck lymphadenopathy and it makes it look like bull neck, right? So bull neck lymphadenopathy, what does that look like? That's what it looks like. Okay. Uh, Not what I was expecting, but see how the neck looks like it's huge. That's where it comes from. Bull neck. Okay. Uh, so untreated can cause myocarditis and heart block. Okay. Uh, DTAP, disease in developing countries. This is the one you would give, DTAP. That's 
diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. And disease in developing countries happens in immigrants more often than not. And that's it for corny bacteria. Then you have bacilli for anaerobic. Anaerobic, we have Clostridium, Cutie bacterium, and formerly uh, known as Propion bacterium. You don't have to worry about that. Cutie bacterium is the acne one, and Clostridium is the growth one. So Cutie bacteria, it causes acne. It feeds on sebum. Right. Uh, Clostridium. Clostridium causes either te tetanus or food poisoning, or it's uh, Clostridium botulin, or Clostridium perfringi causes gangrene. Uh, then you have Clostridium difficile causes diarrhea and pseudomembrane. And so these four. Let's just go over it. Clostridium titani, it paralysis uh, due to toxin, travels retrograde, uh, dynein. Throwback to biochem, microtubules. Uh, dining uh, through exons. How does it work? It cleaves the snare protein. So it prevents uh, preventing GABA exocytosis. So you don't have uh, inhibitory neurotransmitters anymore. Again, rhesus sarcoidosis, that's what it causes because acetylcholine keeps the sodium channels open and you the neurons and everything everything get, keeps getting contracted and since it's not inhibited anymore and that's why you have the rhesus or rhesus whatever it was uh, okay so first glycine uncontrolled exocytosis okay spasms you get spasms right uh, toxoid vaccine toxin conjugated to protein Obligate uh, anaerobe spores. That's what Clostridium titani is known for. This is all they're going to test you on. Um, Clostridium botulin spores obligate anaerobes. Retrograde toxin flow, cleaved uh, snare protein, prevents acetylcholine exocytosis, causes flaccid paralysis from improper canned foods. Right? Remember, I told you. For adults, it's canned foods. Adults get sick from ingested toxin in canned foods. For babies, it's uh, honey. So baby may get uh, bacterial infection from improperly packaged honey with spores. Again, this is also retrograde uh, toxin flow, dynein. Uh, it's cleaved snare protein. Here, it prevents acetylcholine exocytosis. So this time, uh, you don't get contraction. Instead, you get uh, the floppy baby syndrome, causing flaccid paralysis. Right? They both are spores and obligate anaerobes. Uh, Clostridium perfringens. Uh, this is gas gangrene. It causes gas gangrene. It's due to colonic malignancy. Uh, resides in colon. Right? Already know that. Uh, alpha toxin, we did that. Clostridium, no, we haven't done that, sorry. Uh, so, Clostridium perfringi has uh, alpha toxin uh, capabilities. Uh, hemolysis, sorry, alpha hemolysis. Uh, no, wait, this is different, I think. Alpha toxin. It has lysinase, phospholipase, uh, that lyses RBCs. Okay, yeah, it is that. <sighs> I think I'm getting overwhelmed with all this. Okay. Okay. Has lysinase, uh, phospholipase that lyses RBCs and breaks down, right? And that's why it causes uh, gangrene. Remember, it also causes uh, gas, uh, CO2 gas and hydrogen 2 gas. Uh, Hydrogen gas or hydrogen two, I forget. Uh, so it breaks down cell membrane, causes myonecrosis. That's how it, it works. The mechanism of action of this toxin. Food poisoning due to spore ingestion, slow onset diarrhea. This is the most important thing. 
Nope. No, it's not. It's important here. Not here. My bad. It has double zone hemolysis. Uh, so if they give you that, this is the buzzword for clostridium perforin Okay. Now spores up again and up again. Same thing. All of them are that. Uh, all of the clostridium spores and opposite anaerobes. Clostridium difficile. This is the important one for diarrhea. It causes pseudomembranous colitis. It's due to antibiotic overuse. That's why it happens mostly in uh, hospitals. There was a there was a star, South Park episode on this where everyone starts having that and they had like Tom Brady and they wanted their his fecal sample to put in everyone else because that's actually what you do to treat this, right? Uh, you add you add a stool sample from someone else in the another person so that will proliferate and make the microbiome in this new person now, and that's how you overcome clostridium difficile. Because remember, it happens when all the Bacteria, like the good ones in your intestine, are dead. So, Clostridium difficile has two toxins, right? Toxin A and toxin B. Toxin A, what it does, and they both are important, and they both have different uh, mechanism. So, toxin A binds to the brush border of intestine and causes inflammation and cell death. This is the reason uh, for the inflammation and cell death, okay? It binds to the brush border. So in Sketchy, they had an apple uh, and they were putting on caramelized syrup with a brush on it. And then you had a black licorice uh, to resemble necrosis. So toxin B would be a black licorice. Uh, depolymerizes serious uh, actin and destroys cytoskeleton, right? Because cytoskeleton looks like a licorice fiber. Like it resembles that, so it destroys the cytoskeleton, and that's how it enter. It uh, causes enterocyte death and necrosis. Okay. And so toxin A is the reason you get the pseudomembrane. Uh, this is the pseudomembrane one, toxin A, and toxin B is the reason you get necrosis and black uh, licorice. Okay. Spore and obligate anaerobe. Uh, same thing. Okay. So that was that. So we went over this. So you, now that you have an idea of what these are, when we read about it, it should be pretty fast to grasp it. Uh, 10 minutes. Okay, let's do the last two. Uh, branching filaments. Anaerobe and uh, aerobes. So aerobes, it's easy. No cardia. It's weakly acid fast. And anaerobes, actinomyces, uh, they're not as fast. They'll tell you, the, uh, or they'll just show you a filamentous bacteria, and they'll say it's gram positive. So you're not going to think about fungi or anything. They'll give you that. And then they'll say it's branching filament. Then you have to look out for, is it acid fast or not? If they say it's uh, staining acid fast, then it's going to be no cardia. Uh -huh. And if it doesn't do acid fast, then it's actinomyces. Uh, no cardia is found on in soil. It causes pulmonary infection and immunocompromise and mimics uh, tuberculosis. So symptoms might seem like uh, the dude is losing weight and he's coughing. Right. Uh, it happens in old people, this infection as well. Uh, cutaneous infection and immunocompetent after injury. So cutaneous infection and immunocompetent after injury can spread to CNS, okay? This is also catalase positive. Uh, aerobe acid fast. Treatment here is TMP, SMX, trimethorphan sulfamethasosol. Actinomyces is really as normal GI oral and reproductive flora. Uh, but it can also cause PID and uh, PID. Uh, this is intrauterine device, I guess. 
So I guess when you place that, you get PID. IUD. Hmm. Oral facial abscess that drains through sinus tract. Okay. Remember it was uh, dental abscess. That's what this one is known for. So oral facial abscess that drains through sinuses tra sinus tracts. Also with dental caries uh, or extraction and other maxillary facial trauma. Okay. So between this and radiance, that's the difference. Now, I think I said the wrong thing about this. This one is only from the plaque or the cavities, right? And it causes subacute endocarditis. But when you get infected by actinomyces, it really is when you have dental procedures done. So when you have dental procedures, you can accidentally cause the abscess to leak or whatever. And that's how you get infection. So as associated with dental caries or extraction and other maxillary, maxillofacial trauma. Treatment for this is penicillin. It causes yellow sulfur, sulfur uh, granules. So if the question then talks about some kind of dental procedure, uh, they're talking about this. Uh, but if they're saying that this person has a lot of cavities and he has heart problems, it's gonna be aspirations. Right. And we just did half a page in that hour. <laughs> I'll come back. <clears throat> uh, Staphylococci, novobiosin, uh, cephropithecus is resistant, epidermidis is sensitive, uh, streptococci, optogen, viridence is resistance, resistant, and pneumonia is sensitive, bacteriosin. Group B strep are resistant. Right. Right there. Uh, group B strep are sensitive. I just remember from these, uh, the picture itself. That's how I do the questions, but you can do this if you need to. Hemolytic bacteria, alpha hemolytic bacteria and beta hemolytic bacteria. Uh, so, hemolytic bacteria, alpha hemolytic bacteria, and partial oxidation of hemoglobin. It leads to greenish and brownish color without clearing around growth of blood agar. It includes the streptococcus uni and radians streptococci. Okay. That's these two right here. Let me just do this. Okay, so these were the your alpha uh, hemolytic ones, right? So that's your streptococcus pneumoniae and uh, viridans. Beta hemolytic bacteria are, uh, well, complete lysis of RBC, pale clear area surrounding colony of blood agar, includes, uh, include uh, streptococcus aureus, that's this thing right here, uh, streptococcus pyogenes, group A strep, and Streptococcus acalic T, uh, that's group B strep, and Listeria monocyte genes. Okay, so that's also beta hemolytic. Then now we are at uh, Staphylococcus aureus. How do we get to it? It's gram positive, it's beta hemolytic, it's catalase positive, right? And then it's coagulase positive as well. Uh, and it's cocaine clusters. Uh, it has protein A, a virulence factor. It binds the FC and IgG. So it prevents uh, its attachment to macrophages. Uh, so it escapes phagocytosis, inhibiting complement activation and phagocytosis. Uh, com 
commonly colonizes the nares, ears, axilla, and groin. Uh, causes inflammatory disease uh, in skin infection, organ abscess, uh, pneumonia, often after influenza virus infection, infective endocarditis, uh, septic arthritis, and osteomyelitis, the most important one. Uh, it does cause septic arthritis as well, so just remember that. Uh, TSST or toxic mediated disease, uh, toxic, toxic shock syndrome, uh, skeletal sin skin syndrome, exfoliative toxin, rapid onset of food poisoning, that's the mayo one, food potato salad. Uh, MRSA, MRSA is just methylene resistant, uh, SREs, so those drugs don't work on it, that contain this. Uh, it's important cause of serious healthcare associated and community acquired infections, resistance due to altered penicillin binding proteins conferred by uh, MEC-A gene. That's the gene that gets uh, spread around, I guess. Some strains release Peyton, uh, Valentine, Leukocidin, or PVL. They actually started using this term in the tests. So some strains release uh, patent valentine leukocidin, which kills leukocytes and causes tissue necrosis. So remember this term is associated with step aureus. It kills, it does what? It kills leukocytes uh, and causes tissue necrosis. Okay, in MRSA. So tissue necrosis is only known by for like two things, right? Uh, tissue necrosis happens here and actually three things here, and then you have it in uh, Clostridium perfringens, and then also in uh, Clostridium difficile, but that's on the inside. Uh, TSST one is super antigen that binds to MAC two and T cell receptor, resulting in polyclonal T cell activation and cytokine release. Cephalococcal toxic shock syndrome. Uh, what is that? How do you recognize it? They have fever, vomiting, diarrhea, rash, desquamation and shock, and end organ failure. TSS results in increase in ESD and increase in ALT and increase in bilirubin. It's associated with prolonged use of vaginal tampons and nasal packing. That's what I was talking about. That's what it's known for. It's associated with that. Um, compare with uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, TSS, a toxic shock-like syndrome associated with painful skin infection. As aureus, food poisoning due to ingestion of preformed toxin. Uh, short incubation period, so two to six hours, followed by non-bloody diarrhea and emesis. Uh, enterotoxin, so in the picnic, the potato salad was kept outside. So the way to prevent that would have been like put in a fridge. So uh, there's no, you know, SREs doesn't make the toxin if it's in the fridge. So short incubation period, two to six hours, uh, followed by non-bloody diarrhea and emesis. Enterotoxin is heat stable, so not de destroyed by cooking. SREs makes coagulase and toxins, forms a fibrin clot around itself and abscess. It forms fibrin clot around itself. That's why it, it creates an abscess. That's how it creates the abscess, right? So coagulase is just that. That's why it's coagulase positive. If you had like boils and stuff uh, on your skin, it's most likely it's just Cestap aureus. Uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis, uh, how do we get there? It's gram positive, catalase positive, it's coagulase negative, and yeah, and novobiosin uh, positive, right? It's novobiosin sensitive. Uh, it's also positive for urease, cocaine cluster. Does not, so if the, it's cocaine cluster, it's going to be one of these three, anyways. If it's novobiosin sensitive, that's navel on skin. Skin is epidermis, so does not ferment mannitol versus SREs. SREs does ferment mannitol. That's also how you differentiate between the two. 
uh, normal microbiota of skin contaminates blood cultures, infects prosthetic devices like hip implant or heart valves, uh, and IV catheters, not port catheters, IV catheters um, by producing adherent biofilms. Okay. Uh, Staphylococcus cephrophyticus, again, gram positive, uh, catalase positive, and then coagulase uh, negative, and then you have no biosin resistant. Right, that's how you get cephrophyticus. It's curious positive and a cocaine cluster. Normal biota of female genital tract and perineum. Uh, second most common cause of uncomplicated UTI in young females. The most common one is obviously E. coli. Uh, strep pneumonia. Okay, S was for sinusitis. That's the one that I missed. Uh, Gram positive, alpha hemolytic, lancet shaped. Again, they'll use, if they use this word, it's because of this. Uh, Gram positive, alpha hemolytic, lancet shaped. Right, so that, that. That's how you get there. It's gram positive. It's catalase negative. And then you do uh, hemolysis is partially partial. So then you do optogen sensitivity. That's how you get to S hemolytic. It's encapsulated and it has an IgA protease. So it attaches to the or adheres to the mucous membrane because IgA usually prevents that. But if it cleaves the IgA, then that happens. Optogen sensitive and bile soluble. Most commonly causes mops, uh, meningitis, otitis media, pneumonia, and sinusitis. Pneumococcus is associated with rusty sputum. I told you about that already. So remember that. Rusty sputum. If they say rusty sputum, think as pneumonia. Patients with hyposplenia or asplenia. Again, most common in these patients, right? And uh, no virulence without capsule. So if they don't have the capsule, there won't be any uh, virulent factor. So it won't cause any symptoms, right? But MOPS is what it's known for meningitis, otitis media, pneumonia, and sinusitis. Viridens group of streptococci. How do we get there? It's gram positive. It's catalase negative. Uh, hemolysis is alpha, hemolytic cocci. It is optogen resistant and it's bile insoluble. Uh, normal bio microbiota of the oropharynx, streptococcus mutants, and S. midis causes dental caries. Okay, uh, that's all it's known for. Uh, along with this, this is the other thing that's known for. S. sanguinis uh, makes dextrins, right? So remember that. It makes dextrin that binds to fibrin platelet aggregates on damaged heart valves. So if you have damaged heart valves, that's where it's gonna, you know, congregate, or like attach to. Um, it, how? It makes dextrins that binds to uh, fibrin platelet aggregates, right? Because if something is damaged, what are you gonna have? You're gonna have platelets trying to fix it. So if you have platelets there, this thing makes dextrin that attaches to that platelet. So now it's going to cause infective endocarditis. So you have streptococci on your heart. Weirdens group uh, strep live in the mouth because they're not afraid of the chin. So of the chin. Okay. Uh, sanguinous equals blood. Think there is a lot of blood in the heart. So infective endocarditis. I've gone over it enough times for you to just remember me saying it. <laughs> but anyways, radiance endocarditis or infective endocarditis. Okay, now streptococcus pyogenes, group A streptococci. How do we get there? It's gram positive, catalase negative, and beta hemolytic. And then uh, it is uh, bactericin sensitive and has the PYR status, right? So it's gram positive cocci and chain, group A strip. Okay, it's bigger. Uh, gram positive cocci and chain, group A strip causes uh, three things. Uh, pyogenic, uh, 
pyogenic is pharyngitis, cellulitis, empedico, that's the honey crusted lesion, and irps, irpsillas, what are these? An acute, sometimes recurrent disease caused by bacterial infection. It is characterized by large raised red patches on the skin, as far as that of the face and legs with fever and severe general. Let's just look at what that looks like. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Like a black eye, but red kind of thing. And this just looks like cellulitis. That's cellulitis, okay. So we have a basic idea of what it means. Okay. Uh, toxigenic, scarlet fever. Toxic, uh, scarlet fever is the one where you have uh, strawberry tongue. Uh, toxic shock-like syndrome. Uh, and necrotizing fasciitis. That was uh, the necrosis on the limb. Immunologic, uh, rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis. So this is the one that causes rheumatic fever. And because of that, it also causes glomerulonephritis, right? Because of the complex that it makes uh, and it settles in the kidneys causing this. Okay, uh, bacteriocin uh, sensitive, beta hemolytic, uh, PYR status positive, or pyrolidinoil Adyl amidase, hyaluronic acid a capsule and M protein inhibit phagocytosis. Uh, antibodies to M protein enhance host defenses against aspirogens, but can also give rise to rheumatic fever. Already explained why that is. Uh, diagnose strep pharyngitis via throat swab. Again, just to quick review. Uh, as pyogenes has uh, M protein, M protein, uh, then we make antibodies against M protein. Uh, so it takes care of it. But then uh, we have antibodies now all over the body looking for M protein. When it gets complicated is that M protein resembles uh, the myosin fibers in the uh, heart or the cardiac cells. So then it's going to go attached to that and cause problems there. And that's how you get uh, the rheumatic disease. Okay, so diagnosis, diagnose strep pharyngitis via throat swab, which can be tested with an antigen detection assay. Okay, antigen or ADA. Uh, rapid in-office results or cultured on blood agar results in 48 hours. Um, pyogenes pharyngitis can result in rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis. So when that thing goes and attaches to like M protein and stuff, uh, it's going to try to excrete it out the body, right? But the complex is heavy now, so it's going to settle somewhere. So anywhere there's turbulence. So there's turbulence in kidneys, so it settles there. Uh, and that's where you get glomerulonephritis. Strains causing empedico can induce glomerulonephritis. Uh, key virulence factors include DNAs, erythrogenic exotoxin, streptokinase, and streptolysin A. ASO titer or anti-DNAs, B antibodies indicate recent S. pyogenes infection. So there's a question about uh, these things. Uh, there was a question about what can you do? Uh, okay, right. So PHS department is uh, looking for ways to find, figure out if uh, infection is uh, due to strep pyogenes, right? Uh, and if there's early detection, they can take care of it and, you know, that, all that, do all that stuff. So what is it going to prevent in the future if that happens? What it's going to prevent is heart diseases, right? Or myocarditis or something like that. Uh, mitral valve failure or whatever. So that would be the answer. That's what it prevents in the future, heart diseases or rheumatic heart disease. Okay. Now, scarlet fever, uh, blanching, sandpaper-like body rash, 
Uh, this is the buzzword, strawberry tongue. And circumoral paler in the setting of group A streptococcal pharyngitis, antigenic toxins, okay? Uh, this is also used a lot, circumoral paler, but that happens in like a few other things too. So it's not really a buzzword. What is, is this the red tongue or strawberry tongue? Uh, there's sandpaper like body rash on scarlet fever as well as sand flashing. Okay. Uh, streptococcus A gallic T, group B streptococci. Group, uh, so how do we get there? It is gram positive, uh, cocci, catalase negative, and it is uh, beta hemolytic, right? So gram positive cocci, bactericin uh, sensitive uh, is negative, so it's not, so it's bactericin resistant, beta hemolytic. It colonizes vagina, that's why it, uh, a baby might get it from a mother. Okay, so beta hemolytic colonizes vagina, causes pneumonia, meningitis, and sepsis, mainly in babies. It's called the vertical transmission. Uh, polysaccharide capsule confers uh, virulence, produces cap factor, which enlarges the area of hemolysis formed by S. aureus test. Uh, hemolysis formed by S. aureus. Okay. Okay, so what is cat factor? It produces cat factor, which enlarges the area of hemolysis formed by aureus. So they're gonna put an aureus, and then they're gonna put in strep streptococcus agalacti, and then they're gonna put it parallelly. So the one, uh, the intersection where it touches the aureus and uh, streptococcus, uh, that area is gonna have a higher amount of hemolysis than the area that Staphylococcus aureus had, right? They ask you this. How would you figure out it's this when you're culturing it with S aureus? So this is how you would do that. No, uh, CAMP stands for the author of the test, not cyclic AMP. Uh, Hippurate test is positive, PYR is negative. Uh, screen pregnant patients at 35 to 37 weeks gestation with rectal and vaginal swab. If the patient is positive, give penicillin or ampicillin prophylaxis intrapartum. Intrapartum is important. They ask you when you would give it. So if you don't know what that is, let's just look up. It's during, uh, basically during the childbirth. Uh, during the labor. Okay. Peripartum is around, right? So intrapartum is during. Okay. Uh, streptococcus bovis. This is the complicated one that I said that it's hard to notice. Like, if you don't know about it, you won't figure it out from the question stem. Uh, Gram positive cocci colonizes the gut. Uh, as uh, galolyticus. Okay, galolyticus, that's what it's called. It's the S. bovis biotype 1. It can cause bacteremia and infective endocarditis. Okay. Uh, patients with S. bovis endocarditis have increased incidence of colon cancer. So increased colon cancer and endocarditis. These two things. So they might say that the person has heart, can heart problems and then when they cultured the bacteria, they found that it was catalase negative, right? Uh, they just might give you that, that's gram positive catalase negative. What could it be? Then you have to remember that it's the, as, oh, they will give you uh, which kind it was, because you might confuse it with weirdness, right? Because that also causes infective endocarditis. So they'll give you, some way of differentiating between them. They might say it's uh, it grows in NACL, right? Or it grows in uh, bile, something like that. So then you know it's as bovis or as calorlyticus. So 
patients with S. bovis endocarditis have increased incidence of colon cancer. Um, bovis in the blood, cancer in the colon. Baby is seizing me. Uh, Enterococci, that's I love trees. Just one. Gram positive cocci, how do we get there? It's a cocci, catalase negative. Uh, and it's gamma hemolytic. And it grows in NACL, right? Okay, so as bovis doesn't grow in NACL, sorry. It's this one that grows in NACL. Uh, so gram positive cocci, enterococci, E fecalis, and E fascium are normal colonic microbiota that are penicillin G resistant and causes UTI, biliary tract infection, and infective endocarditis. Following GI, GU procedure, uh, catalase negative, PYR positive, typically non hemolytic. Uh, this is also vancomycin resistant, uh, enterococci, right? Remember, it gets passed down to Steph aureus because of that fancy letter and numbers, TY something, two, five, six, four, something like that. Yeah. It's not important. What is important is that this one is vancomycin resistant enterococci and are important cause of healthcare associated infection. Enterococci are more resilient than streptococci. It can grow in 6.5% NACL and bowel lab test. Entero is intestine, fecalis is species, strepto is twisted chains, and coccus is berry. Uh, Bacillus anthracis or anthrax. Uh, how do we get there? That's not a long route, right? So it's only, it's gram positive and it's bacillus and it's aerobic. That only leaves three things. So you have to differentiate between these three and those three are very different from one of the uh, gram positive spore forming rod that produces anthrax toxin and exotoxin consisting of protective antigen. It has a lethal factor and edema factor. Okay. Uh, I thought I had notes on this, but I don't. Okay, so gram positive spore forming rod that produces anthracin and exotoxin consisting of protective antigen, lethal factor, and edema factors. Edema factor is the one that causes the swelling around the ulcer. Lethal factor is the one that causes death, right? And protective antigen is the one that spore, I guess, kind of thing. So the spore or the capsule is made by this. It has a pep polypeptide capsule, poly D glutamine. That's what it's made of. This is important. So remember, anthrax has a capsule made of poly D glutamine. Colonies show a halo of projections. Uh, that's why it's called the Medusa head. Uh, okay. They might say that there's an the culture shows uh, Medusa like projections or something like that. So it's it's called the Medusa head. Sometimes called the Medusa head appearance right there. Okay. Both cutaneous and poly Pulmonary anthrax may be complicated by hemorrhagic meningitis. Cutaneous anthrax, painless papules surrounded by vesicles, uh, leads to ulcer with black asher. Painless necrotic uncommonly progresses to bacteremia and death. Pretty easy to find out. But when you remember that uh, other stuff has necrosis as well, it's harder to just figure it out from the image itself. You gotta go into the question and read it. Uh, pulmonary anthrax, inhalation of spores, most commonly from contaminated animal as an animal products, is usually sheep, uh, sheep stuff, because that's where wool comes, and this is known as the wolf sortis disease. So contaminated animals and animal products, although also a potential bioweapon, because uh, it causes flu-like symptoms that rapidly progress to fever, pulmonary hemorrhage, and mediastinitis. Uh, chest x-ray may show vein, 
mediastinum and shock. It's also called Wolf Sorter's disease. Prophylaxis with ciprofloxacin and doxycycline when exposed. Uh, so they might say that a person was sorting wool without gloves or something like that. And then they came in with uh, flu-like symptoms, but now they're much more serious, even though they were treated for flu. Because how do you treat flu? You just, it's symptomatic, right? So <laughs> it's going to get worse. That's how you figure out it's anthrax. But this is the buzzword, wolf, wolf sorter. You'll see that. Uh, how do you treat it? Uh, prophylaxis with ciprofloxacin and doxycycline. Uh, doxycycline is used in anything that has animal or animal stuff, right? So be serious. Uh, I don't know why they have so much in here. It's only you. All you need to know is this <laughs> right there. If you any anything has rice in it, it's be serious. Uh, Gram positive rot causes food poisoning. Uh, spores surviving survive cooking rice or reheated rice syndrome. Keeping rice warm results in germination of spores and enterotoxin formation. Emetic type causes nausea and vomiting within one to five hours, caused by cerulide, a uh, preformed toxin. Diarrheal type causes watery, non bloody diarrhea and GI pain. Within 8 to 18 hours, management is supportive care. Antibiotics are infective against toxins. Okay, so supportive care and antibiotics are ineffective against toxins. I need a water break. Hold on, give me a second. On Clostridia, gram positive, spore forming, obligate anaerobic loss. So, how do we get there? Uh, it's going to be gram positive, uh, bacilli, and then you can, it's going to be anaerobic. Uh, Tetanus toxin and botulinum toxins are proteins that cleave snare protein include involved in neurotransmission. Um, Clostridium tetani. Pathogen is non-invasive and remains localized to wound sites. Uh, produce tetanosplasmins and exotoxin causing tetanus. Uh, tetanospasm Spasmins spreads by retrograde axonal transport to CNS and blocks release of GABA and glycine. It blocks both of these. You're going to remember GABA, but you're not going to remember glycine. Remember it. I told you remember it. From Renshaw cells in spinal cord, right? Uh, it causes spastic paralysis, trismus, or lockjaw, rhesus sarcoidosis, uh, sar Donicus, raised eyebrows and open grin, and ophthalmos spasms and spinal extensors. We looked into all of these before. So, tetanus is tetanic uh, paralysis. Prevent with tetanus vaccine. Treat with antitoxin with or without vaccine booster. Antibiotics: diazepam for muscle spasms and wound wound uh, debridement. So that's how you prevent it. The most important one is this antitoxin with or without the vaccine booster. Okay. Clostridium botulinum produces a heat lip labile uh, toxin that inhibits acetylcholine release at the neuro 
muscular junction. So you get uh, this one was causing spastic paralysis. This is going to be flaccid paralysis, right? Because you don't have any acetylcholine. If you don't have acetylcholine, you don't get any sodium to do depolarization. So if there's no depolarization, there's no contraction. No contraction, flaccid. Causing uh, release of neurotransmitter, causing much longer. So in babies, ingestion of spores, for example, in honey, leads to disease, floppy baby syndrome. In adults, disease is caused by ingestion of preformed toxins, also, uh, for example, in canned foods. Symptoms of botulism, uh, the five Ds, diplopia, dysarthria, dysphagia, dyspnea, dys descending flaccid paralysis, does not present with sensory deficits. Right? Your sensory stuff is going to work just fine. It's just these five things. Diplopia, dysarthria, dysphagia, dyspnea, and descending flaccid paralysis. Uh, botulinum is from bad bottles of food, juice, and honey. Sorry. Uh, treatment is human botulinum and immunoglobulin. Local botulinum uh, toxin A, Botox injections used to treat focal dystonia, uh, hyperhidrosis, muscle spasms, and cosmetic reduction of facial wrinkles. Right? Hyperhidrosis just increased sweating. Uh, and dystonia is just uh, focal, right? So it's uh, some parts, not all. muscle spasm and cosmetic reduction of facial wrinkles that's why we do botox or you know we have something that called botox funnily it was meant on uh, the botox they were experimenting one was for uh cere cerebral palsy uh, but then they figured out that uh, it reduces wrinkles so then they're like, you know, so a pulse can wait. People need to help treat their wrinkles. So they completely abandoned that research. <laughs> and now it's thriving in cosmetics. Uh, Clostridium perfringens uh, produces alpha toxin. Uh, just a fair warning, I heard that from a comedian who had cerebral palsy. Don't know if it's true or not. Clostridium perfringens um, produces alpha toxin, lecithinase, a phospholipase that can cause micronecrosis, myonecrosis, sorry, uh, we already know that. Uh, gas gangrene uh, presents as soft tissue crepitus and hemolysis. If he heavily spore contaminated food is cooked but sta left standing too long at less than 60 degrees Celsius, spores germinate. Uh, if they germinate, you get vegetative bacteria, which are heat level enterotoxin. And then you have late onset, like 10 to 12 hours of food poisoning symptoms. Resolution is in 24 hours. Perfringens uh, perforate a gangrenous leg. Uh, spontaneous gas gangrene via hematogenous seeding. Associated with colonic uh, malignancy is most commonly caused by Clostridium septicum. Uh, for this, the question stem is just going to have a, what are they going to have? A person working in a garage and then he accidentally stepped on a rusty nail or he hit a rust, rusty nail. And then after a while, he has, uh, the skin has darkened or got black and it's making sound or, you know, it's bubbling. Because of, remember, oh, CO2 and hydrogen, it makes it. So... You're going to think, okay, rusty nail, that's tetanus or tetanus or tetanus, right? But it's going to be this clostridium perfringens because tetanus doesn't cause blackening of the skin, right? Uh, C. difficile, clostridium difficile or clostridiodes, clostridiodes uh, difficile. I'll just say C. difficile. 
produces toxin A and B, which damage anthrocytes. Both toxins lead to watery diarrhea uh, uh, and uh, cause pseudomembranous colitis. That's B right there. Often secondary to antibiotic use, especially clindamycin, ampicillin, cephalosporines, fluoroquinolones associated with PPIs. So one or even like combination of these are used in like hospitals. That's why it's more common in hospitals than anywhere else. Okay, and proton pump inhibitors, you they give that with antibiotics anyways. So that's why it's associated with that. Uh, fulminant infection, toxic megacolon, ileus, and shock. And deficit causes diarrhea. Uh, diagnosis uh, is diagnosed by PCR or antigen uh, detection of one or both toxins in stool. Treatment is oral vancomycin or fidoxamycin. For recurrent cases, consider repeating prior regime or fecal microbiota transplant. So that's what uh, the thing was about, the South Park episode, fecal microbiota transplant, which is basically putting Tom Brady's fecal matter into someone else. That's what the whole episode was about. Okay, toxin A is the one that causes pseudomembrane. Toxin B uh, depolymerizes actin, destroys cytoskeleton, causing erythrocyte death and necrosis, right? B for black licorice and A for apple that has a brush uh, painting syrup on it or something. So pseudomembrane looks like syrup. It binds to brush border, causes inflammation and cell death. All of the, both of these things cause watery diarrhea. Okay. Uh, coronary diff bacterium diphtheria, that's the bull neck one. Okay. Uh, that's this one right up here, vertical right there. Uh, how do we get there? It's gram positive, uh, bacilli, and Arabic. And right there. It's club shaped, right? Remember that. Um, gram positive rods occurring in angular arrangements, uh, transmitted via respiratory droplets, causes diphtheria via exotoxin encoded by bacterial prophage. Potent exotoxin in inhibits protein synthesis via ADP ribosylation of elongation factor two. So that's the mechanism of action right there. Potent exotoxin inhib inhibits protein synthesis, how? Via ADP ribosylation of elongation factor two. Uh, leading to possible necrosis in pharynx, cardiac and CNS tissue. So. Over here, that's what it is, right? So that's elongation factor. So what it does is it goes and does that. ADP, so no protein synthesis occurs. That's just a callback to that. Leading to possible necrosis in pharynx, cardiac, and CNS tissue. Symptoms include uh, pseudomembranous uh, pharyngitis. So this also makes pseudomembrane, but this one is in oropharynx or pharyngitis, right? Uh, whereas this one was in the intestine. So symptoms include pseudomembrane and pharyngitis, grayish white membrane. This is grayish white that was yellowish with lymphadenopathy or bull neck appearance. Toxin dissemination may cause myocarditis, arrhythmias, and neuropathies. Uh, lab diagnosis based on gram positive rods with metachromatic blue and red granules and elk test for toxins. Toxoid vaccine prevents diphtheria. Okay. Uh, DTAP. 
uh, corny. It's club shape, metachromatic granules, and Leuchter media on Leuchter media. Um, black colonies on cysteine telluride agar. Tell you right now you have diphtheria. Or tell you right now you're corny. I think that one works better. Uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. A, D, P, ribosylation. B for beta prophage. C for corny bacterium. D for diphtheria. E for elongation. And F for factor 2 and granules. Okay. So, A, D, P, ribosylation. Beta prophage or bacteriophage. Uh, corny bacterium. Diphtheria. Elongation factor 2 and granules. Treatment is diphtheria, antitoxin, with or without erythromycin or penicillin. Okay. Uh, now we're on lister, yeah. Monocytogens. Uh, Gram positive, facultative, intracellular rod acquired by ingestion of unpasteurized dairy products and cold deli meats. Transplacental transmission by vaginal transmission during birth. Grows well at refrigeration uh, temperatures, cold enrichment, forms rocket tails, red in this, via actin polymerization that allows intracellular movements and cell-to-cell -cell spread. So that's how they uh, spread throughout the body. Uh, and it's not detected by the immune system. It's because they have tumbling motility. It forms rocket tail via actin polymerization that allows intracellular movement so they move throughout the cells and cell to cell so when cell is a cell to cell so like the cell that's next to the cell that they're in they'll just travel through it they won't travel through the blood itself like the serum right that's why it's not picked up by the uh, immune system outside and the immune system inside the cell before they can detect it, they move on to the next one. Okay, so thereby avoiding antibody. Uh, Listerolysin generates uh, pores in phagosomes, allowing escape into the cytoplasm. Right. Uh, so, yeah, the lysosomes are phagosomes or whatever. Even if it captures it, they're just going to make pores and escape through it. Uh, like prison break. Characteristic is uh, tumbling motility in broth. So they will more like more than likely just tell you that. Okay. Uh, okay. Can cause uh, amnionitis. That's inflammation of the amnion fluid or amniotic sac, I guess. Uh, septicemia and spontaneous abortion in pregnant patients. That's a more serious one. Granulomatosis, infants, infantiseptica, meningitis in immunocompromised patients, neonates, and older adults, mild and self limited gastroenteritis in healthy individuals. Okay, so ingestion of unpasteurized dairy products and cold deli meats. Okay, so earlier I said it's because of animal as well, but it's not written here, so forget about that. Uh, nocardia versus actinomyces. Uh, both are gram positive and form long branching filaments resembling fungi. Right, so they might give you a photo and they tell you that it's gram positive, then don't think about fungus, right? Think about nocardia and actinomyces. And then if they tell you it's acid fast, then it's going to be no cardia. If they tell you it's not acid fast, then it's actinomyces. Uh, if it's air, if it's sorry, if it's aerobe, then it's no cardia, and anaerobe, then it's actinomyces. Found in soil, no cardia is found in soil. It causes pulmonary infection and immunocompromise. It can mimic uh, tuberculosis, but with negative PPD. So again. The person might have cough, he loses weight, he's an immigrant from South Asia or something, or a tropical place, and then uh, they do the PPD test and it comes back negative, right? So 
it could be this nocardia. Uh, cutaneous infections after trauma and immunocompetent uh, can spread to CNS and cause cerebral abscess. For cerebral abscess, uh, there'll be a lot more. Uh, they'll give you a lot more detail about the questions, so you can figure it out from that. But mostly for cerebral abscess, they keep it very simple. It's either going to be your uh, teneous oleum uh, for neurosis sarcosis, or it's going to be your toxoplasmosis, which causes the ring-like thing, or it's going to be your PML because of GC virus. That's your progressive multifocal leuco something. But it's going between these three, and then it's going to be either your subdural hemorrhage or just something else of that sort. They're not going to ask about these things. Right. Uh, treat with sulfonamides, uh, TMP or SMX. Okay. Uh, actinomyces, anaerobes, not as fast. Normal oral. It's found norm. It, it's normally in oral, reproductive, and GI microbiota. It causes oral facial abscess that drain through the sinus tract, often associated with dental caries, extraction, and other maxillofacial trauma. Forms yellow sulfur granules. If they just give you that, then it's just easy to know that it's this, right? Uh, how you remember that is yellow sulfur granule looks like yellow sand, and there's a lot of sand in Israel. So that's why actinomyces is really, you can remember it that way. It can also cause PID and uh, PID with IUDs. Okay, that's what it was. So yeah, IUDs, if you, uh, with that, it can cause PID. You treat it with um, penicillin. So the easy way to remember this is treatment is SNAP, sulfonamides or you know, trimethorphanol sulfamethoxazole for no cardia and actinomyces uh, and penicillin. Because actinomycin has sulfur granules or it has sand, if you give more sulf sulfur, it's not going to do anything. It's just going to add to the sand. You can think of it that way. So sulfonamides are for no cardia and for actinomyces, you got to bring in the big ones, penicillin. Um, mycobacteria tuberculosis, it's acid fast. Okay, uh, for this, hold on. Tuberculosis, you worked. Okay, 10 minutes. Don't zone out on me. Just give me a second. Oh, okay, forget it. Can't find it. Uh, so mycobacteria, SFS rods, pink rods, uh, arrow is A right there. That's what it looks like. Those are SFS rods. It's going to be very easy to figure out it's this. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, TB, it's often resistant to multiple drugs. You have M. avium, uh, intracellular, causes disseminated non-TB disease in AIDS, often resistant to multiple drugs, right? Uh, then you have M. sacrofulgium, uh, cervical lymphadenitis in children, and M. merium. This is the one they ask about. Uh, they don't ask about the other two. Well, they ask about this in HIV. Uh, it only happens when it's severe, like uh, the CD count is really low. That's when this starts showing up in your cultures. Uh, M. merium, hand infection in aquarium handlers. So someone who's working in an aquarium or something, they're going to have this. So TB symptoms include fever, night sweats, weight loss, cough, non-productive or productive, and hemoptysis. Cord factor uh, creates a serpentine cord. 
Appearance in virulent and tuberculosis strain activates macrophages, promoting granuloma formation and induces release of TNF alpha sulfatides, uh, surface glycolipids, inhibit phagolysosome fusion. So in this, uh, remember the chord factor is there and what it looks like. So chord factor creates a serpentine chord appearance in virulent and tuberculosis strain. What they do is it activates macrophages, promoting granuloma formation, right? And it inhibits release of TNF alpha. Remember that uh, M avium happens in uh, AIDS, right? Uh, and often resists to multiple drugs. So when your CD count is really low, that's when it shows up. If you have this, it's one of those diseases that define AIDS, right? And then M merium is in aquarium handlers. Tuberculosis, uh, this is very important. Uh, let's finish it. How much time do I have? Seven minutes. Okay. We have time. Uh, tuberculosis. So PPD positive if current infection or past exposure. So even if you had it like five years ago, it's going to show up. Or 10 years ago, it's going to show up. Right. Uh, but PPD is negative if, if there is no infection and in immunocompromised patients, because even if they have it, your body's not, you know, able to fight it off. So you're not going to have any sign of fight in it in your body. So that's why it's negative in immunocompromised patients, especially with low CD4 count uh, cell counts. Uh, interferon gamma release LA assay, that's IGRA or IGRA, has fewer false positive from BCG vaccine, right? PPD also gives you false positive uh, because of BCG vaccination. So when you uh, think it's that, you do this, interferon gamma release assay or IGRA, because so, they have fewer false positive from BCG vaccination. Uh, creating, uh, sorry, caseating uh, granulomas with central necrosis and Langerhans giant cell, right? Uh, single example in a, so that's what it looks like, caseating. Okay, it's either that or then uh, there's one where you see this blue stuff, it's all over the middle part. So that's non caseating, right? Let me look that up. Yeah, so. You see the blue part, if it's all over the place, that's non-caseating, right there. And then caseating is something that is clear in the middle, right? That's clear in the middle, that's clear in the middle, that's clear in the middle, clear in the middle, and clear in the middle. You need to be able to recognize these because this is how you differentiate tuberculosis from uh, Crohn's disease, sarcoidosis, leprosy, or, you know, ber berylosis as well, I think. Okay, so learn to differentiate the two just from the diagram or the picture. Uh, Langerhans cells, fused macrophages, and Langerhans cells, dermis, uh, antigen presenting cells. Okay. Uh, Langerhans cells are antigen presenting cells for the skin, by the way. Uh, TB reactive. Okay, let me read that again. Casein granulomas with central necrosis and Langerhans giant cells. Single example in A are characterized of characteristics of uh, secondary tuberculosis. Do not confuse Langerhans giant cells, fused macrophages with Langerhans cells. That's a dermal one. Okay. Uh, TB reactivation risk highest in uh, immunocompromised individuals. For example, HIV, organ transplant recipients. And if before we give TNF-alpha inhibitors, we always do a PPD test. That's like a norm. You do not give this without this. Because if you give this, and if this is positive, what does that mean? That means the macrophages are walling off the tuberculosis. So if you give tumor necrosis factor alpha, the macrophages are going to stop containing the tuberculosis and go where it's needed elsewhere, right? Anywhere but walling off TB. 
So then you're going to have reactivation of TV because of that. That's why you don't give this without doing this. And if this comes back positive, you don't give it. But reactivation has a predilection for the apices of lungs due to the bacteria being highly aerobic. Uh, that's why uh, when we do lung, I mean, recipe, we'll learn that uh, the apexes of lung has a wasted ventilation. That means it's highly ventilated, but poorly perfused. And the base of the lung is uh, poorly ventilated, but highly perfused. Right? So that's wasted perfusion at the bottom and wasted ventilation at the top. So that's why over here, it's going to start off with cons focus over here. When in the primary tuberculosis, you get microtube mycobacterium tubercle is coming in and it goes down here in the base and then eventually it's going to travel upwards and you're going to have it in the apex because it likes that ventilation right so do we we love the ac <laughs> uh hyalur lymph node is over here it's going to be in the hyalur region of the lungs uh they're going to be you're going to see that because it's going to be bigger right so you'll pick it up in the x-ray uh, you'll see cons focus in primary tuberculosis only. Okay. And if it's down here, it's always going to be cons focus. Okay. Uh, then 90% uh, of the time, what happens? It heals by fibrosis or calcification, right? Uh, PPD will still give you positive. If there is reactivation, you'll see fibrocaceous cavity lesion, usually upper lobes up there, right? Uh, localize destructive disease this is cavity cassation scarring and this sometimes with the cavity after it's treated you'll have some kind of fungal growth it's aspergillosis uh it's called the fungal ball in the cavity it's it because of aspergillosis it happens in the cavity made by tuberculosis in 10 percent of the time what happens is progressive primary tuberculosis in aids or um, malnutrition so that will then get uh, disseminated into the blood so you will have bacteremia and progressive lung disease right the then once it's in the blood it can go anywhere you can have tb in the brain in the meninges uh, you can have it in the vertebra it's called the pots disease in the vertebra you can have it in the lymph node you can have lungs you can have liver you can actually also have tb in the intestine and in the spleen adrenal glands and also joints and lung bones so learn about that stuff, the gun focus, how much time do we have? Oh, uh, just read from my notes. Mycobacteria tuberculosis, it is an acid pass rod. Mycolic acid, uh, cord factor, atypical pneumonia. Uh, treatment is doxycycline, macrolides, fluoroquinolones. Isoniazid can be used for monotherapy and prophylaxis. Uh, this can cause vitamin D deficiency. Uh, risk factors are HIV, uh, steroids, TNF alpha inhibitors, diabetes mellitus, prone chronic renal disease, uh, in uh, malignancy, sorry, illicit drugs, alcohol, tobacco malnutrition, underweight, right? All of these are risk factors for TB. Okay. Uh, leprosy, also called Hansen's disease, caused by mycobacterium leprae and acephas bacillus that likes cool temperature, infects skin, superficial nerves, so you have glove and stocking, loss of sensation. This is important. Uh, they give you that this uh, glove and stocking loss of sensation in the question stem. Or they just tell you that no feelings in the extremities. Uh, and cannot be grown into in vitro. Diagnosis by a skin biopsy. So it's difficult to culture. They're going to say that too. So. Diagnosis via skin biopsy or tissue PCR. Reservoir in United States is armadillos. Okay. Hansen's disease. 
and my lower term is about pre. Leprosy has two forms. Many fall cases fall temporarily between two extremes, uh, lepromatous and tuberculoid. Lepromatous uh, presents diffusely over the skin and linene or line-like facies and is communicable, high bacterial load. Uh, characterized by low cell-mediated immunity with a largely TH2 response, right? What was TH2? That's TH2 right there. That's how it works. So hemorrhoid immunity, it B cell, IgE, eosinophil, and macrophages. Okay, uh, lepromatous presents diffusely over the skin with line like face and is communicable, high bacterial load, characterized by low cell immunity, cell mediated immunity with a largely th2 because since it's uh, it can do cellular immunity, this is what it uh, you know. does that's why it, uh what do you say dependent on that okay i'm losing my words now uh lepromatous form can be lethal so that's i remember that lepromatous is more lethal it's highly communicable they had a lepra community right uh it was a society like in an island on an island and basically everyone there who lived had leprosy uh, that's before they figured out the treatment for it. Uh, tuberculoid, uh, limited to a few hypoesthetic, uh, hairless skin flecks, characterized by high cell mediated immunity with a largely TH1 type response and low bacterial load. Right. So it's limited to a few hypoesthetics. Uh, you have hairless skin flecks. Yeah. Oh, it's not here. Characterized by high cell mediated immunity with largely TH1 type. So tuberculoid does TH1. Lepromatous is dependent on TH2 response and bacterial load. So since this one has cell mediated immunity it's functioning, it's not as dangerous as lepromatous because it doesn't have cell mediated immunity. You have uh, glove, glove and stocking loss of sensation. And they will give you that the person has a line like face or something like that. Okay, or yeah. Uh, this happens because as a fast business likes, so I mean cold temperature, right? Okay, uh, this is what they might test you on to treatment. Dapsone and rifampin for tuberculoid form and clofezamine is added for lepromatous. So you for lepromatous is dapsone, rifampin and uh, clofazimine. Okay. Okay. Now we're on to gram negative lead algorithm. Okay, so we have gram negative, and then we have diplococci, cocal bacilli, bacilli, and curved rods. Right. Oh, I'll do this. So we'll do. Diplocoid first because that's the most important one. They ask a lot of this area. How do we get there? It's gram negative diplococci. Um, they can say it's diplococci or they can say cocci in pairs. Yeah, it's going to be this. Uh, they're aerobic. So then you see if it's maltose fermenting 
uh, if it's maltose positive, it's going to be M for M meningitis. If it's not, then it's going to be N gonorrhea. Okay. Uh, so N meningitis is found in nares. So N meningitis is found in nares and spread by respiratory droplets, right? Uh, it's found mostly in college dorms, uh, asplenic people susceptible as well. Remember, there was three things as pneumonia and N meningitis and H influenza. So it's common there too. Uh, meningitis, DIC, shock. Waterhouse Fredrickson, okay. Um, Tyramatin, it's normal formation. C5 to C9 inhibited, that's when it happens. Mac, no Mac, sorry, that's what it's no Mac formation. So C5 to C9 is inhibited. It's encapsulated uh, for A, C, D, not B. Okay, so uh, vaccine is for. Type A, C, and D, but not for B, type B. Okay. Uh, LOS, blebs cause major inflammation disease, inflammatory disease. So that's the other thing. LOS. Okay, so that was LPS kind of thing. Uh, the endotoxin, that's what it's talking about. Uh, for N gonorrhea, and gonorrhea is usually co-infected with chlamydia as well. So when you treat one or the other, you always treat the other one as well. Uh, it causes sterility, uh, invades p &Ms, causes PAD, purulent white discharge, urethritis, prostitis, and orchitis. Causes all of these. Uh, PAD is uh, usually the one that they will ask you about. It's because uh, this is a major cause for ectopic pregnancy, right, so, okay, this, uh, fits you, Curtis, uh, these are adhesion bands from liver to peritoneum, I remember, it like, there was a, a bass player, or violin player, or something like that, a string player, whose name was Pete Hugh, Curtis, and that's how I remember, the wires are attached from liver to the peritoneum, uh, mother can give baby conjunctivitis, right? So mothers can give the babies conjunctivitis and thermitin, VPN, chocolate agar. Right, so that was your vancomycin, uh, the pyramethamine and neostatin for the fungus and also Along with pyrimethamine, it was, I think, uh, colistin. And that's how you get the thermart in the car. Uh, there's no MAC formation, and that's when this happens. Uh, facultative intracellular. Okay. It can escape immunity as well, I guess. Uh, this thing is known to cause reactive arthritis. Reactive arthritis is basically just uh, pain in joints uh, in different spots at different time kind of thing. It moves around kind of thing. So migratory arthritis or reactive arthritis is how I remember it. So that's going to be because of this and gonorrhea. If there's a baby newborn and his eyes are red, conjunctivitis, it's going to be because of and gonorrhea. And this can cause blindness in a baby. Okay, so that was your and gonorrhea and meningitis. There's Morxella, but that's not important. Uh, Cocobacilli, that's H influenza. Already talked about that. Bordetella pertussis, Parsherella brucella, Francisella tularinus, and Actinobacter bumani. Bumani, right? So let's look at those. Okay. 
uh, H influenza, that's the epiglottitis one. You will see the toddler or the kid uh, in tripod position. Okay. Uh, it causes uh, inspiratory strider. So remember that, inspiratory strider. Uh, the vaccine yeah, is for, there is no vaccine. Uncapsulated has no typeable is more common cause of non-typeable is more common cause of infection. Otitis media, conjunctivitis, and bronchitis. It does these things. Uh, the uncapsulated one. The capsulated one is B type. Okay. Uh, the B type has vaccine. Uh, we can do that. Uh, conjugated to uh, diphtheria toxoid. Diphtheria toxoid. The virulence factor here is it has IgA protease. Okay. What else had IgA protease? Do you guys remember? It was Giardia. I'm. Um, no, Giardia doesn't have IgA protease, but it gets affected because of it. We just did it. I can't find it now. I'll search it up. All right, so that's your strep pneumonia and meningitis and gonorrhea and H influenza. Okay, those were the ones. Okay. Strep pneumonia is the one I was looking for. Right. So that's the one that causes strep throat. So then you have and meningitis and gonorrhea and so basically strep pneumonia, nizaria and H influenza. I'm sleepy. Can't recall. Okay, so Meningitis is meningitis. Sorry, is not immunized. Uh, you use chocolate agar for H influenza. Uh, pneumonia, sepsis can happen. It has a capsule, and the mechanism for its virulence is polyribosyl riboprotein in capsule. That's what it is. Okay. Martel pertussis. Uh, we already did the mechanism for that. It was. It dip, disables the GI, so it inhibits the inhibitor. So then the adenylcyclase is constantly activated. So it increase in CMP. Uh, three stages. First one is cat cateral, and then that's uh, low fever and chorasia. Then the second stage is paroxysmal cough, and the third stage is convales convalescent uh, recovery. The so vaccine, this is Arab, the vaccine for it is Tdap and DTAP. So Tdap is for anyone more than 11 years. DTAP is from first year to six years, right? Or less than six years for DTAP. And then more than 11 years, you give Tdap. Treatment is Macrolide for this. Uh, there's a tracheal toxin. Uh, whooping cough. So how does it have it? Destroy ciliated epithelial cells. Second, the lymphocytes. Uh, there's lymphocytosis. Lymphocytis. I don't know. Uh, it leads to AB toxin. So adenylate cyclase inhibit uh, all cell signaling and phagocyte activity. Hopefully it's clear when we read about it. Okay, so then the Ella twins, right? The Ella siblings, sorry. Uh, Pasharella, it happens from dog and cat bites. And there is a mouse-like order. And it can cause osteomyelitis. It is catalase positive. 
Okay, so pasture. Important to remember, this is the one from dog and cat bikes. Okay. Uh, then you have Priscilla. Priscilla is the one with the uh, undulating fever. That means it goes up and down, up and down. Uh, it's transmitted from unpasteurized milk and farm animals. Okay. Uh, and vets and ranchers. It's common between vets and ranchers. Uh, bacteria survives in macrophages and reticuloendothelial system. Uh, it gets infected, right? Okay, okay. It's vets and ranchers get infected. That's what it was. Non caseating granulomas, you get that. Undulating, hmm, non caseating. So, gotta add that to the list of, you know, sarcoidosis and all that stuff. Sarcoidosis, uh, Crohn's disease. Perilosis, now Priscilla. Undulating fever, night sweats, and arthralgia. Arabic. So if it's someone who works with animals uh, and is a vet or a rancher and they have uh, undulating fever, they might just give you that word. It's going to be Priscilla. If you have done sketchy, this is the one where if there was a farm, there is a hill behind it. The hill represented the fever and the farm represented farm animals. Uh, you have Francisella tularinus tul or something. Basically, there was a cartoon with a rabbit whose name was Francis. So that's how I remember this one. Because uh, it happens because of uh, from ticks, rabbits, and deer flies. Right, So that's this one. And tularemia, that's important. So you need to know what that is. It's a rare infection, also known as rabbit fever or deerfly. Okay, so this is what it is. Tularemia is caused by bacteria, Francisella tularinus is uh, the disease mainly caused that, okay. So tularinesis is tularemia. Uh, then you have Legionella. Uh, it stains poorly, uh, uses silver stain. Aerosol transmission from water droplets or, I mean water tanks, sorry. So there's going to be an AC or if you're like on a ship and uh, the AC is a closed system. So it could be because of this. Um, there is a question where there's a cruise ship and people are eating raw seafood or something like that and they're uh, bathing in the open ocean and then also the AC is closed system. So then you have to figure out which one of these were. Is it cholera or is it cholera it happens in uh, ocean with uh, animal urine? Or is it uh, leptospira? Is it... Uh, Sorry, leptospira happens in open urine and cholera is from the seafood. And then you have Legionella from the AC. The answer was this, I think, Legionella, because they couldn't stain the organism or bacteria or whatever it was. So it stains poorly, right? So they should have used a silver stain to figure it out. Aerosol transmission from water tanks and AC. Uh, charcoal yeast medium with iron and cysteine as... Legion. Legionnaire's disease common in smokers and chronic lung disease. And it's found in urine. I guess. Treatment is macrolide and quinolones or legionella. Coxiella is the fun one. And they ask a lot about this. Q fever. Coxiella is the reason you have Q fever. Q fever is basically just flu symptoms. Uh, with orbital pain, right? Uh, it happens from aerosols of sheep or cattle amniotic fluid. So it happens in farmers and, you know, ranchers. Or vets who, you know, deliver animals. Uh, obligate intracellular as well. Uh, 
It increases liver enzymes, thrombocytopenia, and pneumonia. Okay, and now we have Bartonella. I remember this from Simpsons. If you watch it, there's Bart, and he likes cats. Uh, he watches the show. I forget what it's called now, but yeah. So this is called Scratchy. That's the name, I think. So cat scratch disease. You get it from cat scratch. Uh, and resembles like Kaposi sarcoma because it's basilary angiomatosis, and it happens in immunocompromised. Uh, you might even get uh, buboes because of this. Uh, it's, or like just lymphadenopathy on the side of the cat scratch. Like if it's scratched on your left arm, you're going to get it in left axilla. Uh, lymph nodes will be enlarged or you can palpate it. Uh, it looks like cavity sarcoma, lymphadenopathy where a cat scratched. Yeah, there you go. So you have to remember that cat scratch, scratch, uh, is caused by a different one. The cat bite is caused by a different one, and then cat contaminated food, like feces food, is like toxoplasmosis. So that's a different one. You have to remember that. Okay. So we're done with that. Uh, then these are the easy ones. The curb rods. They're easy to figure out. It's these. Uh because they're the only ones that are curved, right? Uh, so if it's gram negative and they tell you it's oxidase positive, so it could be these or it could be these, right? I mean, gram negative, sorry, and oxidase positive, so it could be that or this. But then they'll tell you if it's lactose fermenting negative for this, and if that would still be this, but yeah, you gotta figure out if it's this or this. They'll tell you if it's curved rod or bessonet. There you go. That's how you differentiate between this and this. And also Pseudomonas is very popular. Like it's easy to find, figure out it's that. Okay. So Campylo, Campylobacter jejuni, it grows in 42 degrees Celsius. Right. So it causes bloody diarrhea, common in children, uh, gillian bar disease. Uh, it causes Gillian Bard, though. So that's like paralysis of your lower extremity. If you done sketchy, it's the one where they're camping and the person has a mustache that represents the curved rods and he's slapping his knee because that's like a par like reactive arthritis and also Gillian Bard because that's like paralysis. That's what it represented. Okay, uh, it happens because of fecal oral uh, from person to person. Uh, fecal oral transfer from person to person, this thing. Okay, from undercooked meat. This is the most common reason. It happens because of undercooked meat. So that dude was camping, was making, uh, he was cooking meat basically. So, and he wasn't doing a good job at it. Uh, it happens because of poultry and unpasteurized milk too. So, even though that's not what they usually ask, they could, and they could. It's all fair game. Okay, then comes Vibrio cholera. Uh, it grows in alkaline medium, right? So, Vibrio cholera. Uh, it causes rice water, diarrhea. Treatment is ORS. Enterotoxin permanently activates GS, remember? Uh, so that increases CMP. Uh, Entrotoxin is acid labile, and this one is large in. Oh, you need a large inoculum. So a little bit of vibro cholera is not gonna do the symptoms, and you need a lot of vibro cholera. Right now, it grows in alkaline medium. Stool finding is going to be mucus and. Uh, no erythrocytes or leukocytes. It spreads from contaminated waters and shellfish. So shellfish is the one that they had on the cruise ship. Okay. Uh, patient with decreased stomach acidity easily affected because stomach acid is what destroys this. So if they don't have the stomach acid, even a little bit of vibro cholera can infect you. 
And then the last one is H. pylori, uh, the helicopter pylori or helibacter pylori. Uh, it has little stuff on growing on the top. It produces UVAs. Okay. Camp, uh, you go camping in a hot day on a hot day, like forty two degrees Celsius. So that's what that. Uh, that's how I remember that. This one, you know what it is, and H. pylori. It pollinizes antrum of stomach. It's the one that causes ulcers in your stomach anyways. Uh, urease creates alkaline environment for bacteria to do what? To live. Uh, treat, what is this? It causes, okay, it causes gastritis, peptic ulcer, duodenal ulcer, most common. Right. Uh, gastric adenocarcinoma, it can cause this as well, and malt lymphoma. Uh, treatment is triple therapy. It's cat catalase positive, urease positive, and oxidase positive. Yeah. All three of these are oxidase positive anyways. I think that's how you figure out it's this. Okay, so we're done with curved rods. Now we're on to bacilli. Uh, lactose fermentation. Uh, if it's lactose fermenting, it's gonna be one of these, right? Fast or slow. E. coli, Klebsiella, uh, Enterobacter. Or if it's a slow fermenter, it's gonna be Ceratia or Citrobacter. Uh, for E. coli, we already did he E. hack and E. tech. Right. So EHEC was pus, uh, sugar-like, right? Uh, it has O15 by H7 sugar-like toxin. It comes from undercooked meat and leafy vegetables. We did ETEC, uh, that was watery and watery traveler's diarrhea, heat liver, and stable enterotoxin. Um, now there's invasive one, I for invasive. And P is for pedia. So I is for invasive EIEC, invasive dysentery, invades mucosa and causes necrosis and inflammation. EPEC or pediatric is children diarrhea, no toxin, adheres to the apical surface, it flattens villi and decreases absorption. It is indole positive and has beta hemolytic capabilities. Okay. And it's lactose fermenting. Okay. Uh, then we, uh, Klebsiella. This is also a fast one. Intestinal flora, aspiration pneumonia. I did that. What it was. Uh, so along with the other ones, the Phasobacter or Pepto and Prevo. Right. That's what it was. What did you do? Right there. It was Peptostreptococcus, Physobacterium, and Privotella. Uh, Klebsiella is also included in that list of aspiration pneumonia. But at this point, they don't give you these in the, this one, and the option is the other three. One of those they give you in the option. Uh, but it's easy to figure out it's Klebsiella because they'll tell you that there's a dark red currant jelly like sputum. Right. And it actually looks like it too. Let's see if it comes out. So that's what it looks like. Dark red jelly, like put them. Okay, and it's nosocomial UTI from catheters, uh, MDRs, uh, aspiration, lung abscess, liver abscess, common in diabetes, diabetics. Okay, then uh, enterobacter. 
I don't think I have that. Not important. Neither is these. Seratia. Yeah, don't have Seratia either. So it's the one that's, you know, red. Uh, and this, okay. Now lactose fermenting. If it's negative, then you ask, is it oxidase positive or negative? If it's positive, it's pseudomonas. That's the one in sketchy where Mona Lisa is taking a bath and there's like green algae growing on the bath. And she's, I forget what she's doing. Okay, so pseudomonas. That's, uh, it causes pneumonia, sepsis. And this is the important finding, gangrenosum. Uh, it's called ectima gangrenosum. Kind of looks like uh, anthrax uh, ulcer, escher. Uh, it causes UTI, hot tub folliculitis. This is why she was in a bathtub, because it causes hot tub folliculitis. And otitis externa, right? The swimmer year. It causes swimmer year. Uh, the, this also causes uh, osteomyelitis, wound infection in burn victims. Uh, toxin is, uh, the toxin is phospholipase C, exotoxin A, and endotoxin. So it has all of these. So exotoxin A inactivates elongation factor. Okay. Uh, pneumonia is most common uh, due to pseudomonas and cystic fibrosis. Yeah. If there's recurrent infection and all that stuff, it's going to be uh, pseudomonas as well, I think. Or wait, no, there's recurrent infection in uh, cystic fibrosis and cartagners, right? And then you have to differentiate between the two. Uh, but they'll tell you that the culture is blue or green because of pi burden or pi assigning. This catalase positive, and we have Creldia. Okay, I don't think I have that. Oxidase is negative, then you ask, is it, uh, does it uh, grow sulfur or not? Right? Does it produce sulfur or not? So H2 production on TSI agar. If it does, it's going to be salmonella and protease. That's the stagon one, and that's the salmon. <laughs> and uh, if it's negative, that's shigella and Yersinia pettis. Yersinia is the plague. Okay, uh, so let's do those. Salmonella, capsulated osteomyelitis in sickle cell, no spleen. Uh, you can have either S type, uh, type or uh, the salmonella species, right? Uh, salmonella is known for the having rose spot. Uh, I'm not sure what that I wrote there. GI bleed and perforation. Okay, that's how you get it. Abdopain. There's abdopain, a rose spot, maybe GI bleed, perforation. Okay. Uh, it happens in humans only. Constipation. Diarrhea. Both of them. First you get constipation, then you get diarrhea, right? Uh, it's motile with flagella. It has a flagella. Right. And it produces sulfur or H2S. Uh, vaccine is what we call capsule antigen. Then in uh, species, yeah, it happens in humans and animals, poultry and egg and turtles. Diarrhea can be bloody. Here it wasn't bloody. It's only water watery, uh, but this one is bloody and motile with flagella. You have Shigella. Shigella has M cells in pear patches. Uh, phagocytosis M. Pear and Okay. Never mind. M cells in pear patches phagocytizes Shigella. Right. So Shigella uses host actin and uses it to move from cell to cell and escape phagolysosome. It's similar to how Listeria is doing it. 
uh, low inoculum is needed, tenesmus and bloody mucoid stools, spread finger food flies. That's how it spreads. Indo, hectoin, agar, and green colonies on it. So M cells are the one that uh, that this contain like this is contained in M cells and mucosal layer. Okay, and then protease. That's true white stone, staghorn, calculi, and alkaline urine. UTIs, warming motility. This one has warming motility when plated. Uh, chronic. Okay. Uh, Xanthogranulomatous uh, pyelonephritis. Xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. Okay, uh, we'll come across it in Greenal as well. So Proteus is known for that. Okay, and that and that. Done. Now we go into it. Uh, Nizaria gram-negative diplococci metabolizes glucose and produces IgA proteases. It contains lipooligosaccharides (LOS) with strong endotoxin activity. Okay, uh, and gonorrhea is often intracellular within neutrophils. Acid production uh, meningococci is maltose and glucose. Uh, gonococci only makes glucose. Okay, so see how it's in pairs? The cocaine in pairs, so that's how they're going to explain it. They won't say double cocaine. They could, but they might say it's in pairs. Gonococci has no polysaccharide capsules, no maltose acid protection, no vaccine due to antigenic radiation of pilus proteins. Sexually or perinatally transmitted, causes gonorrhea, septic arthritis, neonatal conjunctivitis, two to three days after birth, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, and fuge huge, fuge huge, huge Curtis syndrome. Okay. Uh, it's diagnosed with NAT, condoms decrease sexual transmission, erythromycin eye ointment prevents neonatal blindness, because remember the conjunctivitis, it can lead to blindness. Uh, treatment, single dose, uh, intramuscular ceftriaxone. If chlamydial co-infection not included, excluded by molecular testing, add doxycycline, right? Uh, ceftriaxone and for close contacts or family members, you give rifampin for family, rifampin, right? Uh, and meningococci. Uh, polysaccharide capsules, maltose acid detection. Uh, let me just get that here. So, Nizaria meningitis or meningococci, right? So, maltose positive. So, maltose acid detection, it does cause meningococci, uh, makes uh, maltose and glucose, where gonococci only makes glucose. So, vaccine, we have for type B vaccine available for at risk individuals, transmitted via respiratory and oral secretion, more common among individuals in close quarters. So you'll see it in like college dorm rooms or army barracks. Uh, causes meningococcemia with potential hemorrhages and gangrenes on toes. So that's what you're seeing over here. Meningococcemia with potential hemorrhage. So remember if it's this with gangrene along with gangrene, it's going to be this uh, meningococci. Uh, meningitis, Waterhouse, Fredrickson syndrome, that's acute hemorrhagic adrenal insufficiency. Diagnosed via culture-based test of 
or PCR. Rifampin, ciprofloxacin, or ceftriaxone prophylaxis in close contacts. For close contacts, remember it's rifampin because that's the one they test you on. And it's easy to remember because close contact is family and fan is in rifampin. Uh, treatment is ceftriaxone, similar to this. I am ceftriaxone, this is uh, ceftriaxone, or penicillin G. Uh, age influenza. Uh, this is the one where I was like, okay, you can see the thumb sign. So that's what it's called, the thumb sign over here. And epiglottitis, that's what it is. Uh, small gram negative cocoa bacilli, right? Gram negative cocoa bacilli right here, H influenza. Uh, small gram negative cocoa bacilli rod. Aerosol transmission, non typable uncapsulated strains are the most common cause of mucosal infections, otitis media, conjunctivitis, um, bronchitis, as well as invasive infections since, since the vaccine for capsular type B was introduced. Okay, so since then. Wait, non typable strains are the most common. Okay, never mind. So non-typable ones are the most common ones because the vaccines are for the typable ones. Right. Uh, produces IgA protease. This one again, IgA protease is by strep pneumonia, uh, H influenza, and I always forget the third one. Nizeria. That's what it was. Right. Uh. They didn't write that here. Okay, there it was. Uh, culture on chocolate agar, because we know that now, because children like chocolate, so chocolate agar, that's how it's connected. But it contains uh, factor V, which is NED, and uh, eggs, hematin for growth. Can also be grown with S. aureus, which provides factor V. This is also tested on. Uh, there will be like, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, cultured along with S. Uh, why is that? It's because it provides the factor V as uh, from the RBCs because this will kill the RBC or lyse the RBC and then the RBC will release the factor V. So that's why uh, you can do it with that. <coughs> Sorry. H influenza, or sorry, uh, hemophilus causes epiglottitis. Uh, this is heavily tested on. Endoscopic appearance in A. Uh, can be cherry red in children. Thumb sign is the buzzword on lateral neck x ray. Meningitis, otitis media, and pneumonia. So, MOP happens because of H influenza. And MOPs happens because of strep. Uh, vaccine contains type B. Capsular, uh, capsular polysaccharide, polyribosyl, ribotyl phosphate. Uh, conjugated to diphtheria toxin or other proteins. Given between second and four 18, th 18 months of age, does not cause the flu. Influenza virus does. Yeah, so don't confuse H influenza with the influenza virus. Uh, treatment is amoxicillin with or without clavulunate for mucosal in infection. Ceftriaxone for meningitis. For meningitis, it's usually going to be ceftriaxone. Even here in meningococci, it was ceftriaxone. And rifampin. Family puts the fam in rifampin. Uh, prophylaxis for close contact. Uh, Bucaroldia cepacia complex. Aerobic catalase positive, gram negative rods. Rod. Uh, Bucaroldia cepacia was right there. So it's aerobic catalase positive, uh, gram negative rod. Okay. 
So these are the best lives. So they'll tell you this was curved rods or this is best life for oxidase positive. Uh, causes pneumonia in and can be transmitted between patients with cystic fibrosis. Often multidrug resistant. Infection is in uh, is a relative contraindication to undergoing lung transplant due to association with poor outcomes. So they'll say a patient was prepared for surgery, but then uh, his blood culture grew some bacteria and they had to cancel the surgery or the lung transplant or whatever. Uh, what could it be? What could be the culprit bacteria, right? So it's going to be this one, Bucurel sebacea. I think that's what they ask. They don't ask about the cystic fibrosis was transmitted between patients. But I remember that too. Uh, Bordetella pertussis, the whooping cough one, uh, gram negative, right? Bordetella pertussis is gram negative, aerobic, cocobacilli. Virulence factor include, so how I remember them is these are cockeyes and the pink ones are the rods. And then you have curved rods and then you have cocobacilli. So anything below that is... I just memorized this chart, so that's how I recall it. Um, Bordetella, gram negative, Arabic, cocobacilli. Virulence factor include pertussis toxin, disables GI, uh, it inhibits the inhibitor. So adenylate cyclase toxin is constantly activated and constantly makes CMP, so there's increase in CMP and tracheal cytotoxin. Uh, three clinical stages, there's cateterol, that's low grade fever and coryza. There's peroxymal, that's peroxisomes of intense cough followed by inspiratory uh, whoop or whooping cough, post to uh, vomiting. Also, this thing causes inspiratory strider. So remember that, H influenza. There's uh, after coughing, they feel like vomiting. So post to vomiting. And then there is convalescent uh, stage that's gradual recovery of chronic cough. This also causes 100 day cough in uh, adults. Produces lymphocytosis, unlike most acute bacterial infections. Treatment is macrolides. If allergic, use TMP and SMX. Okay. Remember macrolide, I guess. Uh, Priscilla is gram negative, uh, aerobic cocobacillus. Uh, remember this is the farm animal one and the undulating fever. Uh, transmitted via ingestion of contaminated animal products, for example, unpasteurized milk, survives in macrophages in the reticuloendothelial system, can form non caseating granulomas, it can form that. Uh, typically present with undulant fever, night sweats, and arthralgia. Okay, if they have fever and night sweats, it's going to be brucella. Uh, treatment again, if it's animal, it's always going to be doxycycline uh, ref plus rifampin or streptomycin. Uh, Legionella. Uh, pneumophilia. This is gram negative rod. So Legionella is vertigo. It's going to be in here, I guess. It's gram negative weight. It's a rod, so it should be here. Either I'm sleepy or I can't find it or it's not given, right? But okay. Uh, Legionella, this is the one that causes, uh, no, this is not the one. Okay, so this one is uh, gram negative rod, gram stain poorly, stains poorly, so you use silver stain. Grow on charcoal yeast extract, medium with uh, iron and cysteine. 
detected by presence of antigen urine. The lab may show hyponatremia, aerosol transmission from environmental water source habitat, so air conditioning systems or hot water tanks, outbreaks associated with cruise ships and nursing homes, no person-to-person -person transmission, treatment is macrolide or quinolone. Uh, think of French legionnaire, often a soldier with silver helmet sitting around a campfire of charcoal with his iron dagger. He is missing his sister, Sistine. Legionnaire's disease. Okay, yeah. So I was thinking walking pneumonia, but it's actually Legionnaire's disease. Walking pneumonia is by mycoplasma pneumonia. Legionnaire's disease, severe pneumonia, often unilateral and low bar. It's going to be unilateral and low bar. It's going to be contained within uh, the side of the lung and even within the lung. Okay. Uh, fever, GI, and CNS symptoms. Risk factors include older age, tobacco smoking, and chronic lung disease. Pontiac fever, mild flu-like symptoms. I forget how, but they do test you on Pontiac fever. So look out for that. So they'll give you like all of these uh, bacteria, and then they'll be like, uh, he has a fever at like 99.2 or something, right? So that's mild flu-like fever. And they're giving a, what do you say? Symptomatic relief uh, or treatment, but it's not getting better. It could be because of this. Pseudomonas, arginosa, uh, aerobic, right. motile, catalase positive, uh, gram negative rod, non lactose fermenting, oxidase positive, frequently. So these are the rods, non lactose fermenting, again, and it's oxidase positive, frequently found in water, has a grape like odor. Right, so Mona Lisa was eating grapes in the bathtub. That's what it was. So Pseudomonas is associated with pneumonia, sepsis, uh, ectima granulosum. Uh, that's what it looks like. Right, so that's why you confuse it with anthrax in the question stuff. So ectima granulosum. See what that looks like. Okay. It's not going to be this obvious. It's probably going to be something like that. Like that. It's going to be on the trunk, though. I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, UTIs, diabetes, osteomyelitis, mucoid polysaccharide capsule, otitis externa, the swimmer you, and nosocomial healthcare associated infections for example catheters equipment addiction injection drug use and skin infections uh, hot tub folliculitis this is the most common one uh, of the cause for pseudomonas wound infection and burn victim mucoid polysaccharide capsules may contribute to chronic pneumonia in patients with cystic fibrosis due to biofilm formation Produces PEEP, uh, phospholipase C, degrades cell membranes. Endotoxin fever shock, exotoxin A, causes inactivates uh, in uh, sorry it inactivates an elongation factor two, right? So phospholipase C does what? Degrades cell membrane. Exo endotoxin does what? It does fever and shock. That's the LPS one. Exotoxin A inactivates elongation factor 2. Okay, so the pigments, pyroverdin and pyrocyanin, uh, causes blue-green pigment. It also generates ROS, reactive oxygen species. Uh, this is also the reason why you would wash your contact lens with a special liquid and not just any water. 
is to prevent corneal ulcers and keratitis and contact lens wearers. Uh, minor eye trauma. Ectima granul gangrenosum. Uh, rapidly progressive and necrotic cutaneous lesion. Listen. Caused by pseudomonas bacteremia. Typically seen in, seen in immunocompromised patients. Treatment is anti pseudomonal penicillin in combination with beta lactamase inhibitor. Uh, for example, pepericillin or tezobactam. Remember that. <coughs> right, so just imagine Mona Lisa smoking while she's in the hot tub eating grapes. Uh, and the bathtub has like algae growing on it, which is green and blue. Uh, third and fourth generation cephalosporin, for example, ceftazidine and cefepime, uh, monobactams, fluoroquinolones, and carbapenems. Okay. Uh, salmonella versus shigella. So that's this versus this. This one grows H2S and it grows on uh, TSI agar. This one doesn't produce T uh, H2S on TSI agar, Shigella, right? Let's do Yersinia first, because it's right there. Uh, Gram negative pleomorphic rod cocobacilli with bipolar staining. Uh, usually transmitted from pet feces, like cats or dogs and contaminated milk or pork. It can cause bloody uh, diarrhea, pseudo appendicitis, bright lower abdominal pain due to mesenteric adenitis and or terminal ileitis, reactive arthritis in adults. They actually don't test you on enterocolitica, they test you on pedis. They don't have pedis. Okay, the pedis is the one with the plague. Okay, so salmonella versus shigella. Both salmonella and shigella are gram-negative rods, non-lactose fermenters, oxidase-negative, and can invade the GI tract via M cells of pear patches. Pear patches is just basically uh, lymphoid tissue in the intestine. It's near the ileum, I think. Uh, okay, so salmonella typhi, uh, salmonella species, except S. typhi and shigella. The reservoir are humans only for salmonella and shigella by itself, but salmonella species is humans and animals. Okay, so the middle one is the different one. The spread is uh, hematogenous spread, so it spreads through blood, uh, salmonella, both of them. Whereas shigella, it goes from cell to cell, so there's no hematogenous spread. Right? Uh, H2S production. Salmonella does it. We already know from the diagram. Shigella doesn't. Uh, flagella. Er, um, salmonella, it's a fish, right? Salmon is a fish. So it has a flagella, so it swims. So yes, for salmonella, but no for shigella. Uh, virulence factor. Endotoxin. V capsule. Pronounced Thai V. Uh, endotoxin, endotoxin, sugar toxin as well, enterotoxin, okay. So all of them do endotoxin. Uh, sugar toxin is an enterotoxin as well, okay. So infectious dose, you need high dose of uh, salmonella typhi, large inoculum, required acid labile, uh, inactivated by gastric acid. So it's gonna happen when they have a contaminated food or something that has salmonella uh, while they're on PPIs or something, right? Because you need a lot of it to be infected by this. So they'll tell you that. Uh, same thing for salmonella species and shigella, you need a very low amount. So low, very small enough film required. It's acid stable, so it's resistant to gastric acid. So you don't need too much. Uh, to get infected. Uh, effect of antibiotics on fecal excretion. 
it prolongs the duration and uh, for salmonella it shortens the duration so shortens shigella so the lifetime of shigella is shortened by antibiotics but not for salmonella salmonella doesn't get affected by antibiotics immune response it's primarily monocyte and neutrophils for the species pmns in disseminated disease primarily pmn in infiltration for shigella as well gi manifestations uh this is where it's going to differ uh for salmonella typhi it's constipation followed by diarrhea uh, they will give you either of these so that or diarrhea possibly bloody it would be salmonella species uh, and if they give you crampy abdominal pain tenesmus uh, bloody mucoid stools like bacillary dysentery is going to be shigella so they'll give you either of this or they'll give you these unique properties right uh, okay so vaccine uh, uh, is orient oral vaccine contains live attenuated as typhi intramuscular vaccine contains vi capsular polysaccharide uh, salmonella species except as typhi so that's no vaccine for that and no vaccine for it. Uh, oral vaccine contains live attenuated as typhi intramuscular vaccine contains v capsular polysaccharide right there is no vaccine for shigella or salmonella species uh, unique properties uh, if you guys know about typhoid mary she was the one that they discovered so between 19 uh, 1869 to 1938 there was this lady who was like a help house help uh she was a cook not house help uh cook okay so she was cooking for people uh houses and houses she would and what would happen is the family she would cook for they would turn out they would like end up dead or something like that or they would become ill so then this happened like two three times in one place then she moved away and she traveled like all over the bureau or something and everywhere she went uh people would start getting sick whoever she cooked for and that's how they figured out that there's something like it took them a long time to figure out that it's a woman or it's a cook and then they arrested her and investigated and then they couldn't find anything then they decided to do like a invasive procedure to figure out what it was or something and then they found that she had typhoid she was a carrier and she had typhoid in her like gallbladder or something so she was spreading around salmonella wherever she would go okay so that's the story of typhoid mary and the worst way told as possible uh, it causes typhoid fever, uh, rose spot on abdomen, constipation, abdominal pain, fever, pulse temperature dissociation, later uh, GI ulceration on and hemorrhage. Treat with ceftriaxone or fluoroquinolone. Uh, carry a state with gallbladder colonization. Poultry, eggs, Pets and turtle are common source antibiotics not indicated and gastroenteritis is usually caused by non typhoidal salmonella for this okay so if you have a rose spot is salmonella typhi and if it's from one of these it's gonna be uh, salmonella species if you have bloody diarrhea, it's not going to be salmonella. But if you have constipation and then diarrhea, it's probably going to be this. But this is basically the buzzword. There's a rash on abdomen. And they had like some kind of infected food or something. Uh, this is uh, from poultry, eggs, pets, and turtles are common sources. Uh, 
Antibiotics are not indicated. Gastroenteritis is usually caused by non-typhoidal salmonella. For Shigella, it's going to be for Shigella, it's going to be four Fs: fingers, flies, food, and feces. In order of decreasing severity, less toxin produced. S dysentery, S flexionary, and S boidy and S. Sony. Invasion of M cells is key to pathogenicity. Organisms that produce little toxin can cause disease. Right. Uh, it's quite easy to differentiate between these two. What's hard is when it's about just Shigella and E. coli uh, with the Shigella toxin. Right. So he heck and Shigella is hard to differentiate in the question stem. Uh, lactose fermenting enteric bacteria, fermentation of lactose, pink colonies on McConkey agar. Expl examples include Citrobacter E. coli, Enterobacter Klebsiella cerecia, McConkey cheeks milk. Okay, so all the lactose fermenting bacteria, you culture them on EBM agar. Lactose fermenters grow as purple and black colonies. E. coli grows colonies with a green sheen. Okay. But, but, uh, it's going to be pink. That's the one they're going to talk about in McConkey Agar. But you can do it on EBM, EMB Agar, so just remember that. E. coli. Um, before we get into this, let's look at this. This is from your world. Uh, e. coli virulence factor, virulence factor, mechanism, and presentation. Uh, the lipopolysaccharide. It causes um, bacteremia and septic shock, right? So how does it do that? It activates macrophages, widespread release of IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. That's how we already know about that one. Uh, K1 capsular polysaccharide. It causes neonatal meningitis. It How? So the mechanism, it prevents phagocytosis and complement mediated lysis. So that's K1 capsular polysaccharide. Then it also has shigotoxin, which causes gastroenteritis or bloody, which is bloody, right? Uh, it inactivates 60S ribosomal subunit, halting protein synthesis and causing cell death. We did that already. Uh, then it has heat stable, heat liberal uh, enterotoxin. These cause watery gastroenteritis. Uh, the mechanism is promotes fluid and electrolyte selection from intestinal epithelium. Promotes fluid and electrolyte secretion, sorry, from uh, intestinal epithelium. And it has P femur, uh, which causes urinary tract infection and allows adhesion to Euro epithelium. So this is the one causing UTI, P fimbria. P fimbria hurts you when you pee. Find that. Okay. Back to this. So now we know about LPS, septic shock, and key capsule, uh, which causes neonatal meningitis, right? And what fimbria does. So all of these are the, again, okay. factor, fimbria. It causes cystitis and pyelonephritis uh, because of P-pili. Uh, K-capsule, it causes uh, pneumonia and neonatal meningitis. LPS, amylotoxin, causes septic shock. And lipopolysaccharide causes the bacteria and septic shock. You have invasive or EIEC or enteroinvasive 
uh, E. coli, it's in the name. Toxin and mechanism. Uh, microbe invades intestinal mucosa and causes necrosis and inflammation. Presentation is EIEC, is invasive, dysentery. Clinical manifestation similar to Shigella. Uh, so it's going to seem like it's this. That's why I said it's harder to differentiate between this and that one. Uh, and then there's ETEC. ETEC is known for uh, traveler's diarrhea. When you travel, you want your tech with you. So maybe you remember it that way. It produces heat labile and heat stable enterotoxins. Uh, no inflammation or invasion. ETEC is traveler's diarrhea, T4 traveler's diarrhea, and T4 toxic. Uh, then you have. EPEC or enteropathogenic E. coli. P is for pediatrics. So mechanism is no toxins produced, but it adheres to a pical surface and it flattens villi or villi and it prevents absorption. So you have diarrhea, uh, usually in children. Think EPEC and pediatrics. Then you have EHEC, uh, which causes house or hus, right? Enterohemorrhagic E. coli, O157 by A7 is the most common serotype in U.S., often transmitted by undercooked meat and raw leafy vegetable. Shigatoxin causes hus, a uh, triad of ammonia, uh, sorry, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and acute kidney injury. Okay, so again, triad of anemia, thrombocytopenia, and acute kidney injury due to microthrombi forming on damaged endothelium. Mechanical hemolysis uh, with cystocytes on peripheral blood smear, platelet consumption, and decreased renal blood flow. Okay, so if you have HUS, it could be because of EHEC or SHIGA. Uh, you'll have dysentery. Toxin alone causes necrosis and inflammation. It does not ferment sorbitol, uh, whereas the other ones do. Uh, EHEC associated with hemorrhage, hamburgers, hemolytic uracemic uh, syndrome. Okay, so what do you have? Uh, Klebsiella, gram negative rod, intestinal microbiota that causes lower pneumonia more common in patients with heavy alcohol use or with impaired host defenses. Very mucoid colonies uh, okay. caused by abundant polysaccharide capsules. Dark red currant jelly sputum, that's the buzzword, uh, also, causes, also cause of healthcare associated UTIs associated with evaluate, evolution of multi-drug resistance. So A, B, C, D, E is of Klebsiella is aspiration pneumonia, uh, abscess and lungs and liver, current jelly spoon, uh, diabetes mellitus and ethanol overuse. So that's just drinking alcohol. Okay. So if you have aspiration pneumonia and don't have an abscess, uh, think of the other three. But if you have abscess, think of Klebsiella first uh, for aspiration pneumonia. Okay. Uh, Campylobacter jejuni, it's a gram-negative comma or S-shaped with polar flagella. Oxidase positive, uh, it grows at 42 degrees Celsius. Uh, Campylobacter likes the hot campfire. Major cause of bloody diarrhea, especially in children, fecal oral transmission through person-to-person -person contact or via ingestion of undercooked contaminated poultry or meat. Right. Unpasteurized milk as well. Contact with infected animals like dogs, cats, or pigs is also a risk factor. So they'll say that they had a new pet, right? 
and uh, they became infected uh, with something and they have symptoms. So, and, uh, okay, so the presentation is going to be that he was infected and it's going to be something very vague, but they're not going to give you undercooked meat or poultry or unpasteurized milk. They just say uh, this person had a new pet and then he went cruising and he did all, all this stuff. Uh, what is the culprit for the symptom, right? So you have to remember that infected animals like pets or farm animals are also a risk factor and that's how you get to Campylo vector. Because this one is easy to figure out, right? But they don't ask you that, it's this one. Uh, contact with infected animal. Common antecedent to gillian Barr syndrome, Barre syndrome, and reactive arthritis. Okay, so these two things are what it can cause. And they might show you this in the clinical picture. But yeah, remember, infected animals is also a risk factor. Uh, Vibrio cholera. Gram negative flagellated uh, coma shaped oxidase positive grows in alkaline media endemic to developing countries, produces profuse rice water diarrhea via enterotoxin that permanently activates GS. Okay, uh, so if it ac permanently activates GS, it's gonna activate ethanolate like cyclase. Those cyclase will cause increase in CMP. We already saw that. I'll do that again. Right, so GS analyzed cyclase uh, causes conversion of ATP to CMP, which will leak out the water or chlorine or chloride. Right now, it's sensitive to stomach acid, acid labial requires large inoculum, high ID 50, unless host has decreased gastric acidity. So, if he's on like PPI, so. Okay. Transmitted via ingestion of contaminated water or undercooked food, especially raw fish. Uh, treat promptly with oral rehydration solution. Right, if they say uh, the diarrhea has a rice water consistency, it's going to be this. But if they give you raw shellfish along with like the person ate that and he went cruising in the water and he uh, was swimming in the water. Uh, so you would think like leptospira or then also cruise ship have uh, closed ventilation, right? So it could be Legionella. So you have to figure out which one it is between the three. But then you understand what the symptoms are. It's not going to be rice water diarrhea. That's not the answer. It's not going to be that. Uh, and uh, if it was this, uh, many other people would also have it, but they don't because food poisoning is usually indicated by multiple people being infected. Right. Uh, this one they do test you on now. So Vibrio vulnificus or gram-negative bacillus, usually found in marine environment. Causes severe wound infection or septicemia due to exposure to contaminated seawater. So there's like a say a cut on the leg or something and then they went into the water. Uh, they're going to get cellulitis. So it presents as cellulitis that can pro progress to necrotizing fasciitis in high risk patients. Especially those with liver disease, for example, cirrhosis or hemochromatosis. Serious wound infections requires uh, surgical debridement. So it's going to be like this person had a cut on the leg and then he went swimming and now the cut is becoming black. Uh, H. pylori, curved flagellated, a motile gram negative rod that is triple uh, positive. So catalyst positive, oxygen positive, and urease positive. Can use your breath test or fecal antigen test for diagnosis. Uh, urease produces ammonia, 
creating an alkaline environment which helps H. pylori survive in acidic mucosa, colonizes mainly antrum of the stomach, causes gastritis and peptic ulcers, especially duodenal, risk factor for peptic ulcer disease, gastric adenocarcinoma, and mouth lymphoma. Most common in, in it, most common initial treatment is triple therapy, amoxicillin, metronidazole. If penicillin allergy, then you give uh, metronidazole. Uh, so triple therapy is amoxicillin, um, clarithromycin, and proton pump inhibitor. Right. Now, antibiotic cure. Uh, you give this because... Why do you give this? It's because uh, this thing keeps making it alkaline and the body thinks that we don't have enough acid uh, producing production. So then it keeps making more and more acid, which then eventually also causes ulcer in the duodenum and stuff, right? So that's why you give proton pump inhibitor to stop the acid production. Uh, so... Again, triple therapy is amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and proton pump inhibitor. Antibiotics cure pylori. So ACP, amoxicillin, clarithromycin, proton pump inhibitor. Bismuth-based quadruple therapy if concerned about macrolide resistance. So <coughs> if clarithromycin uh, is not working for you, you're going to switch it out with. Or you're going to add this to it, not switch, but this much based quadruple therapy. Uh, I think this one also helps with the, if there is an ulcer, it helps uh, prevent the pain, I guess. Uh, spirochetes. I like that. So these are your leptospira and stuff. So, and trepanoma and borrelia, right? So that's your syphilis, that's your limes, and leptospira is the one where that's the end of what you're in. Now, spiral-shaped bacteria with XL filaments include leptospira, trepanoma, and borrelia. Only borrelia can be visualized using alanine dye, right, or gem sustain in light microscopy due to size. Trepanoma is visualized by dark field microscopy or direct fluorescent antibody microscopy. Okay, this is important. Trepanoma is not visualized normally, but it is visualized by dark field uh, microscopy or direct fluorescent antibody microscopy. Right? Um, Borrelia can be uh, visualized using aniline dye. That is important. Uh, right or gem sustain in light microscopy due to size. Okay. Uh, Lyme's disease caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. Actually, let's look at my notes for this if I have anything. So, Borrelia burgdorferi. Furry, uh, spirochetes, Lyme disease, uh, erythema marginatum, marginins, or migraines, sorry, erythema migraines, uh, treatment doxycycline and septriazone, uh, gem sustain, form ticks in Northeast Asia, uh, USA, not Asia, so Northeast Asia, so that's like uh, New York and yeah, so they tell you that you you went uh, hiking in New York and they started having uh, flu-like symptoms or myocarditis and neurologic deficits and facial nerve blocks. Uh, you got to differentiate with the base here as well, or it could be like a co-infection. So, okay, so caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, Berry, which is transmitted by the exodus deer tick, also vector for anaplasma species, just a side note, and protozoa papacea, so it's for that as well. Uh, natural reservoir is in the mouse, uh, 
deer are essential to tick life cycle, but do not harbor Borrelia, common in northeastern United States. So there are three stages. Stage one is easily localized, erythema migrants, uh, typically bullseye configuration, like this one. Is pathognomic, but not always present. It's flu-like symptoms, right? Uh, step two, easily disseminated secondary lesions, carditis, AV block, facial nerve bells, palsy, migratory malgias, and transient arthritis. If you guys watch uh, The Housewives, I think uh, uh, Bella or Gigi Hadid's uh, mother, she suffered from this or she claims she suffered from facial, uh, from Lyme's disease. So that's how I remember it. <laughs> uh, step three is late, late disseminated encephalopathy, chronic arthritis, and peripheral neuropathy. Okay, so you have, you have a key lime pie to the face, face for facial nerve palsy, arthritis, cardiac block, and erythema migrans. Uh, treatment is doxycycline, first line amoxicillin, uh, pregnant patients, children less than eight years old. Okay, so doxycycline is the first line, but you can give amoxicillin in pregnant patients and uh, for children under eight year old. Okay, because uh, doxycycline again, anything related to animals and stuff, it's going to be this. And this is septrigon is. IV therapy required. Uh, leptospira interrogans, uh, spirochetes with hook shaped ends found in water contaminated with animal urine. Leptospirosis is flu like symptoms, myalgias, classic, uh, classically of calves. Okay, so imagine a surfer in the ocean, uh, and the ocean is full of animal urine. And since they're surfing, their calves hurt. Uh, jaundice, photophobia with conjunctival suffusion, erythema without exudate. Uh, prevalent among surfer and in tropics, for example, Hawaii. Then you have the whale disease, that's ecterohemorrhagic leptospirosis, severe form with jaundice and azotemia from liver and kidney dysfunction, fever, hemorrhage, and anemia. Okay. Uh, syphilis, this is your caused by spirochetes, uh, trepanoma pallidum. Treatment is penicillin G. Primary syphilis, uh, and secondary and tertiary, and congenital syphilis. It's important to figure out, uh, learn how to figure out which uh, syphilis type it is. Uh, and it's very distinct and it's fairly easy to figure out because of it. So, primary syphilis is going to be localized disease presenting with painless canker, right? Uh, so, use fluorescent or a dark field microscopy to visualize treponemy, treponemies and fluid from canker. So, that's what it's going to look like. Uh, VDRL is going to be positive in approximately 80%. Uh, secondary syphilis. So here you had painless canker. Don't hurt. Okay. And it's going to be like a single one usually. And secondary disseminated disease with constitutional symptoms, maculopapular rash. That's like that. Uh, including palms and so this is a uh, buzzword if there's a macupapular rash or any kind of rash on palms and so it only happens in two or three things so this is one of them and then if you have condylomatolata that's this uh, you know it's uh, secondary smooth painless wart like white lesions on genitals that's what it is lymphadenopathy patchy hair loss also confirmable with dark field microscopy. 
uh, serologic testing, VDRL or RPR, nonspecific common, confirmed diagnosis with specific tests. For example, FDA, ABS, right? Because this is nonspecific. Again, it's because it uses cardiolipin. Uh, secondary syphilis is equal to systemic. Uh, latent syphilis, uh, positive serology without symptoms may follow. So after secondary, you get latent syphilis. So they test, test positive, but they don't have any symptoms. They won't have a canker or the condylomatolata. Uh, tertiary syphilis has gummas, right? So that's gummas. Uh, chronic granulomas are aortitis, aortitis, uh, vesa vesorum destruction, right? Vesa vesorum is just the vessel for the great vessels, so around the aorta or something like that. The so the blood supply for the muscle and the aorta. Uh, neurosyphilis, so that's tibis dorsalis or general paresis. Argyll Robertson pupil. So if you are starting to have neuro symptoms, it's your, you're in the third stage now. So that's tertiary syphilis, right? First it started with a painless canker. Then you had like the rash on your palms and sole. You had condylomatic or like wart like lesions on your genitals genitals but and lymphadenopathy but now if you're getting cns symptoms like neurosyphilis and general argyle robertson pupils constricts with accommodation but it's not reactive to light you're at tertiary syphilis so that's how you differentiate between the three uh also these are painless as well they're not painful. It's just that it's now what like it's not a canker anymore. So if you don't know what they look like between the two, just check it out. Uh, constricts with accommodation, but is not reactive to light. Signs are broad-based ataxia, so positive Romberg. That's just a fancy way of saying that they have uh, neurologic symptoms now. Uh, Charcot joint, uh, stroke without hypertension. Uh, for neurosyphilis, test spinal fluid with VDRL, FDA, ABS, and PCR. All right, so VDRL is like what you would do, but it's not specific. So the next best thing you do, you can do is FDA, ABS. Uh, congenital syphilis. So congenital syphilis, uh, I think this is the one where uh, a baby can be born with like necrosis on the umbilical tube, right? I think that's what this was, but okay. So congenital syphilis presents with facial abnormalities such as regidis, uh, linear scars at angle of mouth, black arrow in F. Okay. Uh, they have sniffles, snuffles, uh, that's nasal discharge, red arrow and F. Uh, Settle nose, notched Hutchinson teeth, and G. Uh, mulberry molars and short maxilla, saber, saber shins and cranial nerve eight deafness. So that's your vestibule cochlear nerve deafness. Okay, they'll give you uh some of these they might give you snuffles they might give you this notch teeth they'll say uh the teeth have a single dentation in the middle or something like that uh, mulberry molars i don't think they'll give you that short maxilla they might give you that and saber shins okay this is hard to detect in a newborn was already crying uh, snuffles and yeah so to prevent uh, treat the patient early in pregnancy as placenta transmission typically occurs after first trimester so get it treated in first trimester so 
it doesn't look right. Okay, let me see how much time you have. Uh, diagnosis syphilis. Uh, VDRL and RPR detects non-specific antibodies that reacts with beef cardiolipin. Uh, quantitative, in expensive, and widely available test for syphilis. Sensitive but not specific. Non-trepanomal tests, VDRL, RPR, revert to negative after treatment. Uh, direct trepanomal test results will remain positive. Right, so what I've been saying, uh, quantitative, inexpensive, and widely available test for syphilis, right? It's sensitive, but not specific. So these are called non-trepanomal tests. So that's your VDRL and RPR. Revert to negative after treatment. But direct trepanomal tests will remain positive even after treatment. Okay, so This is what I was saying, uh, false positive results on VDRL, but okay. So that's the one that you confuse it with, lupus. So someone is being tested for lupus, but then the test is coming positive, but they don't have lupus when they're doing uh, lupus specific tests. It's because uh, they had uh, trepanomal infection previously. That's why. Right. What else can it do? It's VDRL, so positive is for pregnancy, viral infection, EBV or hepatitis, drugs uh, are chlorpromazine and promkenamide, rheumatic fever, and lupus, cardiolipin antibody, and uh, leprosy. So serologic tests, non-trepanomal or non-specific are RPR and VDRL. Uh, specific are FTA, ABS, and TPPA. Uh, direct testing is dark field microscopy or PCR. Uh, Eric's uh, Herish or Jerish Herxheimer reaction. Flu like symptoms, uh, fever, chills, headache, and myalgia after antibiotics are started. This is due to the host response to sudden release of bacterial antigens, right? Uh, so after you give antibiotics, it's gonna affect the bacteria and then they're gonna die off. And when they die off, they're gonna, you know, let go of a couple things into the body and so our system. So our system then reacts to it. That's what this is. You get fever, chills, headache, and myalgia. It's usually, it usually occurs during treatment of spiroketal infections like syphilis or Lyme disease. So only these. So don't think about this in any other uh, context. Um, chlamydia. Chlamydia cannot make their own ATP. They are obligate intracellular organisms that cause mucosal infections. There are two forms, elementary body, uh, small, dense, is infectious and enters cell via endocytosis transforms into reticulate body. Reticulate body replicates in cell by fusion reorganizes into elementary bodies. Chlamydia trichomatis causes neonatal and follicular adult conjunctivitis or A, non-gonococcal urethritis, uh, PID, and reactive arthritis. Okay, so chlamydia is known for neonatal and follicular adult conjunctivitis, non-gonococcal urethritis, PID, and reactive arthritis. They're usually gonna test you on PID and reactive arthritis though. Uh, it'll be like this person has ectopy uh, pregnancy. She just got operated for it. So what would her history contain? It would contain a uh, infection of chlamydia or gonorrhea. Are uh, yeah, chlamydiophilia, pneumonia, pneumonia, and uh, chlamydophilia sitaki uh, causes atypical pneumonia. Sitaki is uh, reservoir, like it resides in parrots, so that uh, transmitted by aerosol. 
chlamydial cell wall lacks classic peptidoglycans due to reduced muramic acid, rendering beta-lactam antibiotics ineffective. Uh, Chlamys cloak intracellular c uh, has a has an avian reservoir, so parrots, causes atypical pneumonia. Lab diagnosis is PCR and NAT. NAT is what you use. Uh, cytoplasmic inclusion reticulate bodies seen on GEMSA or fluorescent antibodies stained smear. Treatment is azithromycin, favored because one time treatment or doxycycline. Right. So this is one time, or you can give doxycycline. Add ceftriaxone for possible co concomitant uh, gonorrhea. So again, if it's gonorrhea, you're going to treat for chlamydia as well. So you're going to give uh, azithro or doxy. And if you have chlamydia, you're going to treat for gonorrhea by giving ceftriaxone as well. Sometimes uh, they have the UTI again, even after it's treated, it's because they didn't treat the other one when they were treating this one. Okay, chlamydia trichomatis serotypes, there's type A, B, and C. Uh, these cause chronic infection causes um, blindness due to follicular conjunctivitis in resource limited areas. So A is for Africa, B is for blindness, C is for chronic infection. Okay. Uh, type D and K, sorry, type D and K, uh, urethritis, uh, with or without, uh, with the, and or, sorry, uh, PID, ectopic pregnancy, neonatal pneumonia, staccato cough, with, what is that? Performed with each node sharply detached and separated from the other. Okay. So, staccato call. With eosinophilia, neonatal conjunctivitis, uh, one to two weeks after birth. So, D2K, everything else, other than ABC. Neonatal disease can be acquired during vaginal birth if pregnant patient is infected. Then there is type L1, L2, and L3. L is for lymphogranuloma venereum. It's a small painless ulcer on genital, genitals, uh, and it leads to swollen, painful inguinal lymph nodes that ulcerate, so buboes. So chlamydia causes buboes. Treat with doxycycline. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, Gardenella vaginalis, a pleomorphic gram variable rod involved in bacterial vaginosis, uh, presents as a gray vaginal discharge with a fish smell, non painful versus vaginitis, associated with sexual activity but not sexually transmitted. Bacterial vaginosis is also characterized by overgrowth of certain aerobic bacteria in vagina due to decrease in lactobacilli. Clue cells are the buzzwords. They'll give you that for this. Vaginal epithelial cells covered with gardenella uh, have stipled appearance along outer margins. They might just give you the word uh, or they could show it to you. It's just cells uh, covered with garden kind of looking stuff. Uh, you do amine whiff test, mixing discharge with 10% of KOH enhances fishy odor. Vaginal pH more than 4.5 during infection. Treatment is uh, metronidazole or clindamycin. Right. Uh, then you have, and I think that's the end of that. Oh, no, this is, okay. So zoonotic bacteria, zoonosis, uh, infections 
disease and transmitted infectious disease transmitted between animals and humans okay so species and then we're going to do disease and then transmission and source these are like the buzzwords basically so for anaplasma species uh, the disease is anaplasmosis if they give you that it's exodus uh, ticks or a deer was involved or something it's going to be this uh, for anaplasma species um, okay yeah they don't really ask this one for that uh they ask about babesia but okay. Um, Bartonella, we know that's the cat scratch disease. Um, bacillary angiomatosis, it can cause that. That's just uh, also lymphadenopathy on the side of the closest lymph node site near the cat scratch. Um, Borrelia burgdorferi, Lyme disease, exodus ticks. It lives on deer and mice. And then there's Borrelia recon current dice recurrent tis uh and or recurrent ties relapsing fever uh laos recurrent due to variable surface antigens uh, and then you have brucella with the undulant fever that's the buzzword um brucellosis uh, and unpasteurized dairy transmission is or animals, you know. Uh, Campylobacter, it causes uh, bloody diarrhea, comes from uh, feces from infected pets or animals or contaminated meat, foods and hands. Chlamydia or chlamydia cetaki or cetacosis, uh, transmission or in vectors, parrots and or other drugs. Uh, Coxiella brinetti, uh, that's Q fever, aerosol of cattle or sheep, amniotic fluid, er Ehrlichia, uh, shockiness or ehrlichosis, emboloma, lone star tick, and Francella tularinensis uh, causes tularemia, that's from ticks, rabbits, and deer flies. Leptospira, that's animal urine, leptospirosis, animal urine, water, recreational water use. Mycobacterium leprae or leprosy, humans with lepromatous leprosy or armadillo, which is rare. Uh, Parcherella, that's the animal bite one. Uh, <laughs> causes <coughs> cellulitis, osteomyelitis, uh, animal bite, cats and dogs. Uh, Rickettsia provazaki, uh, endemic typhus, human to human versus human body laos. Uh, then you have rickettsia rickettsi, that's Rocky Mountain spotted fever uh, from dermacenter or dog tick. Then you have rickettsia typhi, that's endemic typhus as well. Uh, it happens from ticks, uh, sorry, fleas. And then you have salmonella species, that causes diarrhea, which may be bloody. Uh, vomiting, fever, and abdominal cramps. Uh, it comes from reptiles and poultry. And then you have Eucernia pettis. That's the plague. Fleas, rats, and fairy dogs are reservoir. Okay. So rickettsial disease and vector-borne illnesses. Uh, treatment for all of these is doxycycline. Uh, rash common. Common rashes. Uh, Rocket Mountain spotted fever. So in rickettsia, it's caused by rickettsia rickettsi. Uh, vector is thick. Despite its name, disease occurs primarily in the so South Atlantic states, especially North Carolina. Rash typically starts at wrists and ankles and then spreads to trunk palms and soles. Uh, classic triad, 
is headache, fever, and rash. Palms and sole rash is seen in Coxsackie virus. A. Infection. Hand, foot, and mouth disease. Rocky Mountain spotted fever and secondary syphilis. Okay. So, palm and uh, sole rash. Remember, I said it happens in like two to three things. So, one was uh, secondary syphilis. Right. Uh, other one is this Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And the third one is Coxsackie A virus. Coxsackie virus A infection. Uh, that one is known as hand, foot, and mouth disease. Okay, so for this one, rash typically starts at wrist and ankles and then spreads to trunk, palms, and soles. Then you have typhus, endemic fleas. Uh, which one do I have? Oh, I have. I guess this doesn't close because it's just one person, so we don't have time limit. Cool. So typhus, endemic fleas, uh, R. typhi, endemic human body louse, uh, R. provisaki, rash starts centrally and spreads out, sparing palms and soles. Right. So rash starts centrally in this one, and then spreads out, and sparing. And this doesn't affect the palm as well. Actually, have a thing for rash. Yeah, let's look at that. I don't have typhus on this, but palms and soles, cocksacking, syphilis 2, and rickettsia, yeah, rickettsia. And then we have the other one that we haven't done yet, so that was pointless. Uh, rash, which are rare. Uh, Ehrlichosis, Ehrlichia, vector is tick. Uh, monocytes with morula. So it's mulberry like inclusions. They give you this word, that's the buzzword right there, inside of plasma. And then you have anaplasmosis. Anaplasma vector is tick. Uh, granulocytes with morula C in cytoplasm. So that one right there. The way you differentiate between the two is uh, mega. So if the morula is in monocyte, it's going to be ehrlichosis. If the morula is in granulocyte, so granulocyte is just anything that has granules like these little dots. Right? So that's going to be your anaplasmosis, so mega. Make ehrlichosis great again. Uh, Q fever, coxiella burnetti, no arthropod vector. Uh, bacterium in, inhaled as aerosol from cattle and sheep amniotic fluid presents with headache, cough, flu-like symptoms, pneumonia, possibly in combination with uh, hepatitis, common cause of culture negative uh, culture, which is negative for endocarditis. Okay, so Q fever is uh, caused by quite complicated bug because it has no rash or vector, and its causative organism can survive outside in its uh, endospore form. Not in the Rickettsia genus, but closely related. So, mostly, if they're asking about Q fever, and uh, they're gonna give you this that the person was near amniotic fluid of the animal, or it was helping deliver an animal. So they're going to ask you about the causative bacteria. So that's going to be Coxiella burnetti. Presents with headache, cough, flu-like symptoms, pneumonia, possibly in combination with hepatitis. Okay, uh, mycoplasma, walking pneumonia. This is the one okay. that I confused in Legionera. That was called Legionella. Legionera. Legionera. Uh, what was it called?
Legionella pneumonia. Legionnaire's disease, okay. Okay. So classic cause of atypical walking pneumonia, insidious onset, headache, non-productive cough, patchy or diffuse interstitial infiltrate, macular rash. Occurs frequently in those less than 30 years old. Oh, I guess I do have time for 10 minutes. Let's finish this. Okay, occurs frequently in those less than 30 years old. Outbreaks in military recruits, prisons, and colleges. Uh, treatment is macrolides, doxycycline, or fluoroquinolones. Penicillin ineffective since mycoplasma has no cell wall. Uh, the classic presentation for this is that uh, the person doesn't feel it, uh, but when they do the x ray, it feels like it's horrible. How is this person even walking at this point? That's the presentation for this. So, not seen on gram stain, theomorphic, uh, A. Uh, bacterial membrane contains sterols for stability. Grown on Eaton agar, uh, chest x ray appears more severe than patient presentation. High titer for cold of um, cold agglutinins, oh, which can agglutin RBC. Mycoplasma gets cold without a coat, so no cell wall. Can cause atypical variant of Stephen Johnson's syndrome, typically in children and adolescents. Okay. So we got one for you know, microbiology, uh, mycology, systemic mycosis, or <clears throat> this is the fun stuff. How can it not be? It involves the fun guy. Mm -hmm. All of the following can cause pneumonia and can decimate. All are caused by diamorphic fun guy. Uh, it's cold in cold it's mold so 20 degrees celsius in heat it's yeast uh, that's 37 degrees celsius that's our normal body temperature uh, only exception is cox coccidiodes which is a spherio not yeast in tissue okay so that's the main point right there Systemic mycosis can form granulomas like uh, TB. It cannot be, systemic mycosis can form granulomas. It cannot be transmitted person to person like TB. Unlike TB, so. Treatment is fluconazole and itraconazole for local infection and amphotericin B for systemic infection. That's going to be true for almost all of them. There's fluconazole, itraconazole, and ketoconazole. Right. Ketoconazole is also known for its side effect that causes uh, gynecomastia. Not topical, but the one where you put it in your body. Disease, endemic location, pathologic features, unique signs and symptoms, and notes. Okay, so histoplasmosis, it's known for histohydes within macrophages. So that's what, like, that's how you remember this. And it's the first one on this chart. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, the first thing you do is you hide. So that's how you remember the first one is histo. Because... Uh, uh, it gets confusing between race two. So Mississippi, Ohio, and River Valleys, that's where it is. So if they tell you in the question that uh, the person is from Ohio or something, think about histo. They might uh, just give you this picture. So you'll see a macrophage and there will be like RBCs inside of it or something like that. So macrophage filled within histoplasma smaller than RBCs, okay? So it looks like RBCs and macrophages, right? So, but it's smaller than RBC. 
Okay, so unique signs and symptoms is palatal tongue ulcer, splenomegaly, pancytopenia, and erythema nodosum. Uh, this won't be that helpful when you're doing the question. Uh, what will be is the location and the fact that it's a yeast or, uh, right, it's a yeast or they'll give you that it's a, it didn't grow, it didn't culture on like, it's not gram positive or negative, something like that. Or, yeah. Uh, okay, so note, histohytes within macrophages associated with bird or bat droppings. Uh, for example, caves. I think it's also called plucking. It's too digger hollow to cause collapse if that cave did not. Caving, also known as splunking in the United States and Canada. Uh, so yeah, this will be in the questions then, in the clinical picture. Bird or bat droppings, for example, caves. Diagnosis via urine or serum antigen. Blastomycosis, B for budding, uh, budding yeast or broad based budding. Uh, it's from, okay, so that one, the green one was histoplasmosis. So blastomycosis is broader region as well as broad based budding of blastomyces. It's the same size as RBCs. Uh, in the vignette, uh, they'll give you this photo. It's gonna be like this. It's gonna look exactly like that. Uh, okay, so unique signs and symptoms. Inflammatory lung disease. Disseminates to bone, skin, verrucosis on uh, a lesion. May mimic uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Um, blast of buds, probably. Uh, okay, uh, so this one you're gonna know either from the photo or, yeah, they will give you the photo of this. But if they don't, they'll tell you this. It's from the eastern part from like New York or something. Or New York's not in it, so I don't know. But from what I remember, is they give you this photo for blast of mycosis. For this one, they'll tell you that the person went uh, splunking. There's one question where he's gone splunking, he's swam in a uh, like in a pond or a lake, that was lake, and uh, he also has a bird as a pet, and uh, he went to Middle East or something, and he's done all these things, right? Uh, and then you have to figure out what it is. It's so the buzzword there was like uh, is hydrophobic, so that happens in rabies. And rabies uh, in U.S. is caused by bats. So that's what it was. <clears throat> okay. So then, uh, coccidial mycosis. Uh, this is southwestern U.S. and California. They might just tell you that he's in desert as well. That could work as that, uh, as well for this. Uh, but this is the buzzword, uh, spherio, much larger than RBC, right? So it's a spherio. That's if they give you that, or they just give you this photo. If they give you this photo, just don't confuse it with uh, uh, Cryptococcus pneumoformis, because that's also a circle like that. But when this is red, it looks similar to this one. When you, it's not India ink, it's uh, mucorcin or something, mucin stain, mucor stain, or something like that. Uh, okay. It's filled with endospores and of uh, coccides D's. It looks like that, so don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. Uh, disseminates to bone or skin. Erythema nodosum or desert bumps or multiform, multiform. 
uh, arthralgia, desert primitivism. It can cause meningitis. Associated with dust exposure to endemic areas, archaeological excavation, and earthquakes. Uh, the giveaway is going to be desert area uh, uh, or the photo itself. Right? It's going to look like a cell with a lot of spherules inside of it. Okay, uh, para coccidioid mycosis. Uh, this one they tell you it's from South America or Latin America. It kind of looks like a captain's wheel of a ship. So putting yeast of paracoxides with captain's wheel, right? So Latin America, think of like Caribbean, I guess. Not Caribbean, but like the parts of the Caribbean and there's some captain wheel there. They go to South America. Right? Formation much larger than RBC. Uh, similar to blastomycosis and signs and symptoms, so that's skin lesions and stuff. Uh, it happens in males more than females. Paracoxidio paracels with the captain's wheel all the way to Latin America. There you go. Uh, these are the opportunistic fungal infections like Canada albicans, uh, so Elba is white, uh, dimorphic, uh, that means it forms pseudohyphae and budding yeast at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, so it does that. And germ tubes at uh, 37 degrees Celsius, yeah. So but and this is the buddy knees, this buds, and this is the germ tube right there. Right. It's hard to miss this. Like, you'll figure out this is uh, Canada when you look at it, because this is the only one that looks like this. Uh, remember, it's pseudo hyphae. Uh, germ tube at 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, systemic or superficial. Fungal infection causes oral, uh, see, that's oral thrush, I think. Oral and esophageal thrush and uh, immunocompromised neonates, steroids, diabetes, and AIDS. Uh, Vulvovaginitis, uh, diabetes, use of antibiotics. Diaper rash, uh, infective endocarditis. Okay, there you have diaper rash. Uh, infective endocarditis, people who inject drugs and disseminated uh, candidiasis, especially in neutropenic patients. Chronic um, mucocutaneous candidiasis, so from yesterday, the person was talking about this, uh, they told us that it was diaper rash, like someone who messaged. That's the giveaway. If they have a diaper rash, it's usually going to be this one. Endocarditis, vulvovaginitis. Normally, when they give you this, uh, they're going to give you, they want you to talk about this. They're going to tell you that there's a white membrane in the mouth. Uh, treatment, and if they just give you the photo, then they'll tell you that this is what the photo looks like. Treatment is oral fluconazole, topical azoles for vaginal. Uh, Neostatin azoles are rarely echinocandidins uh, for oral. Fluconazole, econocandidin candidins, or amphotericin B for esophageal or systemic disease. Uh, for Aspergillus uh, fumigatus, uh, septate hyphae, septate hyphae that branches at 45 degrees acute angles. Uh, that's this. So 
this is what it's going to look like if it looks like this don't confuse it with this one right so acute angle is going to be aspergillus acute as you can think of it like that um, causes invasive aspergillus in immunocompromised patients especially those with a neutrophil dysfunction for example chronic granulomatous disease because aspergillus is catalase positive right uh, it can cause aspergillomas that's the one where uh, TB causes the cavity and then you have aspergillus residing in it. So can cause aspergillomas in pre-existing lung cavities, especially after TB infection. Some species of aspergillus produce aflatoxin uh, associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. Treatment is braconazole or echinocandinins, second line. Uh, there's allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, ABPA. Hypersensitivity responds to aspergillus growing in lung mucus. Associated with asthma or asthma with cystic fibrosis may cause bronchiectasis and eosinophilia. Associated with asthma and cystic fibrosis may cause bronchiectasis and eosinophilia. Okay. I don't think they I come came across like a question that was testing on this. But this part uh, I know there are questions on that. Cryptococcus uh, neoformans, five to ten micrometer with narrow breading. Heavily encapsulated yeast, not diamorphic, positive uh, path staining found in soil, pigeon droppings. Acquired through inhalation with hematogenous dissemination to meninges, highlighted with India ink, clear halo. Yeah. So that's what it is. And music carmine. Okay, so that was what. That's the stain that they use on the test. So it's going to be red inner capsule. Let's just have a look at what that would look like. So that's what it looks like in the lungs. But it's going to be more obvious than those, like this one, like a thick peptidoglycan uh, capsule, right? So it stains the thick capsule. It's going to be obvious like that. Uh, so, and music carmine, red inner capsule, G. Um, then, latex ignition test detects polysaccharide capsular antigen and is more sensitive and specific. Causes cryptococcus, uh, yeah, cryptococcus, which can manifest with meningitis, pneumonia, and or encephalitis, uh, soap bubble lesion in the brain. Okay. So this one also causes meningitis, pneumonia, and encephalitis, soap bubble lesion. So if, if they give you soap bubble lesion, that's the buzzword for cryptococcus neoformans. Um, but again, it's found in this, and it is past positive, primarily in immunocompromised. Treatment is amphotericin B and flucytosine followed by fluconazole for cryptococcal meningitis. Now comes the mucor and rhizopus species. Irregular, broad, non septate hyphae branching at right angle. Uh, that's the right angle right there. Uh -huh. Causes mucormycosis mostly in patients with 
diabetic ketoacidosis and or neutropenia, for example, leukemia. So people recently, there was a rise of this in India because people uh, with COVID symptoms who had uh, comorbidities like diabetes uh, and they were really sick. Uh, they started having black fungus growing on their faces and yeah, mucromycosis was pretty rampant in those wards. So that's why this is probably gonna be tested on a lot because if it happened there, it probably happened other places too. Causes mucromycosis, mostly in patients with DKA and or neutropenia, uh, like leukemia. Inhalation of spores, which leads to fungi proliferation and blood vessel walls, penetrates cribri foam plate and enters the brain. So rhinocerebral frontal lobe abscess, cavernous sinus thrombus, uh, headache, facial pain, black necrotic eschar on face. Uh, they give you a photo of this when they asking, they're asking about this on your world. So it doesn't look like this. It actually, it's like all the way up here on the forehead. And if I remember correctly, it was about Neocore. They also give you this and they give you this and they give you this photo. They give you this photo as well. This one, I haven't seen much, but they talk about it instead. Uh, they definitely talk about this. They might give you the photo as well. So, necrotic escher on face may have cranial nerve involvement. Treatment is surgical debridement, epotericin B, or acetylconazole. Okay. Pneumocystis Jirovishi uh, or Jirovichai or Rikai. Uh, causes pneumocystitis. Cystis, sorry. Pneumocystis pneumonia. Uh, or PCB, a diffuse interstitial pneumonia, yeast-like fungus, originally classified as protozoan. Most infectious infections are asymptomatic, immunosuppression, for example, AIDS, predisposes to disease, diffuse bilateral brown glass opacities on chest imaging with pneumotoceus. Let's be. Uh, diagnosed by bronchoalveolar lavage on or uh, lung biopsy, disc-shaped yeast seen on methamine silver stain of lung tissue. This is the exact photo they use in the world, I think, or it looks very similar to this. Like if you see a blue background with blue cells looking things, it's gonna be because of this. And this is also a AIDS defining disease, right? Uh, so silver stain, methamine silver stain of lung tissue or with fluorescent antibody. They don't do this with any other uh, bacteria or whatever, or fungus or anything. Uh, fluorescent antibody. Uh, treatment and prophylaxis uh, is TMPSMX, pentamidine or pentamidine, uh, Defsome. Prophylaxis as single agent or treatment in combination with TMP. And then etovacone. Start prophylaxis when CD4 cell counts drop to less than 200 cells in people living with HIV. Uh, okay, and then you have Sporthrix uh, Shinsky causes sporotrichosis. For this, uh, it's pretty obvious that they're talking about this because the question stem is going to talk about a person who is gardening and planting roses or something, or they were just gardening and then a thorn, thorn from a rose uh, stem cut them. And then eventually the next day or something, they started having these lesions right here on their arm. And then they just ask you, what is it? They also ask you how it spreads. 
so you know that as well. Okay, so it's called causes uh, sporotrichosis, dimorphic fungus. It exists as cigar shaped yeast. They give you that as well that the person was burning, they have this, and then they culture it, or they looked at it under a microscope. It was a cigar shaped yeast. So know that as well. That's because of this. At 37 degrees Celsius in the human body and as high feed with spores in soil. Lives on vegetation when spores are tra traumatically introduced into the skin, typically by a thorn. Rose gardeners sin disease causes local partial or ulcer with nodules along draining lymphatics. So it's nodules along draining lymphatics and it's ascending lymphagitis. So that's the word they're looking for. Uh, disseminated disease possible in immunocompromised host. Treatment is intraconazole or potassium iodide only for cutaneous, lymphocutaneous. Think of Rose Gardner who smokes a cigar or and a pot and pot. Uh, we are at parasitology now. Uh, protozoa, gastrointestinal infections. We already talked about giardia. Uh, it's when there's no IgA in the body. So what it does is giardiasis, uh, that is bloating, flatulence, foul smelling not bloody fatty diarrhea often seen in campers and hikers uh, so the question stands I'm going to talk about a hiker who was thirsty and he started drinking from the local pond or lake or whatever and then he ended up with geodiasis without eating it or something so think fat rich gerald gir dearly uh, chocolates I guess it's a chocolate brand for fatty source of giardia uh, cysts in water multinucleated trophozoites a or cysts in stool this one is pretty easy to figure out so multinucleated uh, trophozoites a cyst in stool so a this is what it looks like it looks like a face with two eyes maybe a mouth or not but you'll see the eyes and the tail right uh, or cyst they won't give you that for this there is one with the knobby uh, cyst they'll talk about it I guess uh, still antigen detection PCR so treatment is metronid as well this one and this one both are metronid as well you have Entamoeba histolytica, so amoebiasis. That's what it causes, it's in the name. Uh, bloody diarrhea, dysentery, liver abscess, or anchovy paste. This is the buzzword it used to be, but not anymore. They don't give you that. They're just going to give you some, ex some kind of stuff on the liver or something. Uh, right upper quadrant, pain. And that's the liver part. Uh, histology of colon biopsy shows flask shaped ulcer. That's the buzzword now. So flask shaped ulcers. Like so. See this thing right here? It looks like a flask. Kind of, not really, but. Kind of, not really, but sure. So if you have flash shaped ulcers, you're gonna think about antimoeba histolytica, right? That's the buzzword. Uh, cysts in water, serology, antigen testing, PCR, 
and or trophozoites with engulfed RBCs in the cytoplasm or cysts with up to four nuclei in stools. So remember, you do serology, you can do antigen testing or PCR, but don't pick any other than this thing. Uh, and amoeba eats erythrocytes. Wait. So metronidazole. Yeah, because uh, or trophozoites with engulfed RBCs. That's why it's said anyway, it's synthesized. Metronidazole, paramomycin, or iodoquinol, or asymptomatic cyst passers. Uh, then you have. It's kind of like, I do quite not have it. So they don't have the symptoms, so they don't, they say, I do not quite have it. Okay, so I can, I'm going to remember that one. Okay, um, cryptosporidium. This is uh, severe diarrhea and AIDS. Okay, so if there's diarrhea and AIDS, this is the first thing you're going to think of. And then if it's not this, you're going to, differentiate it out you know but if someone has AIDS and have severe diarrhea this is going to be the reason cryptosporidium um, mild disease watery diarrhea and immunocompetent host though oocytes in water oocytes on acid fast stain antigen detection PCR prevention by filtering city water supply uh, yeah Nidazoxanide and immunocompetent hosts. Nidazoxanide. Who comes up with these names, man? So complicated. Anyway, so for the antamoeba, it was this, right? Engulfed with the uh, RBC, so that's what it looks like. And cis with up to four nuclei in stool. So if they tell you that it has uh, multiple nuclei, you want to get into as well. All right. And this is oocyte acid fast stain. So if they're talking about acid fast stain of oocytes, it's gonna be cryptosporidine. They actually do give you this photo as well. Or they also talk about this. But majority of the time, you will figure it out if it's AIDS, and has severe diarrhea, it's cryptosporidium. Just think of it that way. Uh, protozoa, CNS infections, uh, organisms, disease, transmission, diagnosis, and treatment again. So these were all the GI infection protozoa. And now we're gonna do it for the CNS. CNS are a little easier to remember because they're not the same. They are different symptoms uh, so for toxoplasma gondii actually just think about gondii with his uh, glasses and calcification like sunspots on his head and um, big head right so if we think of it like that i actually drew a picture in my book i'll see for him bring it during the break actually how much time Okay, two more pages. Uh, Toxoplasma gondi, uh, immunocompetent, um, mononucleosis like symptoms, negative heterophil antibody test, reaction, reactivation and AIDS, and causes brain abscesses, usually seen on multiple ring enhancing lesions on MRI. This is what it's known for, and we'll look at what that looks like. Or actually, they have it right here. A. So multiple link forming lesions, right? It's not gonna be just one, it could be two or more. Okay, uh, congenital toxoplasmosis is the classic triad of uh, chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus, and intracranial calcifications. So they do test you on that. They'll tell you that 
um, the head is larger than average. Uh, there is like a ring forming lesions in the head and uh, there's chorioretinitis. And then you figure out it's this. Or they can just give you this photo, which is the classic presentation for toxoplasma gondii. Transmission systems uh, meet, uh, most common. This is what they test you on, uh, even though this is the most, like this is what people remember. Oocytes in cat feces, it crosses placenta, so pregnant patients should avoid cats. That's why people remember that, but they don't remember that cysts in meat also occurs, right? So if they give you the buzzword, ring enhancing lesions, and they don't give you this, you're going to think that it's, uh, okay, it's not toxoplasma, it's something else now, right? But it's, remember, cysts in meat causes this as well. Diagnosis, serology, biopsy, uh, tachyzoid, PCR of amniotic fluid, for possible intrauterine disease. Treatment is sulfadiazine, uh, pyrimethamine, prophylaxis with TMPSMX when CD4 plus cell count. And it's less than 100 cells per millimeter cube. Uh, Fowlery, Neglaria Fowlery is the one where it's uh, people go swimming in warm water in the middle of a jungle or something like that. So it's rapidly fatal meningoencephalitis. Swimming in form fresh water enters via cribly, cribly foam plate. So amoebas in CSF, that's what it is. Uh, Enfotericin B has been effective for a few survivors. Mostly people die because of this. So don't go swimming in just any kind of water. Uh, trepanosoma brucey. That's this thing right here. Uh, African sleeping sickness and large lung nodes recurring fever due to antigenic variation, salmonins and coma. Okay, so CC fly a painful bite. So we're going to talk about uh, how the lymph nodes are big and uh, the person is constantly sleeping. Uh, even if they wake up, they can't pay attention. They go fall asleep right again. Uh, right, and there's a fever. And yeah, and they're, I guess, I don't know, immigrated from Africa or something. Uh, CC fly, a painful bite, Trepo, uh, trypomastigote, and blood smear. Uh, that's what it looked like. They actually don't use this photo because it's very similar to the trypanoma cruzi or trypanosoma cruzi because that's what it looks like. They use this picture for this one, but not the other one. Okay, so if the person has large lymph nodes and they keep sleeping, think of African sleeping sickness as because of brucey. Sermon for blood-borne disease or melarsopro for CNS penetration. Uh, for the drugs for all of these, they don't tend to ask besides the ones for metric used for metronidazole and clindamycin. Other ones, they don't really test you on. They might ask you systemic for this, right? Because this is usually for fungi and now you're using it for protozoa. So. But yeah, they don't really test you on that. So I'm not going to spend time on that. Um, protozoa, hematologic infections now. So only three were for uh, CNS and three for GIT. The three for GIT are Giardia, Antamoeba histolytica, and Cryptosporidium. The three for CNS is Toxoplasma gondii, Negleria fowleri, and Trypanosoma brucei. And now for the blood. 
Um, there are only two. One is malaria and the other one is Babesia. Uh, there is a defining feature for each of them, but major, majorly it's just this ring-like structure for Plasmodium. And for Babesia, it's this Maltese cross. All right. Uh, don't look at this, look for this for Babesia. So if, even if they give you a Plasmodium photo, look around to see if there's a Maltese cross, right? Um, for Plasmodium, uh, malaria, cyclic fever, headache, anemia, uh, splenomegaly, hypoglycemia, and severe disease. Hold on, let me see something. Let's take a break here because I need to so remember I told you about how I have a photo for this. So this is the photo. Of Gandhi. So his head is big. So that uh, represents hydrocephalus. Uh, the sunspots represent the intracranial calcification. The eyes represent the ring enhanced lesion and also I mean the glasses do that but the eyes represent the cardio retinitis right. for trypanoma brucey it's just Bruce Lee uh, wearing a hat okay so yeah trapezoid is intracellular crescent shaped organism with a central nucleus Uh, back to this. So, Plasmodium malaria. Okay, so we have uh, P. malari, uh, P. vivax ovale, and P. falciparum. Right. So, for malaria, we have uh, cyclic fevers, headache, anemia, and splenomegaly, uh, hypoglycemia, and severe disease. And transmission is Anopheles mosquito. Uh, treatment. If sensitive, chloroquine. If resistant, then mefloquine, doxycycline. So this map is what I was, I'm just, I'll try to do that, but this is like from UWorld. Uh, and the purple areas are chloroquine resistant malaria. So here you can't use chloroquine. So only time you can use chloroquine for malaria is if the uh, malaria happened to a person from whom came from here or here, right? So majority of the time, chloroquine is not going to be the answer, right? Because they're going to talk about someone who's from like India or Africa or someone like that. Okay. So if sensitive, chloroquine. If resistant, then mefloquine is what you give. Doxycycline or etovacone or proguanil. Uh, these are usually the answers. Uh, presented to you. Uh, if life-threatening, use intravenous quinine or artesanate. Uh, test for G6PD deficiency for that. Uh, yeah. So cyclic uh, fevers, uh, headache, anemia, splenomegaly, hypoglycemia, and severe disease. So when they say cyclic fever, what do they mean? Uh, that is uh, the defining feature of malaria. Uh, it, if it was 72 hours of fever cycle, then it's going to be because of uh, P. malaria. Uh, if it's 48 hours of fever cycle, or also known as tertian, that one was quartern, uh, it's going to be P. Yvex or uh, OLA, right? And yeah, so if it has irregular fever pattern, it's going to be falciparum. So if it's P. malaria, that's the one. Uh, that has quartin. Right. So, okay, let me just write this out real quick. So, Argentina and Mexico. 
photo. Sensitive. Spelled it wrong. Okay. So it does there. Uh, for orders, it's going to be Vero. Let's write that in V. Wired. Right, so first day, then uh, three days later. So blood smear with uh, trophozoid ring, headphone shaped uh, within RBC. So that's A. It's headphone shaped, right? Like that, at least. Or ring shaped, at least. It looks like a ring with a stone. Uh, uh, for P Vivex and OLA, it's uh, going to be forty-eight hours, right? So that's just one dash zero dash one or tertian, uh, dormant form, so hypnozoid in liver. Uh, so sometimes they're treated like this, but then, uh, for a month after they come back, uh, they're treated for a month before they go, then, uh, once each week. And then after they come uh, they're supposed to take it for a month as well. Uh, but then they don't, and then they get reinfected or they have malaria, right? And they're like, what happened? I took my, uh, medication. It's because of this. You didn't take care of hypnozoids in the liver, right? So blood smears with trypnozoids and uh, Schaffner stippling, small red granules within RBCs and cytoplasms. So you add primaquine to target hypnozoids. When it's PYVX or OLA. Uh, for this also, Uh, test for G six P D before giving primaquin. Uh, that's important. Know that. Uh, P falciparum. This is severe uh, irregular fever pattern. Uh, parasitized RBCs may occlude capillaries in the brain. Right? Uh, cerebral malaria, that's what it's called. Uh, kidneys and lungs, so everywhere is going to cause a problem. This Here you're going to see this, a blood smear with trophozoic ring within RBCs. Uh, percent shaped gametocyte. See, they don't give you this photo or this photo. They just give you this photo or this. It's more than likely gonna be this. They're gonna check if you know what Maltese cross looks like and it's if it you can differentiate between malaria and babesia. Uh, for malaria, they usually make sure you have a knowledge about Argentina and Mexico being chloroquine sensitive, and all the others are chloroquine uh, resistant. Uh, but I think we covered the majority of the things you need to know regarding this. Uh, so Babesia, uh, what does that cause? It causes babesiosis, uh, fever and hemolytic anemia, predominantly in northeastern and north central United States. Asplenia increases the risk of severe disease due to inability to clear infected RBCs. Uh, it's sadistic also vector for Borrelia burgdorferi and anaplasma, right? That they keep telling us that it's because it's important. They'll tell you like where it comes uh, into question is like, they'll say uh, this person had bibosis. Like they'll give you these, this stuff and they'll give you all this. And it's like, uh, what is the mechanism of action or similar mechanism of action for another disease that would, uh, that's similar to this one. And then they will like, you know, 
give you Lyme's disease or something like that, or uh, what was it, mega, right, granulocyte for anaplasma or something like that. So remember to pick it like that. Uh, blood smear uh, ring form is D1, and then Maltese cross is this PCR. So Maltese cross, let's see if we can figure something on this. Babes, the So this is what the Maltese cross looks like, right? So that's what that is. It's still a, it looks like a ring with a stone, but all the stones are connected. Like they're trying to summon up a superhero or something, Captain Planet. <laughs> and malaria is just, it looks like a headphone or just single, but it's not gonna look like a cross. Right. Uh, Edovacan uh, plus azithromycin is the treatment. Uh, just know how to identify it and what else Exodus tick is just to vector for. Okay, so we did, again, we did protozoa for GAT, that's Giardia, that Entamoeba, Histolytica, and Cryptosporidium, that's for AIDS and plus diarrhea. Uh, we did CNS protozoas, that's Toxoplasma gondii, that was the ring, or, you know, this thing, gondii with the uh, chorioretinitis, ring lesion with hydrocephalus and intracranial calcification. You have Niglera fowlery, that was your swimming in fresh water, and it goes straight to the head and you die. Uh, trepanosoma. Brucey, that's African sleeping sickness. It's going to be lymph nodes with a uh, person who can't stay awake for long. And it looks like a hat. Uh, we did, and we did hematologic protozoas, Plasmodia and Vibicea. Uh Then we are going to do uh, protozoa, all the other ones, the visceral infection and sexually transmitted ones. And yeah. So trepanosoma cruzi, that's the Chagas disease. Everything else, everything gets um, big because of this. By big, I mean like mega colon. You're going to have mega esophagus, right? And mega heart or dilated cardiomyopathy, aka. <laughs> uh, so Chagas disease is dilated cardiomyopathy with apical atrophy. So they'll say they have, the person has... Uh, Let's see, has three, I guess, or echogram, or somehow they know that there is a dilated cardiomyopathy. He has dysphagia, so that's because of mega esophagus, and mega colon, he has constipation or something, right? That's how they're going to ask. So T. cruzi causes big problems, so predominantly in South America, uh, and unilateral periorbital swelling, Romana sign, uh, characteristic of acute stage, triatomine insect or kissing bug. Know the name. They do ask sometimes which vector was used to cause this disease. So it's triatomine insect or kissing bug, bites and defecates around the mouth or eyes, which leads to fecal transmission into bite site or mucosa. Uh, trep Tripomastigo in blood smear. So that's what it looks like. It looks like a hat. Uh, and benzinidazole or nefertismox. Uh, they give you cardiomyopathy. They say that um, he has heart failure or ventricular arrhythmias or ventricular aneurysm, something like that. Right. 
uh, for Leishmania species. Uh, they say pinkish uh, papule evolve, evolved into a nodule or a plaque. Let me just write that. Okay. Another buzzword for this is also this. Most of that in red. It's rod shaped cytoplasmic inclusions. Also known as Okay, so Leishmania species, visceral Leishmaniasis or Kala Azar, uh, that's spiking fevers, uh, hepatosplenomegaly, and pancytopenia. This usually happens uh, in someone or a soldier who had a a uh, trip in the uh, Middle East or, you know, somewhere down there in a desert area. So, and when they came back and they had fever, uh, you can palpate their uh, liver and they have uh, pancytopenia. Uh, when they did uh, the staining and stuff, this is what they found. They found rod-shaped cytoplasmic inclusions, right? And you're going to think, okay, that could be something but it's not going to hit you so just remember rod shaped cytoplasmic inclusion kinetoplast it's in leishmaniasis it could be like they could tell you that it was a pinkish papule and now it's a nodule or a plaque and that's still this uh it could be cutaneous uh leishmaniasis that's the skin ulcer it's, uh, it's done by sandfly macrophage containing elimastic oats Amphotericin B, sodium stibogluconate. Okay, that's it. So visceral ones are, you know, affecting visceras. So that's your Trepanosoma cruzi and Leishmania species. Uh, now sexually transmitted infections. So that's Trichomonas vaginalis. Okay. Uh, trichomonas vaginalis, uh, vaginitis, it causes that, uh, foul smelling greenish discharge, itching and burning. You're going to have to differentiate between this and Gardnerella and I guess UTIs causing bacteria. Uh, foul smelling greenish discharge, like gonorrhea, right? Because that's also causes uh, discharge and foul smelling. So foul smelling, greenish, greenish uh, discharge, itching and burning. Do not confuse with Gardnerella uh, vaginalis, uh, gram variable bacterium associated with bacterial vaginosis. Uh, transmission is sexual, it cannot exist outside human because it cannot form cysts. Uh, diagnosis is done by trophozoites, motile on wet mount. Uh, so when you're differentiating between the others, they're not going to be motile. Uh, punctate cervical hemorrhages and strawberry cervix. The cervix is red, like strawberry. They even might say strawberry cervix. Uh, go for this one, Trachomonas vaginalis. Metronizole for patients or partners. Prophylaxis check for STI. Nematodes root of infection. Uh, this is very helpful. So just learn that and then you can just go on from there because otherwise nematodes get confusing. Okay, uh, so you have ingested enterobius 
as curious. Uh, so ingested ones are eat. So you'll get sick if you eat these. So eat E for enterobius, A for escara, caris, uh, toxocara, trichinella, and trichuris. Then you have cutaneous ones. These get into your feet from the sand. So SEN, stromuloids, and encyclostoma, and necator. Encyclostoma and necator are the same thing. They're just different region have different names. Uh, bites, lay low to avoid getting bitten. So lay low if you don't want to get bitten. So L is for loa loa. O is for oncocera. Vulval, Volvulus and Wuscheriga Bancrofti. Okay. okay, so now that we know how they get into you, let's learn about them. Uh, nematodes, roundworms, organism disease transmission and treatment, intestinal enterobius, vermicularis, and pinworm, also known as pinworm. And these diseases cause, uh, this one causes an anal pruritus. It's diagnosed by seeing egg via the tape test. So this one is where uh, the child would have it probably like it's coming out of the ass and you put a tape on it. And then when you look at the tape, it has these worms on it. And that's how you know it's enterobius vermicularis. Uh, you know that to do this, it's cause the kid's gonna be scratching a lot back there. Uh, transmission is fecal oral and treatment is uh, bendazole and parental pemoid. Bendazole is usually the one you go for for any worms because and it's easy to remember because worms bend and you use bendazole for them. Uh, then you have Escherichia's uh, lumbricoids. Uh, or also known as giant rotworm, may cause obstruction at ileocecal valve, biliary obstruction, intestinal perforation, migrates from nose, mouth, migration of larva to alveoli. It causes the low fleur uh, syndrome, which is pulmonary eosinophilia. Okay, uh, transmission is fecoral, uh, knobby coated oval eggs seen in feces under microscope. Yeah, so this is the one they show you for this. If they show you this kind of egg and, or they use the word knobby coated, uh, it's gonna be giant roundworm or lumber cords, right? Uh, I've, I've seen questions that just use the buzzword. And I also seen questions that had this photo and then like one or two line about the symptoms, that's it. And then you're supposed to figure it out from this photo. Okay. That is all. How it travels is basically you eat it and then uh, it migrates to the alveoli. So it goes from the nose and mouth into the lungs. Okay, so it's in the intestine because you eat it and then it travels from the intestine into the nose or mouth and then from there it goes into the alveoli. Okay. Uh, stranguloid stercoralis or threadworm. Uh, wait, we are at eat still, right? So we did EA, we'll do this later. Uh, T, so Trichinella spiralis, so that's larva enter bloodstream and site in striated muscle. So D, it's gonna be inside the muscle like that. They give you a photo like this, it's similar to this. You're gonna see muscle fibers and then you'll see a few eggs inside of it. So it's just larva enter bloodstream and site in striated muscle and causing myositis. Uh, trichinosis, fever, uh, vomiting, nausea, periorbital edema, and myalgia. It happens uh, when you eat undercooked meat, especially pork, fecal oral, less likely, and benazole is what you use to treat it. Uh, Trechuris, uh, trechuria, or whipworm. 
It's often asymptomatic, loose stool, anemia, and rectal prolapse in children. That's the major one, I guess. Again, fecal oral and benazole to treat it. And Toxocara canis. This is the one where dogs have it, but then when uh, you get it from somewhere, maybe a dog bite or something, and you get infected by Toxocara canis, visceral larval migraines. Migration into the blood, inflammation of everything basically. It's because in dogs, they know where to go, but in humans, they don't know where to go, so they just go everywhere. So migration into blood, inflammation of liver, eyes, visual impairment, blindness, CNS seizures, coma, uh, heart, uh, as in myocardi causing myocarditis, and patients are often asymptomatic. Uh, Fecal-oral benazole. How can patients be asymptomatic if it's causing all of these things? I think they would know if once they have seizures or they go into coma that something's wrong, right? Anyways, uh, okay, so now we're gonna do sand. Uh, so, sand. So these are the cutaneous ones, strongyloid and cyclomata and nectar. These get into your feet from the sand, so disease uh, they cause is GI deonitis, pulmonary, for example, dry cough and hematopsis, hemoptysis, uh, and cutaneous, for example, pruritus symptoms. So GI, lungs, cutaneous. Hyperinfection caused by autoinfection. Larva in bloodstream in the immunocompromised Transmission is larva in soil penetrate skin, reptidiform larva seen in feces under microscope. Treatment is ivermectin or bendazole. Uh, Encyclomata species and negator Americans. They give you this photo right here. Uh, this looks like a hand, but it's usually going to be a feet, and the feet's going to have something like this on it. It changed the photo from a previous version. In the previous version, this was a feed. Okay, so cause microcytic anemia by sucking blood from intestinal wall. Right, so if you have microcytic anemia and you're... Actually, you don't even have to worry about that. It's just this. Oh. All right. Like you don't have to think about the whole presentation. If they give you this photo, just know that it's Encyclomata or Negator Americans. One or two, one of these will be in the options. But anyways, causes microcytic anemia by sucking blood from intestinal wall, cutaneous larval migrants. So you have pruritic and serpingeous rash. They might just use that as a buzzword. Uh, larva penetrate skin from walking barefoot on the contaminated beach or soil. The patient will have a history of visiting a beach nearby. Um, Benazole or parental pemoid is what you use to treat it. Okay. Now we're going to do low. You stay low to avoid getting bitten. So... L for loa loa, swelling in skin, warm in conjunctival. Uh, it comes from, this is uh, pretty cool if you've seen it. So that's what it looks like in the eye. Not that. But this and this, so yeah, pretty cool. Uh, that's what it looks like. Loa loa, swelling in skin, warm in conjunctiva. Uh, 
It comes from deer fly, horse fly, um, mango fly. For these, uh, you don't give bendazole. You give dietyl carbamazine. Uh, always for Oncaris, Oncocerca, Volvulus, Volvulus. Uh, skin changes, loss of elastic fibers, fever blindness, uh, black skin nodule, black site, allergic reaction, female black fly, and ivermectin. Ivermectin for river blindness, kind of like that. Uh, it's called the river blindness because in Africa, uh, it had uh, whatever water bodies there were. And then like when people or kids would go in to swim in it. And after they come out in a couple of days, they go blind. And they didn't realize that it's because of this uh, nematode or worm, right? But now they figured it out. There are people who know how to... You can't really, you know, this didn't exist back then. So they used to use like a mastic and they would hold on to it and then they would roll it up to bring it out. It was either in this or, yeah, I think it was this. So it doesn't go and go ahead and travel through the body to the uh, eyes or something like that. But yeah, the story behind that is pretty cool horrible but it helps you remember it uh wisharia bencrofti or bergia malaria from malai uh, lymphatic filariasis or elephantasis this is an easy one to figure out because you're gonna have you know legs like these uh worms invade lymph nodes right so the lymph node, then you have inflammation, which leads to lymphedema. Lymphedema. Symptoms onset after nine months to one year. There's a female, it's transmitted by a female mosquito, and again, you give diethyl carbamazine. And that's it for nematodes. Okay. Now we're going to do cystodes. Cystodes are tapeworms. These were roundworms. Uh, the tapeworms are they call are called tapeworms is because they hook onto stuff like a tape. So, uh, tinea solium disease is intestinal tapeworm. Uh, okay. Ingestion of larva insisted in undercooked pork or praziquantel. Uh, this is pretty popular with uh, stray dogs, but uh, so if you have a lot of stray dogs near a farming, uh, any kind of farming, where you farm vegetables, uh, so even though it says ingestion of eggs and food uh, contaminated with human feces, this can happen if you have dogs near the farm and uh, Dogs are stray, so they will, you know, defecate everywhere. And then the eggs can end up on the vegetable. And if the vegetable is not, you know, washed properly, it can end up in a, that's how it ends up in like a vegetarian as well. Not just undercooked pork or eggs and like that. So diseases that cause is uh, cystosarcosis, neurocystosarcosis. Uh, this is what it looks like. The little dots. They do ask you about that neurocystosarcosis. You need to know it comes from tinea solium. Okay, it's cystic CNS lesions and it causes seizures. Transmission, ingestion of eggs and food contaminated with human feces. Treatment, praziquintel, albendazole, or neurocystosarcosis. Uh, Diphylobotrium latum. This is the one that causes vitamin B12 deficiency because this tapes on into the intestine and causes megaloblastic anemia, which is convenient because we know vitamin B12 causes megaloblastic anemia, right? So vitamin B12 
division see if Kate Warm competes for B12 in the intestine, megaloblastic anemia. Transmission is ingestion of larva in raw freshwater fish. Treatment is prasequinto and niclosamide. All the tapeworms you use prasequinto brand of tape. Okay. Uh, Echinococcus granulosus, hydatid cysts. That's this thing. It's the egg cell calcification. Uh, they do test you on that. Like, say it was a cyst, and then during the procedure of removal, the person went into shock. Why? Because it was a hydatid cyst and in the liver, and cyst rupture can cause anaphylaxis. Ingestion of eggs in food contaminated with dog feces, sheep are an intermediate host. Albendazole surgery for complicated cysts. So you're going to try to get rid of it with this, but if it's complicated cyst, then you're going to need to do a surgery. That's what it's going to call, uh, look like basically. That thing right there, okay. What's this? Not for that. But that thing right there is the cyst. Uh, trematodes or flukes, the liver flukes, also known as. So, schistosoma. Okay, uh, schistosoma. Disease, liver and spleen enlargement shows S. Mansoni egg with lateral spine, right? So that's the lateral spine. Uh, fibrous, lateral spine because it goes on the side, whereas this one is right at the tail. So liver and spleen enlargement shows S. Mansoni. Uh, you can also call it Mansoni because symbol for man is like this right so it's like that with a side pointing out so that's this with a side pointing out so that's the end mensoni that's mensoni egg with lateral spine fibrosis it causes fibrosis inflammation portal hypertension s mensoni and s japanicum can both also cause intestinal schistosomiasis presenting with diarrhea, abdominal pain, iron deficiency, anemia. Chronic infection with S. hematobium, uh, egg with terminal spine. Chronic infection with S. hematobium. This is an egg with terminal spine. So that's a terminal spine. Can lead to squamous cell carcinoma. This is why this is important. Of the bladder. Uh, but even more important than that is going to be this because it causes uh, a tract infection. So, okay, back to this. Squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder, painless hematuria, and pulmonary hypertension. Transmission is snails are intermediate hosts. Right. Uh, Sarcaria penetrates skin of humans in contact with contaminated fresh water. Uh, for swimming or bathing. So if you have a person who went swimming and then started having these, you know, symptoms and then they ask you what could be the culprit and they're going to give you like a bird, a pet, a dog and stuff like that. You got to remember if someone goes swimming, it's not just Naglaria fowlery. You can also get a uh, schistosoma, right? And it comes from snails. They're going to ask you about that. Where does it come from? Okay, uh, Prasequinto. They don't really test you on this thing because that's complicated at this point to figure out that is because of this. You do a bunch of tests for that. Uh, Colonorechis uh, sensei, uh, biliary tract inflammation, pigmented gallstones associated with cholangiocarcinoma. Right? So they might tell you that the person had a liver fluke or something like that or, you know, 
they had undercooked fish in this and uh, if un left untreated uh, what can they you know what complications can they have this is the complication they have cholangiocarcinoma uh, again presequintal now stabies so now we're going to do ectoparasites that's uh, Starcoptes scabi. The mite burrows into stratum corneum and causes scabies. Truritus worse at night and sarpingous burrow lines often between fingers and toes. Yeah, they might give you this photo or just tell you that the person keeps itching and when you look closer, they have, there's like sarpingous burrow lines. Right? Especially at night, they itch a lot, and it's these lines are between fingers and toes. That's scabies. Uh, so it's common in children, crowded population, jails, uh, nursing homes, transmission through skin to skin contact, most common or via fomites. Treatment is permethrin uh, cream, permethrin cream, uh, oral ivermectin know about this they do ask about this one uh, oral ivermectin washing drying all clothing and bedding treat close contacts okay. all right wash everything um, pediculus uh, humanus and phytreus pulis also known as louse or lice sorry not louse but lice or louse yeah uh, blood sucking lice that causes intense pruritus with associated uh, excoriation. This is what it's going to look like. They would show you this photo. Uh, excoriation commonly on scalp and neck, head lice, waistband, and axilla would be the body lice uh, or pubic and perianal region. That's pubic lice. Okay. Body lice can transmit rickettsia provisaki. Uh, endemic typhus or Borrelia recurrentis, uh, recurrentis, currentis, uh, relapsing fever, Bartonella quintana, trench fever. Treatment is uh, pyrethroids or melthion or ivermectin lotion and knit. That's Coleman, right? So you comb it out. Uh, children with head lice can be treated at home without interu interrupting school attendance uh, then we have cymex lecturarius and climax hemipterius cymex and climax i think i read that one before. yeah this is a new one these are bed bugs blood feeding insects that in infest dwellings Painless bites result in a range of skin reactions, typically pruritic uh, erythematous papules with central hemorr hemorrhagic uh, punctum. A clustered or linear pattern of bites seen upon awakening in is suggestive. Diagnosis is confirmed by direct identification of bed bugs in patient's dwelling. Bedbugs can spread among rooms. Cohabitants may exhibit similar symptoms. Infestations can also spread by travelers from infested hotels and the use of unwashed used bedding. Treatment bites resolve, self resolve within one week. Eradication of the infestation is critical. Uh, Parasite hints. So this is how you're going to figure out what, which one is which. So if they give you biliary tract disease and cholangiocarcinoma, it's going to be your cholangiocarcinosis. Yeah, you can figure that out. <laughs> uh, brain cyst seizure, tinea sodium, neurosarcosis, hematuria, squamous cell bladder cancer. Right, that's your, again, liver fluke. Cystosoma hematobium, uh, liver or hydatid cyst, exposure to infected dogs, 
echinococcus granulosus. Uh, then you have iron deficiency anemia, that's going to be encyclomato and nectar, right? Also causing microcytic anemia. Uh, myalgias, periorbital edema, that's trichinella spiralis. Where's that? This one. Right there. Then we have nocturnal perianal pruritus and enterobius. We have portal hypertension, uh, schistosoma mansoni can cause this, and schistosoma japonicum causes portal hypertension. So portal hypertension for these, for uh, this one, hematobium, it causes squamous cell bladder cancer or squamous cell cancer of bladder. And then if you have this one, it's cholangiocarcinoma. That's the one that starts with C. And also vitamin B12 is diphylobotrium bladum. So these are like the buzzwords that they give given you. Okay, uh, we're on to virology or virology. Viral structure, general features are capsid, nucleic acid, you have surface protein by uh, lipid bilayer. You have a helical capsid with viral RNA, uh, lipid bilayer, and surface protein enveloped virus with helical capsid. And you have a capsid, nucleic acid, collar here, and helical sheath, core, spike, base plate, and vector phase. Okay. I think this is like the structure for HIV. Uh, viral genetic and recombination, viral genetics, recombination. That's just a simple one. It's exchange of genes between two chromosomes by crossing over within regions of significant base and sequence homology. Blue and green got mixed, so you get some of blues and some of greens. Reassortment is when virus with segmented genomes, uh, for example, influenza virus, exchange genetic material, right? So you have a segmented genome and segmented genome. So you have a green and blue, but you have okay, green and blue for this as well, but segmented genome, that is. So if just segmented uh, viruses involved, it's gonna be resortment. For example, the 2009 novel H1N1 influenza, a pandemic emerged via complex viral resortment of genes from human, swine, and avian viruses, has potential to cause antigenic shift. Okay, so antigenic shift uh, is sudden, and gradual one is the drift. Uh, complementation. When one of two viruses that infect the cells has a mutation that results in a non-functional protein, that non-functional protein, the non-mutated virus complements the mutated one by making a functional protein that serves both viruses. Okay, we have 10 minutes. We only have like two pages left, man. One, two, and we're on the Okay, so complementation. Uh, again, when one of two viruses that infect the cell has a mutation that results in a non functional protein, the non mutated virus complements the mutated one by making a functional protein that serves both viruses. For example, Heb D virus requires the presence of replicating Heb D virus to supply. Uh, HBSAG, the envelope protein for HDV. So you have a functional one, you have a non-functional one. So the functional one is going to provide the envelope to the non-functional one so it can penetrate the cell. Uh, the only example for this is this. So remember that complementation. Or they might just say that there's a 
research going on and um, DNA from one was found in the cell, even though when they tried to infect the cell directly, it didn't work. But when they mixed it up, it worked on, uh, like it gained entry into the cell. So that would be complementation. Uh, phenotypic mixing occurs with sim simultaneous infection of a cell with two viruses. For progeny one, genome of virus A can be partially or completely coded, forming pseudovirion with the surface protein of virus B. Type B protein code determines the tropism or infectivity of the hybrid virus. Progeny from subsequent infection of the cell by progeny 1 will have type A code that is encoded by its type A genetic material. So what it's saying is you have virus A plus virus B. So in the first one, you have the uh, envelope from virus B, but the genetic material is from virus A. So the first one's going to uh, go on and, you know, penetrate it. But then when it re replicates, uh, the envelope is going to come from the genetic material. The instructions are going to come from there. And so the envelope is different in progeny 2. And it's not going to look like progeny 1. So this is phenotypic mixing. Okay. So P for previous. It goes to the previous envelope. I guess you'll remember that like that. Complementation is just both of them complement each other. Reassortment was for segmented virus viruses, and recombination is just two chromosomes crossing. Okay, that's it. Uh, this gets confusing if you don't remember that this is for virus and the other one transformation, transponents and all that stuff is for bacteria. Let's go. Take a look at that afterwards again while doing this simultaneously. Uh, DNA viral genome. How much time? Seven minutes. Uh, DNA viral genome. All DNA viruses have double stranded genome except for Parvo Verde. Actually, let's just come back because I want to look at other DNA stuff. viruses have double stranded genome, uh, DNA genomes, uh, except Parvo Verde, which is a single stranded DNA, right? So we have Parvo here, it's single stranded DNA. All the other ones are double stranded. Okay. All are linear except Papilloma, Polyoma, and Hepdena virus. So all, all of them are linear except for Hebdena, Polyoma, Papilloma, and Polyoma, right? So these are the circular ones, these three. Uh, all are double-stranded DNA like our cells except part of a virus or parvovirus. It's single-stranded DNA. Okay, uh, then we have RNA viral genome. All RNA viruses have single-stranded RNA genome except uh, Rio Verde or double-stranded RNA. Positive-stranded RNA viruses. I went to a retro uh, toga party where I drank flavored Corona and ate hippie California pickles, right? So... All RNA viruses have single-stranded genome, except for Rio virus. Okay, so except for Rio virus, everyone has any every one of these have uh, single-stranded RNA. Okay. Uh, then they told us uh, this positive-stranded RNAs are retrovirus, Toga virus, Flavivirus, Coronavirus, Hepivirus, Kelly vi virus, and Pickle virus. Again, all are single-stranded RNA except repeatovirus as DNA, double-stranded RNA. Hold on. Okay, so this is here. Rio 
virus is double stranded and parovirus here is single stranded DNA. Uh, naked viral genome infectivity. So purified nucleic acid of most double stranded DNA viruses, except pox virus and hep B virus, uh, and positive stranded single uh, strand single stranded RNA uh, or mRNA viruses are infectious. Okay, one more time. Purified nucleic acid of most double stranded DNA viruses. So all the uh, double stranded DNA viruses, uh, naked viral genome is infectious, right? except for pox virus and heptena. So pox and heptena, besides them, herpes, adeno, parvo, peplioma, peploma, and polioma are infectious. And positive strand, single strand RNA viruses are infectious. So that's all of these. All of these are infectious. Again, that's, I went to a retro toga party where I drank flavored Corona and ate hippie California pickles. Okay. Um, DNA virus characteristics, some general rules all DNA viruses follow. Uh, general rule common uh, are happy viruses. So, hebdena, herpes, adeno, pox, parvo, pep, piloma, and polioma. That's hebdena, herpes, adeno, pox, parvo, papilloma, and polioma. They're all double stranded except for parvo. So, all of these are double stranded except for parvo which is single stranded, uh, have linear genomes, except for papilloma, polioma, and heptena, which are circular and superfoiled, and heptena is just circular and incomplete. Uh, this one is, uh, okay. Then uh, they are ecocedral, except for pox. Okay. And replicates in the nucleus, except for pox. It carries its own DNA dependent RNA polymerase. So think outside the pox, kind of like that. For pox. Uh, Ecocedral, except for pox. Okay, so DNA viruses all replicate in the nucleus except for pox. Pox is outside the box, or like I said, think outside the pox. Well, viral family, envelope, DNA structure, and medical importance. Herpes virus. Uh, it is enveloped, so these little dots that I made are for enveloped. Uh, they represent enveloped. So herpes virus is enveloped, uh, double-stranded, and linear structure. You see herpes virus enter. Okay. <laughs> uh, herpes virus has its own page. So that's its own page. Uh, pox virus, uh, it's also enveloped, double-stranded and linear, largest DNA virus is the biggest one. Uh, smallpox eradicated worldwide by use of live attenuated vaccine. Cowpox, milkmaid blisters, uh, they actually ask about this. Uh, it's milkmaids or like people milking the cows and they got blisters on their hands. So they asked, what is this? It's pox virus. Uh, it's molluscum contagiosum, flesh colored papules with central umbilication. Uh, keratinocytes contain molluscum bonds. So they describe the lesion like this with the umbilication in the middle. So when you see flesh colored papule with central umbilication, think of the uh, teats of a cow. It kind of looks like that. So from that you get cowpox or molluscum contagiosum. Uh, Hebdena virus, right? So that's because hepatitis B. So it is enveloped. Uh, it's partially double stranded but uh, circular. Uh, Hep B, acute or chronic hepatitis, not a retrovirus but has 
reverse transfer case as well, just like a record wires. Uh, adeno wires. Uh, now, so only these three are envelopes, right? So herpes, pox, and heptena. Now, adeno wires, it doesn't have it. So it has reverse transfer case for pox that replicates outside of the nucleus. Okay. Any wires, uh, it's not an envelope, it's double stranded and linear. Uh, Fibra pharyngitis or sore throat, acute hemorrhagic cystitis, uh, pneumonia, conjunctivitis, pink eye. So now you have red throat, red eye, right. and you pee red. Uh, gastroenteritis and myocarditis. So you have something in the lung the heart, the stomach, the eye, the urinary tract as well. God. A papilloma virus, uh, it's not enveloped either. Double stranded and circular. A circular and it's double stranded. Right. Uh, polyoma is also circular and double stranded. So papilloma, it's just human papilloma virus, uh, warts. Uh, it can cause cancer as well, cervical, anal, penile, or, or uh, oropharyngeal. Serotypes are 1, 2, 6, and 11 associated with warts, but serotype 16 and 18 are associated with cancer. So there's going to be a question where they tell you that this person had uh, HPV but it was like type two, but right now they have malignancy. So what is the cause? It's gonna be smoking, not each to you then. Because right? unless it's 16 and 18, it's not, the malignancy is not because of this. It's more than likely smoking the cause. Uh, polyoma, no, double stranded and similar. JC virus, this is the PML one, uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy and immunocompromised patients, for example, HIV. Uh, PK virus, transplant patients, commonly target kidney, uh, JC or junkie cerebrum, and PK for bad kidney. Uh, but remember, JC and PML go together. Uh, parvovirus, it's single-stranded and linear. Uh, and it's not enveloped. B19 virus or slap cheek virus right? or slap cheek rash. Uh, it happens in sickle cell and aplastic crisis in sickle cell disease. Yeah. So slap cheek rash in children, it is not infectiosum or fifth disease. Infects RBC precursors and endothelial cells. Uh, it can cause RBC destruction. Uh, leads to hydrophytalis and death in fetus. It can cause pure RBC aplasia and rheumatoid arthritis, like symptoms in adults. Okay, so hydrophytalis and death in fetus, pure RBC aplasia and rheumatoid arthritis, like symptoms in adults. Okay, so you're done for the day. So flesh curl, uh, colored papule with central umbilication, keratinocyte and contains molluscum uh, bodies. Uh, the buzzwords here that they use is uh, firm, to flesh colored. Around So it's similar to what they said, but this is what I came across. Firm, shiny, uh, round papules.
with sensor indentation. Uh, another thing about this is that it increases HIV risk. Also for this, put it in. And you let's pick a scarier color. You might have seen this word. Um, it happens because of HPV, but not just any HPV. It's the strains six and eleven. So this would be found in things like cervix, vagina, anal canal, and true vocal cords. Right, so type 6 and 11 are warts. They have a predilection for uh, stratified squamous epithelium, which is found in cervix, vagina, anal canal, and true vocal cords. That's why in newborns uh, from a mother who has HPV, uh, a newborn might have it in his uh, throat. There might be this over there. And that's how it ends up there. Right. So... Today we are doing, I'm uh, going to learn about herpes. Uh, herpes virus, there are eight uh, types that we need to know about. Uh, the first one is going to be your herpes simplex virus one, uh, respiratory, so root of transmission and clinical significance. Herpes virus enveloped, uh, double-stranded and linear viruses. Recent data suggest HSV1 and HSV2 can affect both genital and extragenital areas. Uh, okay, so uh, viruses, root of transmission, and clinical significance. Herpes simplex virus 1, uh, uh, root of transmission is respiratory secretions and saliva. Clinical significance is gingival stomatitis or stomatitis. Titus, uh, keratoconjunctivitis, uh, A. Okay. So, uh, so you get, uh, it's everything around mouth or face, right? So it's going to be gingival stomatitis. Keratoconjunctivitis, so like that, 
herpes labialis that's cold source that's the stuff that you get herpetic uh, vitlo on fingers uh, temporal lobe encephalitis uh, esophagitis and erythema multiform right so all of this stuff you'll get there uh, in a question stem they'll give you this stuff probably that they found a double stranded DNA around mouth or something like that and the person was going through some stressful situation because that's when uh, this reappears once it, you're infected right because it uh, it stays in your nerves that's where it gets stored or and stays dormant right so when you get stressed or your immunity goes down that's when the, these appear again uh, or you might go the whole life without knowing you even have it that could happen as well herpetic with low on finger uh, temporal lobe encephalitis esophagitis and erythema multiform uh, notes most commonly latent in trigeminal ganglia this is the place where it stays so this is the nerve that they're gonna be dormant in until some kind of uh, you know body goes through a trauma or something or sickness and then it reappears because of it uh, most common cause of sporadic encephalitis can present as altered mental status uh, status seizures and or aphasia right so this is the most sporadic encephalitis cause of sporadic encephalitis uh, they might give you that as well that this person has seizures can present as ultimate mental status seizures and or aphasia right so they sometimes give you that just to throw you off and you're going to think about a virus and then it's like okay so herpes doesn't do seizures but this one does okay uh, mostly they'll tell you that uh, it's happening in the places where it's trigeminal nerve supplies so trigeminal branches were remember it was uh, ophthalm ophthalmic maxillary and mandibular right those are the three branches of trigeminal uh, then you have herpes simplex virus 2 these are the genital uh, warts that you get uh, sexual contact or perinatal whereas this one was respiratory secretion and saliva these two are the only ones that you would have problem with differentiating all the other ones have like a unique feature to them this one is usually herpes uh, genitalis neonatal herpes most commonly latent in sacral ganglia this one was trigeminal this one is in sacral ganglia uh, it is it does cause uh, viral meningitis as well uh, more common with HSV2 than with uh, HSV1 so you'll get one with uh, neuro symptoms but then you're going to think okay so that's hsv2 but it's going to be this one hsv1 uh, it's happened to me a couple of times so just a heads up uh, yeah just learn how to figure it out let me do it uh, varicella zoister virus hhv3 uh, or also known as chicken pox or shingles uh, okay same thing with shingles it uh, resides in uh, nerves and you don't get it until like you're stressed out or something uh, respiratory secretion contact with fluid from vesicles uh, where is the la zoister uh, chicken pox and shingles so chicken pox is C and shingles is like this uh, this can happen anywhere literally uh, even though it's saying it's uh, dorsal root of trigeminal nerve uh, it, it can show up on your shoulder or your back or you know like that. Um, arms as well I think um, cranial nerve V1 branch involvement can cause herpes zoister ophthalmicus because that's one of those branches uh, whereas this, uh, most common complication of shingles is post herpetic neuralgia so after it uh, I guess neuralgia is painful or you intense typically intermittent pain yeah so it's gonna hurt afterwards uh, Epstein-Barr virus HHV1 uh, 4 
Okay, so that's herpes four, or also known as Epstein Barr virus. We did this, um, like we saw this in Immuno when we were doing the CD markers for B cells, and it was for, uh, this one infects CD twenty one. There was nineteen, twenty, and twenty one, so it's the twenty one that this one infects, like attack interacts with. So. Transmission is respiratory secretions, saliva, also called kissing disease, common in teens, young adults, mononucleosis, uh, this is the one that causes mono, uh, that's why it's called a kissing disease and it happens a lot in like high school students and stuff. Uh, fever, hepatosplenomegaly, uh, so that's the liver, that's the spleen, it's almost as big as uh, the liver. Uh, pharyngitis and lymphadenopathy, especially posterior cervical nodes. Avoid contact sport. Uh, this is uh, important. In the question stem, the kid's gonna have who's suffering from mono or has uh, palpable spleen and liver. They're gonna be asking you, uh, what should the what should you advise this person? Uh, and you should advise them to avoid contact sport like football, American football, probably soccer too. Uh, right, so until resolution due to risk of splenic rupture. Until this is resolved, you can't do that. Associated with lymphomas, for example, endemic Burkitt lymphoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, especially Asian adults, lymphoproliferative disease and transplant patients, Okay, uh, know that, uh, know this, endemic Burkitt lymphoma. So it's associated with Burkitt's lymphoma, right? Uh, they don't ask you about this, but they do ask you about the Burkitt's lymphoma. Uh, even that one is like B-cell lymphoma, one of the B-cells lymphoma. So it's easy to remember that way. Atypical lymphocytes on peripheral blood smears, F. So those are the lymphocytes and they're not your typical lymphocytes. So atypical lymphocytes on peripheral blood smears, uh, not infected B cells, but reactive cytotoxic T cells. So you get positive monospot test. Uh, that is heterophil antibodies detected by agglutination of sheep or horse rabbit receipts. So this is what they're going to say. They're not going to say this because that gives it away, right? So they're gonna say uh, the patient was having this, 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 and then uh, they did a test and the heterophil antibodies detected uh, agglutination of horse RBCs or something. And you're like, what is that? I've never seen that. It's the monospot test. Uh, and it's gonna be positive for this. And it's important to know that because this one it has similar symptoms, CMV but it's going to have a negative monospot test okay so again heterophil antibodies detected by agglutination of sheep or horse rbc uh, use of amoxicillin for example for presumed strep pharyngitis can cause maculopapular maculopapular rash So avoid giving that, I guess, because they're going to think, okay, you have mono, but it's, they're going to think it's strep, right? So they're going to give them ammo, amox. So he comes back two or three days later with a maculopapular rash, and then you screwed up. <laughs> but yeah, so don't do that. Uh, cytomegalovirus, HHV5, so five. So far we did one, two, which were uh, oral and, uh, well, not oral, but like facial and uh, genital. Then three is your shingles and chicken pox. Then four is your Epstein-Barr virus, known for CD21 uh, and mono. CMV is like mono, but not mono. So congenital uh, transfusion, sexual contact, saliva, urine, transplant are the mode of trans uh, transmission. Uh, 
uh, mononucleosis in immunocompetent patients with the monospot test negative. Infection in immunocompromised, especially pneumonia in transplant patients as esophagitis, AIDS, retinitis. Uh, so because of retinitis, you can think of it as cytomegalovirus. And that is actually helpful to remember. Uh, so again, it causes uh, infection and immunocompromise, especially pneumonia in transplant patients. This is also important. A person has had transplant and then he's having, uh, you know, symptoms, and it, it's gonna seem like it's mono, right? But uh, this you got to focus that he had a recent transplant and if he it seems like it's mono uh, It's probably going to be CMV not Epstein-Barr uh, Then hemorrhage cotton wool exudates They might give you that uh, If I think that used to be the buzzword. I don't know anymore uh, Vision loss and congenital CMV This is also we're going to go over this uh, later so that's what's important for CMV. It's one of the torches. Uh, infected cells have characteristic owl eye, intracrine nuclear inclusions, so in G. So that's literally what it looks like. It looks like an owl eye. Not eyes, but owl eye. Sometimes it might look like that. But remember this. Uh, mostly anything that has an inclusion body is going to look like this. So there are like a few inclusion bodies you got to know about. This is one of them. I'll point it out when we come across it again. Right. So this is uh, ovali intranuclear inclusion. So if they just give you a photo like this and they tell you it's a vi virus, uh, uh, they might even tell you that it's envelope double-stranded and linear virus. But if, or they just might tell you it's a viral infection and then they give you this, then just know this because this is classic presentation for CMV. Uh, yeah, they test you a lot on that. Okay. Uh, yeah, latent and mononuclear cells. So now the herpes uh, six and seven. This is your roseola infantum. Uh, it's transmitted uh, through saliva. Roseola infantum. Uh, we'll see what that is. Exanthem uh, subitum. High fever for several days. Uh, then that cause can cause seizures and followed by diffuse macular rash. Right. So the person's gonna have fever and then the fever is gonna get resolved. They're gonna recover from the fever. But then uh, after like three or four days they start getting rash right so start on the trunk then spread to extremities each usually seen in children less than uh, two years old so remember that as well uh, roseola you get the fever first rosy rash uh, later sorry roseola so rose is for okay so ro rash later that's how they did it so fever first, it gets resolved, and then you get the rash. Uh, Self-limited illness, HHV7, less common of roseola. Let's just search it up. So that's what it looks like. Okay, just so you have an idea. So um, the history is very important with this. Uh, they had the fever and then it got resolved and then you get the rash. That's how it's going to be. Water break. Okay. Um,
So I had it here. Six and seven. So rash was there starts on the trunk, does in two years, then spreads to extremities. So it starts on the trunk and then spreads to extremities. That's you're gonna confuse that, so remember this one. Okay, then we have human herpes virus eight, sexual contact, uh, Kaposi sarcoma, nucleos uh, neoplasm of endothelial cells. So, before we go on, just so we know what this one looks like, it's like a little ball, a red ball. Okay, so Kaposi sarcoma neoplasm of endothelial cells. It's seen in HIV, AIDS, and transplant patients. Dark, violaceous plaques or nodules. I sort of looks like shingles, doesn't it? But it's darker. Uh, dark violaceous plaques or nodules representing vascular proliferation. Can also affect GI tract and lungs. So with this, uh, they will give you that, they might give you, I don't know, but they might give you that it's a viral cause and then uh, you have to figure out that it's herpes 8 or Kaposi sarcoma. Okay. It's seen in HIV and AIDS. So that's going to be uh, your question time. The person is HIV positive and then they have this... Uh, these rashes or plaques sorry and nodules appearing on his body uh, that's why it gets tough because shingles happen at those kind of times as well like if you're under stress so okay couple C uh, this is how you identify these are your things that they'll give you so, for the at least these two, they given you. Uh, yeah, herpes simplex virus identification. Uh, how do you diagnose it? Basically, that it's this. Uh, PCR of skin lesion is test of choice, right? Because all of them causes mostly all of them uh, skin lesions. So you can just pick it up from there. So, uh, cerebral spinal fluid PCR for herpes and syphilitis. Uh, t zank tests, they don't do this anymore, uh, so they might not ask you about it. A smear of an opened uh, skin vesicle to detect multinucleated giant cells, like this. Commonly seen in HSV1, HSV2, and uh, varicella zoster virus infections. They stop doing this because it can spread infection. Uh, intranuclear eosinophilic cowdery A inclusion this is another one that you need to know there's a giveaway for herpes uh, also seen in HSV 1, 2 and 3 so let's see what this looks like that's what it looks like So those are your inclusion bodies. It's this one and the allies for CMV. Intranuclear. There's also intranuclear synophilic inclusion. Uh, receptor used by viruses. Uh, for CMV, they use the integrins uh, or heparin sulfate. Uh, for Epstein-Barr virus, they use CD21. We know that now. Uh, HIV, we're gonna do that, but it's uh, CD4, CXCR4, and CCR5. Know this one, it's uh, really they really ask a lot about this one. Uh, Parvo 
virus B19. They use the P antigen on RBC. That's the easy one to remember. Parvovirus B19. That's the slap cheek one, I think. Or yeah, slap cheek virus. So fifth disease. It's called slap cheek because uh, the rash looks like the kid has been slapped. Uh, so parvovirus B19. P antigen on RBCs. Rabies, they use the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Rhinovirus, ICAM 1, because I came to see rhino, see the rhino. Uh, and now uh, this is a new one SARS CoV 2, it uses the ACE 2 receptor. Just need to make sure that that is what I think it is. Yep, angiotensin converting enzyme too. Okay. Uh, RNA viruses all replicate to in the cytoplasm, except retrovirus and influenza virus. Uh, retroflu is out of sight. Okay, so all of these viruses they're gonna replicate in the cytoplasm, except for retrovirus, because this one has its own uh, reverse uh, DNA transcriptase, just like Hep B, I think. Right, so Hep Dina. Yeah, so it has the reverse transcriptase. Okay, and uh, influenza virus. So that one's in nucleus as well. So except for that one, all of these are going to be in there. Uh, at this point, I've done this enough time to have fun with it. <laughs> so it might help you if I, it might. Be. The one I use is So that's the one I use. I ran to Rio with a hippie to pick up Cali with no protection or without protection. That works too. Uh, basically, it says that the enveloped ones are oh, uh, the enveloped viruses are Rio, Pico, that's pick. Hippy is Hippy virus. Kelly is Kelsey virus, right? So ran to or went to. I don't know what else. It does. Oh, it's ran because it's RNA. So that's why. Okay, so yeah, let's do that. Again. So ran is for RNA. Rio. To, with a hippie to pick up Kelly with no protection. So that's Rio, Pico, Hippie, and Kelly. Or Kel Kelly C virus. So all of these don't have any envelope. All the other ones are going to have envelopes. So that works for that. Uh, DNA structure. Uh, every one of them is going to be uh, single stranded except for uh, Rio virus. So and we did that in the beginning as well, right? So double-stranded, uh, linear, and multi-segmented, right? 
uh, the segmented co- segments come in into uh, questions when it's talking about the what this thing comp uh, resortment reassortment sorry right because that's the one which is it yes yeah, segmented you know viruses with segmented you know so reassortment is the one that happens with the segmented ones so okay uh, multi segmented then capsid is going to be ecocedral uh, un- up till retro and then all this one is helical it really doesn't matter if you remember or not the only one that matters is for HIV and we'll do that individually anyways uh, and uh, importance rotavirus important cause of diarrhea in young children okay so if they tell you it's a double stranded RNA then you already know it's real virus right but if they just tell you it's a RNA virus and it's causing diarrhea in young children or a young patient and he's really serious then think about rotavirus uh, rotavirus is you might even know about it it's usually the main reason why a young patient or a young person has diarrhea this is the one it's really common uh, picorna virus so for this one I just have like a try to try it Hopefully you know that's a bird or it's obvious that's a bird uh, okay so envelope no RNA structure single-stranded and it's positive uh, and linear so positive by positive all they're saying it's it's uh, the rotation of it right so it's positive stranded uh, why is that important it's because the positive ones are uh, infectious uh, when it's just naked RNA, right? So positive strand of SSRNA, uh, viruses are infectious, that's it. Nucleic acid with negative strand or SSRNA and double strand RNA. Uh, viruses are not infectious, right? So that's why it's important that you know that, but they don't really test you on that. So all of these are positive up till here, uh, coronavirus, and all the other ones are negatives for arena wires so for this one uh, so the mnemonic for this is perch so a bird perches right uh, it helps me to remember this because it's just how I did it in like first year or like when second year polio wires right so polio uh, it's just the legs represent polio SALK7 wa- vaccine, IPV, OPV. Uh, echo virus, it's just the beak is making an echo. So let me just add that. Right, so uh, rhinovirus, the nose is big, so common cold. 
uh, Coxsackie virus, uh, aseptic meningitis, uh, aseptic meningitis, uh, herpangina, mouth blisters, fever, hand, foot, mouth disease, myocarditis, and pericarditis. So for that, you can just. So that's your hand, foot, and mouth disease, right? And you have HEV, acute viral hepatitis. So this thing also looks like a liver, or you know, just remember that. Out of, because since there are like uh, five hepatitises, you need to know about which one is which. So the first HEV. Uh, hepatitis A virus is in this. It's the acute viral hepatitis, right? Or you know, perch. So P for polio, E for echo, R for rhino, C for Coxsackie virus, uh, known for hand, foot, mouth disease. Uh, also, this one is uh, one out of three reasons you would have a rash on your palm and so. The other two were syphilis type 2 and uh, Rocky Mountain fever, right? Uh, and then H is for hepatitis A virus, also known as acute viral hepatitis. They might straight out ask you which class this belongs to or something. Or, you know, they might give you that it's a RNA virus and then you have to figure out which one it is. Uh, and they're not going to give you these names, they're going to give you viral family names. So then they you will know that it's Coxsackie virus or hepatitis or echovirus or rhinovirus, right? It's quite obvious that it's one of these, but then you need to remember that all of these are picorna virus. Okay. It perches on picorna virus. Uh, then you have hippie virus. Uh, that's easy to remember. Hep E. Uh, no, not enveloped because uh, you ran with a hippie to here. Uh, Ecocedro and Hep E virus, because Hep E virus. Uh, then Kelsey virus, uh, or Cali virus, right? I remember that there's like a Walk nor walkway in California. There's a nor walkway in California, so nor virus. Uh, I remember that that way that nor virus belongs to Cali or Kelsey virus. I just call this Cali virus. I ignore that. Like my grades. <laughs> uh, Flavi viruses. Uh, envelope is. Uh, it's envelope now. All of these are enveloped. Uh, as uh, double stranded, uh, positive strand, and it's linear. Ecocedral. Uh, this one is. Uh, I remember this one because. For this. I use flavored envelope that with mosquitoes inside.
right so flavored envelope because it's flavivirus and it's enveloped and with uh, mosquitoes because mo majority of these are done with mosquitoes right so yellow fever dengue uh, west Nile virus or zika virus they are all mosquito ones right uh, this a is just what is it it's arbovirus arthropod born or mosquitoes or ticks so wherever it's that you're gonna have this low a. not really important but just know that it's this and then inside I see C for hepatitis C so you can just make a sense out of that however you want if it works for you uh, flavored envelope with mosquitoes inside I see right so yeah. hepatitis C virus uh, and the for the mosquitoes it's yellow virus yellow fever dengue West Nile virus and Zika virus okay uh, West Nile virus is meningo encephalitis and flaccid paralysis for this uh, I actually have a note because they ask you like about that so let's just go over it uh, West Nile virus so clinical symptoms you're gonna get this is the one that is major because you can think okay this person has Parkinsonism right but then the uh, history says that there is there uh, it's in like some tropical area like Florida and then they have uh, dead birds around the resort or you know where they live there were many birds that were found dead on the ground uh, it's because they were contaminated or they were infected by West Nile virus so that virus uh, what it causes is uh, fever headache rash uh, maculopapular uh, morbular form and neuroinvasive meningitis encephalitis acute asymmetric flaccid paralysis so because of Parkinsonian uh, symptoms which is rigidity bradykinesia and tremor they give you tremor uh, they also give you rigidity they also might give you some kind of neuro uh, symptoms and you're gonna think this is Parkinsonism and it's gonna be an old person as well so it would make sense for Parkinsonism uh, right but the history of dead birds in Florida that's important to consider and that's why it's West Nile virus because the birds were on uh, are dead because of this virus transmission uh, mosquitoes so that's the vector that's how it gets to uh, people uh, more common in summer and fall warm climates south southern united states states latin america africa uh, risk factors are older age and malignancy and organ transplant so warmer climates like florida southern united states uh, and then you have older age so it's going to be old person they won't give you this because then you're going to start thinking about other stuff as well and they have to give you enough information for you to cross them out so they won't give you that they'll just give you this this easy one so that and they might ask you uh, what does what do they have or what is it okay. so yeah West Nile virus important one out of all of them for dengue you get uh, you know the first one uh, is okay but the second time you have the same strain of dengue uh, you can go into hemorrhagic shock right uh, yellow fever and Zika virus they might just give you that it's one of the viruses in the flabby class and you just need to know which ones of these are in flabby virus uh, Toga virus I forget Zika virus oh right Zika virus is the one where uh, they give you the brain scan and the brain scan I think it's given here somewhere this one right here uh, that's what the brain scan looks like and the ventricles are expanded it's so uh, we'll read it when, when it's called ventriculum megaly so that's for Zika so that's how you get to that uh, I don't remember about 
a little OP word, yeah. I don't think they'll ask that. But they ask about the other four. Uh, Toga virus, uh, it is enveloped, single-stranded, positive linear, ecosedral. They give you a good mnemonic for that, Toga crew. Uh, so chikungunya, remember that it's because of, to it's in Toga virus. You're gonna think that it's in this because it's uh, all the other ones like dengue and Zika and West Nile and yellow fever is here. Uh, and chick chikungunya happens because of mosquitoes, right? And it's co-infection with dengue virus as well. It can occur, but it's not part of levy. It's part of Toga crew. Right, so Toga crew C for chikungunya virus. Uh, R for Rubella, formerly a Toga virus. Okay, so this was known as Toga virus, I guess. Uh, and Eastern and Western equine encephalitis know this and know that it's part of toga crew so chikungunya virus or rubella and eastern and western equine encephalitis uh, and then you have matano uh, metona virus that's a new one okay that's what they mean by pre formerly or two hours. This is a new one. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm trying to think of uh how am I gonna do this? <laughs> it, okay, I got it. I got it. Are you ready for this? Rub it out on the mat. Or rub it on There you go. <laughs> it works. So rub for rubella on mat is maton now virus. Okay. Uh, retrovirus. Retrovirus, I just think of like the 1980s. Right. Uh, 1980s. Uh, it's when HIV was rampant. Uh, so 1980s known as the retro era and then you have HIV and AIDS in, in those times being, you know, rampant in that area of time. So remember, HIV is the most important one uh, in retrovirus. Uh, it is double-stranded and uh, linear. It has two copies. It's uh, ecosedral and conical. But you also got to remember that HTLV or T-cell leukemia is part of it as well. Uh, and retrovirus has reverse transcriptase. So they'll give you that, okay, the virus is found and uh, the virus seems to have uh, its own uh, reverse transcriptase. Uh, and this patient is HIV negative. Then oh, that only leaves two things, right? That leaves, uh, if they give you its retrovirus, never mind, it just leaves one thing. So then it's uh, HTLV, T cell leukemia. But if they don't say that it's RNA, virus but it has reverse transcriptase then it's uh, either T cell leukemia or Hep B because Hep B has its own reverse transcriptase as well so you got to differentiate uh, between the three from the question stem. Uh, coronavirus uh, you should know this one hopefully even though I understand if you're living under a rock because of steps <laughs> but <laughs> coronavirus uh, cold sore, uh, common cold, SARS, COVID-19, and MERS. Right. Uh, this is Middle Eastern respiratory or something. Middle East respiratory syndrome, okay. COVID-19, SARS, common cold. Orthomyxovirus, uh, this is an important one. Since it's the longest well, worded virus out of all of them, uh, it has eight segments to it. Or ortho, you can think that, okay, ortho has eight uh, joints, something like that. But remember that this is the one that has eight segments. They might give you that in the 
question that a virus was found with eight segments. Then you need to know that it's this. Orthomyxal virus. And this is the one with influenza virus. That's the flu, right? Uh, Paramyxal virus, again, enveloped, single stranded, neg uh, negative stranded, uh, linear, and this is non segmented. Helico. Paramyxal virus includes the para influenza for croup. Croup is the one that makes sound. Infection of the upper uh, upper airway, which obstructs breathing and cause a characteristic barking cough. So barking cough, that's the buzzword. It sounds like the patient is barking, right? And and they'll give you that in the question stem that the cough sounds like a bark. So bark and croup. And then you have RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, it causes bronchiolitis in babies. Uh, this one and which one? Pelvi virus. Where's Pelvi bacteria? Just bear with me, I'm trying to recall something. not virus pelvic zoom up uh, RSV F protein so RSV uh, prophylaxis for high-risk infants right so that's what it's used for so for this one that we are doing pelvic virus uh, sorry not pelvic uh, paramyxal virus you give uh, pelvic zoom up the monoclonal antibody something that has pelvi in it okay and measles and mumps right uh, these are important they're tested on a lot measles and mumps uh, how you differentiate it's very easy to differentiate if you know what you're looking for uh, for measles the rash starts on the head neck and spreads downwards And for mumps, it's just uh, go over that again uh, quickly. Rubella, you get post auricular lymphadenopathy as the buzzword. For herpes 6 to 7, uh, 6 and 7, you get uh, the patient is 2 years old and they had a fever and it got resolved and then they started having a rash. Right. Uh, for measles, uh, they give you coplic spot. So if you don't know what that is, uh, it's like a white bluish uh, spot on the buccal mucosa, uh, like that right there. So these things are called coplic uh, coplic spot, and that's. Uh, defining feature or the classic presentation for measles okay they'll give you that the I, I don't know if they do or not but they give you the that there is a rash uh, maybe they give you that it started at the head or neck and then spread downwards but th this is the buzzword for measles right here coplic spot 
for mumps, you have uh, POMP, right? P O M P. That's peritis, uh, peritis, orchitis, uh, meningitis, and pancreatitis. Famnizol, Kawasaki, syphilis too, uh, and Rocky Mountain or rickets, yeah, rickets. Okay, so that's that. Pel Pelvizumab you for RSV, barking cough is croup, croup. That is also, you know, you get inspiratory strider. That inspiratory strider also in. Uh, I just looked at it. Age influenza, right? Uh, so epiglottitis get that in that as well when there is increased intra uh, thoracic pressure you get expiratory strider okay uh, rhabdovirus is for rabies so rabies is part of rhabdovirus family it is enveloped and single stranded negative uh, strand linear uh, by itself naked RNA of this is not uh, infectious that's what that means right so it's helical uh, you need to know what it looks like in a slide. Uh, I guess not slide then. That's the shape of it right, right there. Uh, electron microscope, sorry, not slide. Yeah, so it looks, it literally looks like a bullet. So if you see that on an electron microscope, something like that, that's your rhabdovirus or rabies virus, right? It uses uh, dynine, right, to retrograde movement as well. Uh, then you have phylovirus. I remember this by thinking about, you know, you file old files and by old files it's uh, if you remember Ebola was like in I don't know 20 something so it's, it was old A virus that before like after SARS but before Corona so people were scared of it but now it's filed away so it's in file virus um, Marburg hemorrhagic fever often fatal not too sure about this one, but the Ebola virus I remember because of this virus. Marburg hemorrhagic fever. I haven't come came across a question about this, so not sure. Sorry, uh, arena virus. There are always two people fighting in an arena, right? With an armor on. So two people is for two segments. Uh, arena virus has two segments in it. Uh, fighting in the arena with uh, an armor on. Armor is just the envelope. Right. Uh, and so that's how I remember if they give you that the virus has RNA virus has uh, two segments and it's enveloped, then you know it's arena virus. Arena virus is known for LCMB or lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus and also the uh, Lassa fever encephalitis. It spreads by uh, rodents. Okay, uh, then you have Bunya virus. But uh, this one is important because they do ask about these. They ask about Hunta. They ask about uh, California encephalitis, even sand fly fevers. Uh, Crimean Congo. Is this the one? 
where's this side tracking but I think this is the one in okay it's not in Russia so oh it is in okay oh yeah so it is Ukraine okay if I say Russia and it triggers you I'm sorry <laughs> Okay. Right. Okay. Are you Russian? Okay. Ukrainian. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry if I offended you. Okay. Right. Uh, Crimean Congo. Uh, hemorrhagic fever. Right. Uh, so Bunya you can think of a sandwich that has three buns in it so it's like a three bun sandwich uh, why sandwich because it has sand in it so sand fly fevers it might give you that uh, uh, three because it's three segments and bun because it's Bunya so when you think of sand fly fever, just try to think of these as well along with it. It has a Cali pickle in it. Maybe that will help. With a Cali pickle. Uh, hantavirus, right? So hemorrhagic fever and pneumonia. Uh, hantavirus is was kind of big back then I think uh, and is it coming back I think I heard it in the news sometime ago that hunter virus was found somewhere I don't know if you spend a little time knowing about it then you won't forget about it right so Hantavirus, it causes hemorrhagic fever and pneumonia. So, this thing kind of sounds like it's dengue, right? Because dengue causes hemorrhagic fever. Uh, but a lot of things does, right? Uh, but this one is not transmitted by an arthropod uh, and pneumonia. Okay. So, Delta virus. Uh, this is an easy one. Uh, D for Hep D. So, this is the last one that you needed to know. Uh, it is enveloped, single-stranded, uh, negative strand, circular, and structure is uncertain because it depends on whatever the structure is of uh, HEP-B. That's what the structure will be. So HEP-D doesn't have a structure. So HEP-D is defective, requires presence of HEP-B virus to replicate. Right. So your HEP-A was where? Right here, right? Perch has HEP-A. HEP-B is the DNA virus, hep dena virus. Uh, so you visually see it uh, right there, hep dena virus. HEP-C was your flevivirus, right? Because flavored envelope with mosquitoes inside, I see. Those, so that's HEP-C. And then HEP-D is the Delta virus. Right? So Delta virus is HEP-D. Uh, I'll just go over all these so we remember them. Uh, at least the uh, names. The Rio virus uh, is the Rota virus, uh, RR. So Rio and Rota go together. Uh, then you have the coronavirus, Perch. That's the polio virus, Echo virus, uh, Rhino virus, and Coxsackie, which is the hand, foot, mouth disease, uh, Coxsackie virus, and Hep A virus, right? And then Hep E is just hepatitis E. Uh, Kelsey virus says you have a Norwalk way in uh, California so nor nor virus uh, flevi virus flavored envelope with mosquitoes I see inside so mosquito ones are the uh, yellow fever the West Nile Zika and dengue okay yeah. I'm doing this without looking at it so that's why I'm taking time uh, the yeah right there hep c for that 
uh, Toga virus, you have the chikungunya groups, uh, R for rubella, formerly known, and then you have uh, Eastern and Western equine encephalitis. Eastern and Western equine encephalitis, yep. Uh, then uh, you have rub on the mat, so maton virus and rubella for that. Uh, retrovirus, so you think about back then, uh, HIV was rampant, so this is HIV, and on top of it, it has HTLV or T cell uh, leukemia. Uh, important thing to know about it is that retrovirus has reverse transcriptase, and it is uh, two copies. Coronavirus is MERS, SARS, COVID, common cold. Uh, orthovirus, uh, eight segments. Uh, the most segments you'll see and it's the longest word and it's the flu so influenza virus right under the flu you have uh, paramyxo virus uh, p4 it has measles and mumps and This is the one with RSV, I think. RSV, measles, mump, and I'm forgetting one more. Parainfluenza, right, okay. Uh, Parainfluenza croup. Uh, so barking cough, inspiratory strider. RSV, uh, you give uh, pelvisumab for that. Bronchiolitis in babies, measles and mumps. So paramyxovirus, P for parainfluenza. We have rebdo, again, RR, rabies virus is rebdo virus. It's bullet shaped. Uh, phylovirus is Ebola virus and that fancy one uh, Markberg right Markberg sounds like a beer brand so you drink a beer while you're filing your files <laughs> maybe that way you remember it Markberg hemorrhagic fever it's often fatal uh, arena virus arena virus uh, there are two people with armor on so it is enveloped and uh, it has two segments Right, uh, that's the most important part of it. Uh, and then this one, I don't remember. LCMV, uh, lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus and Lassa fever encephalitis spreads by rodent. Uh, Bunia virus, three buns, uh, sandwich, sand fly fever and river belly or something like that. Uh, then they had the other three. Uh, one was Crimean uh, to Congo. Uh, hemorrhagic fever we remember that now uh, then hunter virus because I looked it up and there was one more California encephalitis right because uh, right sandwich with a Kelly pickle mm. and Delta virus uh, hepatitis D that's easy hopefully that will help you remember all that also this uh, I ran to Rio with a hippie to pick up Kelly with uh, no protection so no protection is for no envelope and ran for RNA to Rio Rio virus hippie virus and uh, picorna virus Kelly uh, virus or Kelsey virus Kelly C virus so all of these four are not enveloped all the other ones are Uh, all of them uh, replicate in cytoplasm except for retrovirus because it has its own reverse transcriptase and influenza virus, right? Flu. So retro flu is out of sight. Okay, so done with that. Uh, negative stranded viruses. Must transcribe negative strand to positive. Uh, Veron brings its own RNA dependent RNA polymerases. Uh, they include arena virus, bunia virus, paramyxovirus, orthomyxovirus, phylovirus, and rhabdovirus. Right. Uh, two segments, uh, three segments. Uh, paramyxovirus uh, is just the, oh crap, I'm forgetting again. The croup, croup, para, para influenza, right. Uh, Measle mumps and R4, RSV. Right? Uh, ortho is influenza, phylo is Ebola, and repto is rabies. So all bring polymerase or fail replication. 
So these ones have their RNA dependent RNA polymerases, right? So RNA dependent, that's RNAs are found outside of uh, nucleus uh, within ribosomes and stuff, right? mRNA. That's why it's outside in the cytoplasm. Uh, which ones aren't? It's retro and, wait, this one isn't either. Okay, so that logic doesn't work then because influenza virus is ortho mix of virus. So besides that one, it works for the others. <laughs> so there, segmented viruses. All our vi RNA viruses, they include Bunia virus. We know that three bonds, ortho, eight joints. Uh, so eight segments, uh, influenza virus. Uh, arena virus has two segments because you know two people with armors and Rio virus has 10 to 12 segments. I kind of missed that one. No, they haven't given it to you. Okay. So real virus has 10 to 12 segments. I don't think we need to remember it this way. We just remember it this way. Just know that it takes 10 to 12 hours to go to Rio. If you don't know where Rio is, that's uh, South America. Wait, that's RIO though. Also, it's a film <laughs> in South America. I'm just trying to make sure that Rio is in Brazil, right? Right, it is Brazil, okay. So it takes 10 to 12 hours to go there from here. All right, okay, Picorna virus. Picorna virus, is, it includes, uh, we already know this, perch polio virus because the bird's leg was up uh, echo virus its beak was opened and it has a beak so rhinovirus coxsackie virus uh, the red dots hand foot mouth disease and uh, hepatitis a virus because the wing looked like a liver uh, rna is translated into one large polypeptide that is cleaved by virus encoded protease into functional viral proteins Polio virus, uh, echo virus, and Coxsackie are enterovirus and can cause aseptic viral meningitis. Okay, so RNA is translated into one large polypeptide that is cleaved by virus encoded proteases into functional. You don't have to remember it. No. This has never come handy in a question. So it's okay if you don't remember that. Uh, rhinovirus. A picorna virus, non-enveloped RNA virus. Uh, yeah, we know it's non-enveloped because ran to Rio to pick up Cali without protection, right? So pick up was picorna virus. Uh, non-enveloped RNA virus, cause of common cold, more than 100 serologic types, acid labile, and destroyed by uh, stomach acid. Therefore, does not infect the GI tract, unlike the other picorna viruses. Rhino has uh, runny rose. Okay. This one, uh, just know that it's the common cold. So you'll have a question stem that's just gonna say that, like the person has been. It's a uh, summer season or it's uh, changing of season, and this person is feeling. Uh, running nose but doesn't have like many other symptoms like fever or anything like that uh, and that's all you need for common cold right uh, and then they will ask you uh, what type of RNA class family is it belong to so rhinovirus uh, it is acid labile uh, Destroyed by stomach acid, therefore does not infect the GI tract, unlike the other coronaviruses. Uh, rotavirus, a segmented uh, double-stranded RNA virus, a real virus, RR. The only other RR was uh, rhabdo and rabies. So the other RR is rota and real. And it takes 10 to 12 hours to go there, so it's 10 to 12 segments. Segmented double-stranded RNA virus. Oh, yeah, that's also important to remember that when you're going to Rio, you're going as a couple. 
so couple is double so segmented double uh, stranded RNA virus uh, most important global cause of infantile gastroenteritis major cause of acute diarrhea in the United States during winter especially in the daycare centers uh, kindergarten this is why it's popular like not popular but common right uh, United States during winter that's important giveaway uh, especially in daycare centers this is also a giveaway uh, and kindergarten so when they say uh, their kids who are having uh, you know suffering through diarrhea or something and almost all the kids going to the same place uh, same daycare are, are going through it usually when something like that happens you're going to first think about food poisoning right but then they're going to tell you it's not bacterial uh, right so then you're going to go to viral uh, and the viral the first thing you got to think about is rotavirus for at least kids okay uh, if it happens in adults uh, uh, like uh, elderly and uh, age homes uh, it's going to be your seed deficit that you should think about not rotavirus but then if they tell you that it's not bacterial then it's I forget which one but it's not rotavirus the other one it's the Norwalk one I think so norovirus causes diarrhea yeah, so this one is for adults. It's common in adults for diarrhea. And old age home, for kids, it's rotavirus. Okay, so major cause of acute diarrhea in the United States during winter, especially in daycare centers, kindergartens. Uh, villus destruction with atrophy leads to decreased absorption of sodium and loss of potassium. Uh, rotavirus, right out of the anus. <laughs> Uh, CDC recommends routine vaccination of all infants except those with a history of anticipation. Uh, rare adverse effect of rotavirus vaccination or skids. Remember this. Uh, it's basically telescoping of uh, intestine. So I'll just quickly show you what that looks like. So you see how the intestine is going inside of the intestine so that's called telescoping because if you remember the antennas and like old radios and stuff or old tv cables that's how it telescopes right so that's what it is if you pull this out the intestines is probably like up till here so it's going to get pulled out as well just to be thorough This thing right here that's what I was talking about so this thing that's what it looks like then that's what happens to the intestine anticipation okay <laughs> okay uh, history of anticipation rare adverse effect of rotavirus vaccination or skids this one is uh, far-fetched I don't think they ask uh, this for skids they will ask you the mechanism of, of inheritance like is it an autosome or recessive or excellent you know, like uh, influenza viruses uh, hold on let me take a water break Okay, influenza viruses, uh, orthomyx of viruses, enveloped negative single-stranded RNA virus with segmented genome, contain hemagglutinin, uh, binds celly, uh, sialic acid, and promotes viral entry, and neuromanidase, right? I think this is uh, 
factor V and 10, isn't it? Factor 5 and factor 10. Okay. Um, I don't want to spend too much time looking for it. I think it was in here, so. NAD is neuro many days and Himitin, right? Factor of nine and ten. Himitin is NAD. Let me check what NAD is. It makes sense because H influenza <laughs> was for it. That's why I'm just trying to figure out is it that same thing because then it's, you know. Oh god, I forgot the page number I was on. I found it. So, influenza virus. Maybe that's why it's like so similar naming. Okay, so where was I? Right, contains hemagglutinin. Uh, so that was hematin, and this is hemagglutinin, so not the same thing. Uh, binds sialic acid and promotes viral entry and neuraminidase. And that one was NED that did that. Uh, it, so you have to remember the functions of these. So hemagglutinin, it binds sialic acid and promotes viral entry. So hematin gets you inside. And then neuraminidase, it promotes the replication or progeny neuron release. Okay, not replication, it promotes its release, okay. So it helps you escape. Okay, so how are you gonna remember that? Hemagglutinin has in in it, so it gets you in. Uh, we don't talk about this <laughs> uh, we only talk about in in not just in okay and uh, for progeny viron release it has you are so it sends you on your way or you are on your way I guess I don't, just remember that somehow uh, that hemagglutinin promotes viral entry and you are my days uh, promotes progeny beyond release in influenza virus. Okay. Uh, patients at risk for fatal bacterial superinfection most commonly. Sorry. Uh, uh, patients at risk for fatal bacterial superinfection most commonly S aureus, S pneumonia, and H influenza. Treatment support with or without neuraminidase inhibitor, oseltamivir and zanamivir. Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, just let me know if I'm going over time right before it cuts off, uh, in case I'm not aware of it. Thanks. Uh, so. Okay. Most commonly, as aureus. Uh, as pneumonia and H influenza is the bacterial superinfection. Okay, uh, you're at risk of if you have influenza. Okay, uh, treatment supportive with or without uh, neuraminidase. So, days is something that cleaves something else. Uh, so something else would be the, what ha the name is in front of it. So this one would cleave this, so it prevents the release of progeny viron. Right. So. That's probably what the mechanism of action is of this neuraminidase inhibitor. Uh, 
for example, uh, oseltamivir and zanamivir. Okay. So that's their mechanism of action. Uh, hemagglutinin lets the virus in. And here are many days away. In the days, okay. Sends the virus away. Uh, reformulated vaccine, the flu shot, contains viral strains most likely to appear during the flu season due to virus rapid genetic change. Okay, so it contains viral, shot, uh, viral strains most likely to appear. So they've predicted uh, right, so during the flu season due to virus rapid genetic change. Killed viral vaccine is most frequently used. Uh, live attenuated vaccine contains temperature sensitive mutant that replicates in the nose but not in the lungs in the lung administered intranasally sudden shift is more deadly than gradual drift so what does that mean uh, genetic or antigenic shift infections of one cell by two different segmented viruses right so this is one cell with two viruses so Infection of one cell by two different segmented viruses, uh, for example, swine influenza, human influenza viruses, uh, will lead to RNA segment assortment, remember, uh, which would then cause dramatically different virus to form. Uh, and this is the genetic shift. So this can lead to major global outbreaks or pandemics. Uh, the genetic antigenic drift, this is uh, just random mutation in hemagglutinin or neuroamenidase genes, uh, which leads to ma minor changes in HA or NA protein. Uh, drift occurs frequently, which leads to local seasonal outbreaks and it causes epidemics okay. uh, drift is less dangerous and shift is more dangerous uh, that's what the question is going to ask rubella virus uh, um, metona virus causes rubella formerly called german 3d measles also toga virus <laughs> Uh, fever, post-auricular -auric and other lymphadenopathy. So that's your buzzword right there. Post-auricular and other lymphadenopathy. Uh, fever, arthralgia and fine maculopapular rash. Uh, if, it, if you know it's rash, if they give you this, uh, you know it's going to be one of these that we're going to do. Right? That starts on the face and spreads centrifugally to involve trunk and extremities. Causes mild disease in children, but serious congenital disease, a torch infection, congenital rubella findings include classic triad of sensory neural deafness, cat cataracts, and patent ductus arteriosus. Blueberry muffin appearance may be seen due to dermal extramedullary hematopoiesis. Right. Okay, so causes uh, mild in disease in children but serious congenital disease congenital rubella findings include findings include classic triad of sensorineal deafness cataract and pain ductus arteriosus uh, they don't really give you that uh, for rubella and torch uh, for rubella it's something else ruby earrings oh yeah okay they do give you that then I remember the mnemonic for that, so they should have given that here. But they do give you this blueberry muffin appearance, so it looks like a muffin or blueberry muffin, something like that. Uh, this is also buzzword, so they might give you that. But this thing is usually for a newborn that they give you because it's congenital trubula, right? So this is only important for a newborn. It won't work if the patient is a little older. So for that, you need to know about this post-auricular and lymphadenopathy and the blue marine 
blueberry muffin is also for the newborn okay so then pyramix of virus this was p4 para influenza right yes uh -huh. i'm remembering it now can cause disease in children they include those that cause para influenza or proof that's inspired tree strider uh, mumps oh this is a uh, barking cough by the way barking cough is different than the whooping cough whooping cough is by uh, bordetella pertussis right there's uh, d tap or tap d uh, conjugated vaccine for that uh, for pertussis so crew mumps measles and uh, respiratory syncytial virus or rsv and human metanema viruses virus all subtypes can cause respiratory tract infection bronchiolitis pneumonia in, in infants all contain surface f protein which cause respiratory epithelial cells to deform to fuse and form multinucleated cells pelvizumab monoclonal antibody against f protein uh, we, i went over that uh, monoclonal antibody against F protein that's what it is the mechanism of action it prevents pneumonia caused by RSV infection in premature infants so palvizumab for paramyxoviruses uh, prophylaxis in preemies uh, so I told you about my neighbor her name was Palvi and she was a kid and she suffered from RSV so it works out like that it's a pyramid of virus prophylaxis and a preemie uh, acute laryngotracheobronchitis also called croup caused by para influenza virus says uh, virus membrane contains hemagglutinin binds sialic acid and promotes viral entry we know that about glutenin and neuroaminidase so days is uh, it cleaves the cell uh, wall or whatever uh, it promotes progeny viron release by that antigen results in a seal like barking cough and inspiratory strider okay that's the buzzword for this or they even use seal like cough Uh, see like barking cough they actually use that uh, narrowing of upper trachea and subglottic uh, subglottis leads to characteristic steeple sign on x-ray okay. so like that I don't know if they give you this or not but they will definitely talk about this but if they do, then you'll see something that's, you know, narrowing as it goes upwards. So that's called the steeple sign. Uh, measles, measles viruses. So usual presentation involves prodromal fever with cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis, then eventually coplic spots. This is the buzzword. If they want you to answer measles, they will definitely give you this. So they might not say complex spot, but they will say bright red spots with blue or white center. Right, so that's what we already looked at it, but that's what it is. Uh, okay, so red spot with blue white center on Pacamicosa, followed one to two days later by a maculopapillary rash that starts at the head and neck and spreads downwards. Lymphadenitis with uh, Warthin, Finkelday, giant cells, fused lymphocytes in a background of paracortical hyperplasia. Possible sequelae, subacute sclerosing pen encephalitis, personality changes, dementia, autonomic dysfunction, death, which occurs years later. later. Uh, also encephalitis, one in 1000. Symptoms appear within few days of rash giant cell pneumonia rare except in immunocompromised 
see all of this uh, is okay to know but as soon as you see brighter spot with the white center on Pakomikoza, none of this matters right none of this matters when you see this so that's the buzzword so I'm not going to spend too much time knowing that it's still even though I probably read it before it feels like this is the first time I'm reading it okay so the four C's of measles cough coriza conjunctivitis and coplic spots uh, vitamin A supplementation can reduce morbidity and mortality from measles uh, this is important know that uh, they'll be like uh, this person has this uh, what kind of vitamins would you recommend this person to this person right so you're going to recommend vitamin A because vitamin A supplement can reduce morbidity and mortality from measles particularly in malnourished children pneumonia is the most common cause of measles associated death in children mumps uh, it causes pumps, right? Uh, uncommon due to uh, effectiveness of MMR vaccine, right? It's not a common anymore because of the MMR vaccines that are that we give. Uh, symptoms: peritis, right there. Uh, orchitis, that's inflammation of the testes. Uh, meningitis or aseptic meningitis, and pancreatitis. So it can cause uh, sterility, especially after puberty. Okay, so that's why this is not that great because this can lead to sterility. Mumps make your paratic glands and testes go big as pom poms. If you don't know what pom poms is, it's uh, what cheerleaders use. Or that, okay. I don't know these were called pom-poms. I remember the ones that cheerleaders use, right? These things. Like that one. So if that helps, remember it that way. Uh, arbovirus transmitted by Aedes mosquitoes. So these are the flaviviruses, right? Uh, no, these are the flaviviruses. This one is uh, Toga virus. Right. Uh, chicken gunia virus, an alpha virus membrane member of Toga virus family transmitted by Aedes mosquito. S uh, systemic infection that produces inflammatory polyarthritis that can become chronic. Other symptoms include high fever, megalopapular rash, uh, headache, uh, lymphadenopathy, hemorrhagic manifestations are uncommon. Uh, versus dengue fever diagnosed with RT-PCR or serology no antiviral therapy and no vaccine okay so uh, what chikungunya if you don't know is uh, when they say inflammatory polyarthritis what this leads to the presentation is going to be that the person doesn't bend his joints so it's he's going to seem like he's constantly contracted uh, extended arms extended hands uh, extended legs even and like feet knees everything so even if he's sleeping he's gonna be sleeping like he's contracted or even when he's standing he's gonna move without uh, like using his joints like very minimal use of his joints because as soon as he uses the joints it's gonna hurt a lot so that's what chikungunya is known for so that's what the presentation is gonna seem like uh, the hemorrhagic manifesta mes manifestations are uncommon, right? So you don't get that too much uh, versus dengue fever. Again, dengue fever is just uh, the first infection is not going to be as serious, but the second infection by the same strain is really serious. Uh, if it's a different strain of uh, second time, it's not going to be serious. Uh, you diagnose it with RT-PCR. Okay, 10 minutes. Uh, okay, I'll just take a break because I want to take a break right now. And I'll just send the link after like 5 to 10 minutes. See you guys then. We just did chikungunya virus. 
So now I'll do the dengue. Uh, important thing to remember about chikungunya is this uh, signs and symptoms. Uh, the joints hurt a lot, so they're not gonna use their joints much. So they're gonna be stiff or seem like they're constantly contracted and movement as well. Right. Uh, they're not gonna have hemorrhagic manifestations like dengue. Uh, it's part of Toga virus and alpha member, alpha virus. Uh, dengue virus, a flevi virus transmitted by Aedes mosquito, most common uh, mosquito-borne viral di disease in the world. Right, so dengue virus, a flevi virus transmitted by Aedes mosquito, most common mosquito-borne viral disease in the world can present as dengue fever, fever, rash, headache, myalgia, arthralgia, and neutropenia. These are all important, but the most important one is uh, DIC, right? So, uh, so you, and uh, for this, uh, the presentation is uh, jaundice, I think, as well, we'll see. So it can present as dengue fever. So that is fever, rash, headache, myalgia, arthralgia. If you have a uh, rash and it hurts, this is what you're gonna think of, right? A rash, fever, and it uh, the joints hurt, uh, or bone pain even, uh, and neutropenia, okay. So dengue, hemorrhagic fever, dengue fever plus bleeding, and plasma leakage through due to thrombocytopenia an extremely high or low hematocrit right or dengue shock syndrome plasma leakage leading to circulatory collapse diagnosed by pcr or uh, serology so this thing right here thrombocytopenia that happens uh, because of dic right uh, what happens is uh, i think they go over it so let's just Uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever is most common in patients infected with a different serotype after the initial after their initial infection due to uh, sorry dengue hemorrhagic fever is most common in patients infected with a different serotype after they uh, after their initial infection so that's what they're saying uh, is uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever is more common in patients who are infected the second time right patients infected with a different serotype after their initial infection due to antibody dependent enhancement of disease okay okay so well uh, first time they get infected uh, it's gonna be like a say strand a right and then the second time they get infected, it's going to be strand B. So for strand A, you have developed antibodies that work on it. So if you get infected with strand A again, you're safe. You won't have the hemorrhagic fever. But if you get infected by strand B, um, that's when you get uh, the hemorrhagic fever because the antibodies are meant for strand A, but the strands are going to be similar, but not the same. So that's why... Uh, your immune system goes haywire and that causes uh you know uh what immune what does immunity do we went over it right macrophages neutrophils and all that stuff get sent to it chemotaxis happens leukotrienes and all that stuff so that's why you get neutropenia because they, they're being used up now uh you get that and wherever neutropen uh you have neutrophils you have inflammation as well so inflammation causes what uh plasma permeability increases there right so because of plasma permeability or in the vessels uh, what's going to happen uh, you're going to bleed out of those vessels and that's how you get the hemorrhagic fever it's not that you bleed out outside it's going to be internal bleeding that's why it's uh, dangerous and 
since there's no blood uh, like the blood is uh, volume is lower in the vessels itself you go into shock okay so that's how that works uh, presents similarly to chikungunya virus and is transmitted by the same mosquito vector as well because it does cause uh, arthralgia uh, bone pain joint pain myalgia body pain head pain <laughs> uh, right so uh, in chikungunya it's mostly this stuff myalgia and arthralgia right uh, Chikungunya virus and is transmitted by the same mosquito vector, the Aedes mosquito. Remember that it's Aedes, uh, not Anopheles. Right. Uh, Co-infection can occur. Uh, dengue virus is more likely to cause neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. Uh, if you remember thrombocytopenia, oh, we haven't done it yet. It's just because um, all the platelets are uh, trying to fill up all the spots right so all this leakage of blood is gonna uh, the platelets are gonna try to stop that leakage to you know so everything uh, all the platelets are going to be used up that's why you have some thrombocytopenia as well uh, hemorrhage shock and death Uh, okay, where was I? Dengue virus is more likely to cause neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, hemorrhage, shock, and death. Live recombinant uh, vaccine uses yellow fever virus as a backbone into which the genes for the envelope and pre-membrane proteins of dengue virus have been inserted. Okay, so the there is a vaccine, but it is uh, really expensive to make it so it's not available to general public or on uh, demand even um, in some places so uh, the way they treat it is symptomatic uh, they give them you know ORS uh, and plenty of fluids because that's all you can do and then they just treat the other stuff that they can and have medicine for so live recombinant vaccine uses yellow fever virus as a backbone uh, we're gonna learn about that into which the genes for the envelope and pre-membrane proteins of dengue virus have been inserted so yeah uh, I know in India they don't have the vaccine uh, I'm not sure about here in US but uh, in India they just plenty of fluids and that's how you treat the symptoms right uh, you just gotta uh, hold out until your immunity catches up to the disease um, which takes anywhere from like a week to 14 days so if once the person survives like 14 days if he's not being treated uh, then the danger is gone but those uh, that period of time is critical for that patient uh, yellow fever virus, a flevivirus, also an arbovirus transmitted by Aedes mosquito. Uh, viruses, virus has monkey or human reservoir, flevi, uh, flevi yellow jaundice, right? Or yellow for yellow virus. And our mnemonic is, again, flavored envelope with mosquitoes inside, I see. Symptoms for yellow fever is high fever, black vomitus. So that would be the buzzword here because nothing else causes black vomit besides burn, I think. No, just this one uh, black vomitus, jaundice, a hemorrhage, and backache may see councilman bodies uh, these are also inclusion bodies or i think so eosinophilic apoptoic globules that's what it is on liver biopsy so we'll see this in uh hep as well so that's what it looks like
So this thing right here is the councilman body. That little thing, that little thing. Okay. Uh, even though you're seeing this, I don't think in the question it really helps if you, if they just give you this. So they're going to give you more than just that. Uh, give me a sec. Uh, so they'll give you more stuff than just council and bodies or a photo of just this. Uh, they will definitely give you this because this is the buzzword for yellow fever, I guess. Okay, Zika virus. Uh, recall to the time we were doing Zika virus. Uh, Zika virus is part of, again, flavivirus, right? Just making sure. Yep. So, I told you this photo is of uh, ventricolo migali, so we'll read about that. A flavivirus most commonly transmitted by Aedes mosquito bites uh, causes conjunctivitis, low grade pyrexia, that's just fever, and itchy rash in 20% of cases. Outbreaks more common in tropical and subtropical climates. Uh, supportive care and no definitive treatment. Uh, diagnosed with RT-PCR serology, uh, sexual and vertical transmission occurs in pregnancy can lead to ma uh, miscarriages or congenital Zika syndrome. This is a brain image shown shows a uh, ventriculomegaly subcortical calcification. Clinical features in the affected newborn include microcephaly, ocular anomalies, and ab motor abnormalities. Okay. Uh, for this, it's going to be in a young patient, probably. And uh, they're going to show you a picture of a brain scan, right? And you will definitely make out that the ventricles are big, right? And that only happens in Zika virus. There are other reasons why a ventricle might have space, uh, but it's not gonna be as big as this. Anyways, so Zika virus, they'll tell you that if, uh, the patient is from like uh, Florida or something, right? Tropical or subtropical climates. That. So when you see this photo, none of this matters, but microcephaly, ocular, because that happens in many things, this happens in many things, and this happens in many things. So you can't really differentiate it out of, with, from the others, but this will definitely do that. Rabies virus, uh, bullet shaped virus. Hold on, I'm just, I just got a message from my mom. Just a second. Rabies virus, so that's bullet shaped. Uh, they will give you an electron image of this, electron microscope image of this, and you should know what it looks like. Uh, I think I also came across an image like this, but probably got that one wrong. <laughs> uh, but this one is pretty easy to make out. So, bullet shaped virus, uh, 
negri bodies, a cytoplasmic inclusion as well. So there's another inclusion body. Let's see what that looks like. So it's just a thing with other things inside. So inclusion bodies, sort of. So I guess this is going to be the popular image. So it's something like that. Cytoplasmic inclusions commonly found in Purkinje cells of cerebellum and hippocampal neurons. Rabies has a long incubation period, weeks to months before symptoms onset. Post exposure prophylaxis is wound cleaning plus immunization with killed vaccine. Right. So if a patient comes with a stray dog bite, right. Uh, you do this anyways like you don't know if he has rabies or not but you clean the wound and then you humanize them with killed vaccine and rabies immunoglobulin because your immunity will kick in faster than this one takes over so as soon as the immunity kicks in and you have antibodies then when this like starts showing up out of out, out of the neurons um it's going to attack it so example of passive active uh, immunity travels to the CNS by migrating in a retrograde fashion. That's dining. Almost everything is dining retrograde fashion. Uh, up nerve axons after binding to ACH receptors. Uh, progress of disease. Fever, malaise, uh, which leads to agitation, photophobia, hydrophobia, and hypersalivation, uh, and paralysis, and coma, and death. The main thing out of all this is these two, are these two, uh, photophobia and hydrophobia. This is going to be the major thing. And in United States, the infection more commonly from bat. Bat is the leading cause of rabies in the United States. Uh, bat, raccoon, and skunk bites that from then th from dog bites in the United States. Uh, aerosol transmission, for example, bat caves, also possible. This is why it's common, because for bat caves, uh, there are a lot of people going splunking, and they get exposed to you know this method of transmission of rabies because getting bitten by a raccoon and skunk bite you can imagine it's not that common right? but this is very common people go to caves to explore this stuff and just chill out so that uh the there will be like questions about how this guy has you know a parrot as a pet and then he went uh, splunking and then he took a swim in a nearby fresh water uh, he got you know he ate some seafood and all this and then the symptoms he has is that he f he started forgetting stuff he's not responding to his name uh, he's not as active anymore he stays in his room uh, it's because he stays in his room because he has photophobia and they'll say he does and they might even tell you that he has hydrophobia so as soon as you see the word hydrophobia think rabies and the culprit is bad right if it was a liver fluke and cholangiocarcinoma or something like that or that it's going to be the snail because and that happens from the freshwater swim Right. For that, you, they, they won't give you this word, hydrophobia. Also, if you haven't seen the video, 
of what this is like, you should. It's you won't forget it if you see it on YouTube. So that's why rabies is very dangerous. If it's not treated in time, people can die. Like you have to get ahead of uh, this time period right here, weeks, two months before it becomes, you know, obvious. You have to have your immunity built before that. Uh, Ebola virus, this is the phylo virus. Uh, you know, phylo and you drink beer, so that was Marburg something. Marburg hemorrhagic fever. If I uh, following an incubation period for up, up to 21 days, presents with abrupt onset of flu like symptoms, diarrhea, vomiting, high fever, myalgia, can progress to DIC, uh, diffuse hemorrhagic and shock. Hemorrhage and shock. Uh, this is the virus we thought would be like corona, but in like North America it wasn't that big of a deal they got it under control it was I think big in Africa though the, it was widespread there uh, it can progress to DIC this is why it was very dangerous people were bleeding through their eyes and stuff diffuse hemorrhage and shock diagnosed with RT-PCR within 48 hours of symptom onset high mortality great Transmission requires direct contact with bodily fluids, fomites, in, including dead bodies, infected bats, and primates. So this is similar to how corona was at the beginning, right? Infected bats, not this, uh, infected bats or primates, but they do say that it came from, you know, China because they eat bats and like dogs and they had it or something like that it's rumored so it's not officially my word is not official <laughs> primates apes uh monkeys high incidence of healthcare associated infection supportive care no definitive treatment vaccination of context strict isolation of infected individuals and barrier practice for practices for healthcare workers are key to preventing transmission. Uh, there is a question, not for Ebola, but just generally, they would ask uh, for this kind of infection, what kind of protection would you have? So in some you would have gloves, in others you would have face mask and gloves, in others you would have the whole, you know, PEP. Uh, so for this one, it's uh, infected strict isolation and barrier practices so barrier practices would be the full one uh, okay so they added the spike protein for this stuff uh, so severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 this is COVID-19 sorry uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a novel positive single-stranded RNA coronavirus and the cause of the COVID-19 pandemic. Clinical course varies, often asymptomatic. Uh, symptoms include common, uh, common it was fever, dry cough, shortness of breath, fatigue. Uh, more specific was this, anosmia. There was loss of smell, uh, juicia, discusia. Not sure how you spell that, but altered taste. Uh, I guess gastric, so it's going to be something like that. So, guess, yeah. Uh, complication include, uh, complications include acute respiratory distress syndrome, hypercoagulability, uh, which leads to thrombotic complications including cryptogenic and or ischemic stroke shock organ failure and death risk factors for severe illness or death include increasing age shortness uh, strongest risk factor okay so this is the strongest risk factor 
uh, risk factor for severe illness are that include uh, increasing age, obesity, so all the comorbidities, uh, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, CKD, severe cardiopulmonary illness, right? Uh, so on top of this, and if you had this, and also if they had diabetes, uh, they also had the mucormycosis infection as well. That was also, you know, happening during this time, at least when I was in the wards. Uh, diagnosed by NAT, most commonly RT-PCR. Uh, tests detecting viral antigen are typically less sensitive than NATs. Or is, that's why you do NAT. Uh, or RT-PCR is most common for, for that. Uh, but can be performed rapidly and may be more accessible. Those are the, the 15 minute ones. Or, you know, the nose nasal swab and then you do the buffer and the stick test. But this one takes around a day or two to get the results. Uh, spreads through respiratory droplets and aerosols. Host cell entry. The thing is, uh, with this, you really have to get it right the way you do it. Because uh, there, there are high chances of human error in doing this test. So that's why this one is more effective than this because even if there's like a few molecules of the COVID uh, it picks up, you'll get it. But in this, you need like a certain amount. So if you only do like a outside of the nose and it's just newly infection, a new infection, then you it's gonna be at the back of the throat. So you're not gonna pick it up as much. That's why some people would have like a negative this and then positive RT-PCR. And for until this comes for two days, the person is going to be walking around and spreading it. Uh, spreads through respiratory droplets and aerosols. Host cell entry occurs by attachment of viral spike protein to ACE2. That's angiotensin converting enzyme 2 a receptor on cell membrane. Uh, Anti-spike protein antibodies confer immunity. Okay. Vaccination uh, induces humoral and cellular immunity, which decreases risk of contracting or transmitting the virus and prevents more serious disease, hospitalization, and death. Supplemental oxygen and supportive care remain the mainstay of therapy for hospitalized patients. Dexamethasone remdesivir and uh, interleukin-6 pathway inhibitors may benefit from uh, benefit some severely ill patients I remember when this came out in India there's a choreographer named uh, Remo D'Souza and the general public couldn't had a hard time saying this so they would just call it Remo D'Souza vaccine <laughs> it was very funny uh, all my folks in from India they probably know about that uh, okay so now we're gonna do hepatitis I'm uh, not going to spend too much time on this because I haven't came across any questions of these if they do it's just gonna be very basic so know your ACE2 receptors where it goes know about the spike protein uh, and yeah Treatment is, uh, they don't ask for treatment much for this kind of stuff. But yeah, if you see anosmia, it could be two things, right? It could be either COVID or Kalman syndrome. Uh, that's the buzzword for Kalman syndrome, anosmia, but even for this now. Uh, hepatitis vir viruses, signs and symptoms of all hepatitis viruses. Uh, Episodes of fever, jaundice, increase in ALT and EST, naked viruses, HIV and HEV, uh, lack of envelope and are not okay. Lack of and lack. Oh, sorry. Naked viruses, HIV and HEV, lack an envelope and are not destroyed by the gut. The valves hit the bowels. That's convenient. Uh, 
okay so uh, hepatitis B virus DNA polymerase has DNA and RNA dependent activities uh, upon entry into the nucleus the polymerase uh, completes actually I have a note for that so this thing talks about it So, upon entry into the nucleus, right, so partial viral DNA enters the nucleus, the polymerase completes the partial double-stranded DNA. So, this is the polymerase, uh, this is the bacterial polymerase. Uh, once it's in the nucleus, it completes the partial double-stranded DNA. Uh, host RNA polymerase. Uh, transcribes the mRNA so now the host RNA polymerase is going to transcribe the mRNA and then it's going to leave the because mRNA is the one that leaves the nucleus right everything before that is happening inside of the nucleus so host RNA polymerase transcribes the mRNA from viral DNA to make viral proteins to make this it goes outside the nucleus the DNA polymerase then drivers transcribes viral RNA Right, so this is the bacterial DNA polymerase uh, and it transcribes the viral DNA again right. Wait, is it the bacteria? the DNA polymerase then reverse transcribes viral RNA to DNA okay uh, which is the genome of the progeny virus Okay. Uh, I don't think it's important to know if this is a host or bacterial. But anyways, so once you have viral DNA, this is the progeny, right? So now this can get released, and then it's gonna start again. Now you have the viral DNA over here. This is the partial, but this is the complete one. So it's gonna do the same process though, and that's how it spreads. So one more time. Hep B DNA polymerase has DNA and RNA dependent uh, activities. So that just means it's, it's dependent on both of these things. Uh, upon entry into the nucleus, uh, the polymerase completes the partial double-stranded DNA, right? So when it gets in here, enters the nucleus, then the bacterial polymerase makes uh, in the nucleus uh, completes the partial double-stranded DNA. So, upon entering the polymerase completes the host RNA polymerase uh, transcribes the mRNA. So the host RNA polymerase will transcribe the mRNA from the viral DNA to make viral proteins. So now it's going to make from viral DNA. That's the viral DNA. So this is still considered the viral DNA. Okay. To make viral protein. The DNA polymerase then reverse transcribes the viral RNA to DNA, which is the genome of the progeny virus. So this is important. They test you on this and your understanding of this whole process. So that's why I spent time on that. Uh, if you need to take a few more seconds to understand it. Okay, I got it. So you know how Hep B uh, replicates inside it, right? Because pox virus is the only one out that you think outside the pox. So everything else is inside. So Hep B replicates inside. So that's how they replicate from mRNA to viral DNA, right? So this is going to be the... Nope, I still haven't gotten it. I thought I did. 
the DNA polymerase then tra- reverse transcribes viral RNA to DNA. So I, does it go back into... Oh yeah, so it, this is this then. Because it has to go back into a nucleus to make the DNA. Because that's the only place you're going to find for DNA polymerase, right? You're not going to find that in the cytoplasm. So it has to go back into the nucleus. Okay. I think we got it. We can move on. Uh, hepatitis C virus, that's the flavivirus, right? Because you flavored envelope inside uh, with mosquitoes and I see whatever. So lacks uh, three prime to five prime exonuclease activity. And this is important. This is why we can't have a vaccine against it. Uh, so that is. This is the polymerase, right? Just a recap of this. Uh, the DNA polymerase three found on viruses or bacteria or stuff like that. Uh, synthesis five three, proofreading is five three, and exonuclease is three to five. So this one doesn't have. Uh, the three five exonuclease activity all right so there's no proofreading ability either because of that because why would it proofread if it can't do anything about it when it finds it so it lacks three prime to five prime exonuclease activity no proofreading ability antigenic variation of hep c virus uh, envelope proteins right so since there is no proofreading ability, it constantly gets mutated, and that is the antigenic variation. So since it keeps getting mutated and mutated, you can't have a vaccine for a strain because like a few days later it's going to be mutated and that vaccine is going to be pointless. Right? So host antibody production also lags behind. That's why uh, if you have Hep C, it's chronic. It's going to be chronic because you, even your antibodies can't keep up with the uh, mutations. So say uh, antibody makes an, an uh, like your immune system makes an antibody against an antigen on the cell surface of the hepatitis C, right? And then uh, a few days later, those antibodies go back to attach to it for the new ones. But now it's muted, so those attachments can't happen anymore. So that's why it lags behind production of new mutant strains of HCV. Important thing here, antigenic variation. That's the buzzword, or that's what they're gonna ask you. Why is HCV chronic? It's because there's uh, no exonucleus activity and no proofreading ability, which is why it keeps having new mutant mutations, and it's called the antigenic variation. Okay, uh, viruses. We already know without looking at these. Let's do that without looking at them. Uh, HAV, where would we find it? The coronavirus. Uh, B, Hebdena. It's a DNA virus. Uh, C, Flavivirus. D is Delta virus. And E is Hepi virus. Right? So E is Hepi, Delta, Flavi, Hebdena, and Picorna. Perfect. Uh, transmission of uh, HAV is uh, fecal oral, selfish, shellfish, uh, travelers, and DNA, daycare. All of these can cause, like, this is where it happens. Uh, that. Uh, incubation is short, clinical course is acute, and self-limiting. It, it, uh, you, it, you usually recover by yourself without doing anything. Uh, it's asymptomatic in children. Prognosis is good. There's no hepatocellular carcinoma risk. Uh, liver biopsy is gonna show you hepatocyte swelling, monocyte infiltration. Again, councilman body here. I told you it's gonna show up here. Uh, and it's absent, no carrier state. So in, was it sickle virus? Councilman body. 
where did we see that? Oh, where was it here? Oh, yellow virus, okay. So yellow fever has the Castleman bodies, and now here as well. Okay, uh, so hepatocyte swelling is what you're going to see. Monocyte infiltration, Castleman bodies, absent, no carrier state. I think there's... They also say that they give you that amino transferase is more than one thousand. There is a robust cytotoxic T cell response. So there is an increase in interferon gamma as well. Because increase in gamma is not only for uh, macrophages, it's also for cytotoxic T cells or CD8 cells. And increase in natural killer cell response. This is for this. So uh, they won't give you this anymore because they don't do that. What they will give you is that there is a robust CD8 lymphocyte response. You'll figure out that it's uh, hepatitis because they give you the, you know, you, pe you can kill the liver. Uh, there is jaundice. There is an uh, increase in ELT, ST. And then they don't give you anything else. Then you're going to think it's hepatitis. And then they're going to explain the biopsy results. Uh, and they could give you biopsy results. But if they just did the blood test, they could tell you that it's robust CD8 lymphocyte response. There is an increase in interferon gamma and increase in NK cell response. Uh, that's how you figure out it's this uh, hepa RNA virus. Uh, no, no carrier state, right? Oh, water break, hold on. Okay, uh, head B virus. Uh, DNA heptanovirus. Uh, just a quick review of what that virus is. Heptanovirus is circular, and it has a reverse transcriptase, and it's uh, it has an envelope, or it has a capsule. Uh, transmission, parenteral. Uh, via blood or sexual uh, so bedroom or perinatal so birthing uh, you can get it any of these ways uh, incubation is long uh, for months clinical course is initially like serum sickness so you have fever arthralgia and rash may progress to carcinoma uh, there is a carcinoma risk uh, prognosis Uh, prognosis adults um, mostly full resolution units uh, this color this has worse prognosis in units okay so in adults it just full resolution most of the time 
but in neonates, there's a worse prognosis. Uh, there is a hepatocellular carcinoma risk and with Hep B. Uh, liver biopsy, granular eosinophilic ground glass, ground, ground glass appearance due to accumulation of surface antigen within infected hepatocytes. Cytotoxic T cell mediated damage. Right, so cytotoxic is again CD8. So that's how you confuse the two. But they might say that there is a monocytic uh, inclusion body. Right, monocytic inclusion body will be your councilman bodies. Uh, that's That should be a clue to that. Uh, they might say there is a ground glass appearance. They don't though. They just expect you to know uh, granular eosinophilic appearance is ground glass. Uh, okay, so uh, and uh, carry state is common, so you can carry it. Okay, uh, Hep C. I was hoping it would finish the virus, but okay. Hep C. RNA flavivirus, uh, primarily blood injection drug use post transfusion. Right, so this is the most common way to get it uh, injection and post transfusion. But apparently, there is like this one other way you can get it, it's not written here, and I don't remember because there's no other way to know it's uh, Hep C unless you know that because. They give you very vague uh, biopsy results and you would think it's hep A but then it turns out to be hep C. Uh, incubation is long. Uh, clinical course may progress to cirrhosis and carcinoma. Right, so majority uh, develop stable chronic hep C uh, and Hepatocellular carcinoma risk is there. Uh, the liver biopsy here is lymphoid aggregates with focal area of macrovesicular stetosis. And this doesn't make sense when you're reading the thing, uh, the question. But let's try to understand what it is. So lymphoid aggregates, that's just uh, lymphoid. So that's lymphocytes uh, together, right? With focal area of macrovascular stetosis. What is that? Macrovascular stetosis is the most common form and is histologic characters by hepatocytes containing a single vacuole of fat filling up to the hepatocyte and displacing the nucleus to the cell's periphery okay okay so that's what it's going to look like that's just stetosis though so so you're going to have lymphoid aggregates with focal areas of macro vesicular stetosis so you're going to have this and then you're going to have so let's just see what that looks like They won't give you a photo for Hep C. I, I promise you that, because I haven't came across anything. What they do give you of is um, HCC. So, let 
design. It looks like RCC, similar to that. I thought, but it doesn't actually look like that. My bad. Okay, so just they do give you a photo of this. Uh, just to recall, you know, so carcinoma. It's just uh, it's like that. So lymphoid aggregates with focal areas of macrovascular vesicular stetosis. If you if there's anything about stetosis or fat cells or lymph uh, lipids or you know adipose or something like that, it's gonna be this. Okay, FC. Uh, no carrier state very common in this. Uh, then you have the D virus. Uh, RNA Delta virus again it's just the same as this right because uh, you need this for this to be active so parenteral sexual and perinatal uh, incubation and super infection uh, HDV after HPV equals short but co-infection HDV with HPV is long why is that it's because uh, when HPV happens uh, they're already your immune system already kicks in for this right so now by the time you get this this thing will be already under control but if you get this and this uh, your uh, immune system is gonna fight this but then it's gonna keep mutating because of HDV right so it's gonna have a long time it's not gonna be like HCV though the mutations uh, clinical course is similar to Hep B virus. Uh, prognosis super infection, which leads to worse prognosis. Right? If you have super infection, it's uh, worse prognosis. Uh, Hepatocellular risk is there because it's there in uh, Hep B. Uh, liver biopsy will be similar to this one. So, ground granular eosinophilic in this. For this one, they usually test you on the complementation uh, process. The whole, uh, they'll tell you that there was a virus that uh, wasn't functional in the research. There was a virus they were testing. Uh, when they put it into a cell, it didn't uh, express. But then they put another virus in the cell as well as this, and then uh, the virus virus A started expressing itself so it's because it was complementation right so HDV and HPV uh, no defective virus depends on uh, hepatitis B uh, HB surface antigen hep B surface antigen code for entry into hepatocyte, hepatocytes okay uh, and then you have HPV virus sorry hepatitis E virus or any happy virus and the transmission is fecal oral especially waterborne uh, incubation is short actually I have three minutes so let me do that okay short clinical course uh, fulminant hepatitis in expectant uh, pregnant patients the question is about uh, Delhi in India uh, the pregnant women they would eat uh, pani puri uh, it's a local thing i don't think they tell you that though <laughs> it's just that i know about that so uh after all the pregnant ladies uh, who went out and had that uh, when they started having symptoms and went to doctor they found fulminant hepatitis and it only showed up in pregnant women and the vignette is just about you know uh india and delhi and they ask you which virus can it be so it's gonna be hep B virus uh, that's the only question I have came across for hep B prognosis is high mortality in pregnant patients uh, there is no HCC risk uh, liver biopsy is patchy necrosis and no uh, enteric epidemic for example in parts of Asia Africa Middle East there is no carrier state 
okay uh let's take a break here so we just finished the hepatitis extra hepatic manifestations of hep B and C. So these were just about what it does to liver, right? So now what happens outside the liver? So hepatitis B, it causes aplastic anemia. Renal, in renal it causes membranous glomerulonephropathy or membranal proliferative glomerulonephritis. And PAN, uh, that's P-A-N. P-A-N is the one with the buzzword that has uh, pearl necklace like, or it looks like ball and chain. Uh, so, poly Right, so they'll give you something like this and they call it ball and chain because you see a little bit of ball and it's connected to it so that's why it's called ball and chain uh, dirty medicine goes over it uh, it's pretty useful for vasculitis okay so in vascular, it's uh, polyarthritis nodusa. Uh, renal, it's membranous uh, glomerulonephritis and membranal proliferative glomerulonephritis. Uh, hematology, aplastic anemia. Uh, for hepatitis C, uh, in blood, it's uh, essential mixed cryoglobulinemia, increased risk of B cell, uh, non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, that's ITP is uh, something thrombotic purpura intermittent I think uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia so it does a lot of things right uh, majority it's gonna call, do this cause uh, well I don't know why <laughs> renal uh, membranal proliferative glomerulonephritis uh, more than more common than uh, membranous glomerulonephritis. Over here, it was membranous glomerulonephritis than that. Right. Uh, in vascular leukocytoplastic vasculitis, uh, dermatologic uh, is sporoidic uh, porphyria, cutanea tarda, and lichen planus. Uh, endocrine, uh, increased risk of diabetes mellitus, autoimmune hypothyroidism. So, this one causes a lot of things, right? Uh, but notice how none of them have uh, any neural symptoms, right? So if you get a question asking about this, which I don't think you will, but if you do, then remember, pick something that's in the hemat or renal vascular or uh, dermat or endocrine, but not, don't pick the one that has a something with neural symptom in it or neural disease in it uh, okay so hepatitis serologic markers and this is important majority of time this is what they're going to test you on when it comes to hepatitis uh, it's this or the liver biopsy Hepatitis serologic markers. Uh, okay, let's start with uh, this one, and then we'll come back to this one. So, hepatitis B surface antigen. These are the antigens or like proteins you find on the surface. So, antigen found on the surface of hepatitis B virus indicates hepatitis B infection. This is the one which, uh, if we see, we consider that it to have the infection right and then anti-HBS is the one that forms against this surface antigen right 
but this one is special because it could happen because of the infection or it could be because of the hep B vaccine right so because uh, vaccine is based on the surface antigen so anti HBS antibodies to HBS antigen indicates immunity to hepatitis B due to vaccination or recovery from infection right so it could be either of these two uh, then we have HBC that's the core antigen so it's the core so antigen associated with the core of hepatitis B virus so if we have antigen for that we gotta have antibody against it right so that's anti HBC so antibody to HBC AG uh, it's IgM for acute uh, and recent infection but then if you have uh, IgG for this it means there was a prior exposure or there is a chronic infection Uh, IgM uh, is anti-HBC IgM anti-HBC may be the sole positive marker of infection during the window period uh, this is the window period uh, prodorm acute disease it's in that uh, and it's like this great thing right no wait it's this thing never mind it's this part my bad so that's the window period right there. Okay, we'll look at it. Uh, so HBEAG, then you have secreted by infected hepatocyte into circulation, not part of mature hepatitis B viron. Uh, indicates active viral replication and therefore high transmissibility and poor prognosis. Okay. And then if you have anti-HPE, there's antibodies to that and it indicates low transmissibility. Okay, uh, well, let's just get this one done with. So you have anti-hepatitis A virus, uh, there's IgM and then you have IgG, right? So if IgM, then IgM antibody to that best test to detect acute hepatitis A. That means it's recent, right? And IgM makes IgG. So if it's IgM, it's early. If it's IgG, it's uh, it's been some time. So IgG antibody indicates prior H, uh, hepatitis A virus infection and or prior vaccination. It protects against reinfection. Okay, so now you are ready for another hep A virus if it comes because now you have IgG. So IgG is for long term. Uh, so the question for this is going to ask you uh, It will just point to something over here like say it's before the antibodies of uh, E is made so maybe like at four weeks or three weeks it's gonna show you somewhere here or even after like HBS is made, but there is no HBE anti HBE sorry, and there is anti HBS so Something like that, I was just show you, and it's gonna ask you, uh, what does this tell us, right? So it's gonna tell us uh, one of these things, but without that, how do we know? So if there is HBS antigen or the surface antigen, and the uh, if we pick up the marker for that, it could be it's uh, in incubation period or prodrome or acute disease period or it can be in the window period, right? Uh, in the window period, we're not gonna see it. All we see is just anti-HBC. That's all, right? It's the only, uh, maybe the sole marker for infection during window period. So not window period, but we'll see it in these two stages. So if we see it, that means it's either acute, not either, that is all that is, right? It's gonna be acute uh, infection. So they have been recently infected with it, right? Uh, and second, if we have uh, anti-HBS, then it's already recovering. Uh, and if it's IgG uh, antibody, then it's already recovered. And and that, uh, you can only say that if there is also anti-HBE. Why? Because if you don't have anti-HBE, right? Uh, then it's considered high transmissibility okay 
so if it's high transmissibility it's just like infectious right so highly infectious is if you don't have antibodies to HPE AG that's what it means and if you do have uh, antibodies to HPE then it's low transmissibility okay uh, HBC is only anti HBC or HBC sorry is uh, important because of the window period because in window period that's the only marker we can pick up right uh, the anti HBC yeah so not HBC but anti so apparently we didn't even pick up the this antigen right but we can pick this one up so yeah uh, give me a second I'm getting a call we're figuring out uh, HPC so as soon as uh, you get infected the first antibody you make against is the core antigen right uh, okay so basically we'll just this is what they test you on but you need to know the, these aspects of this so you can answer this so now we know uh, if you have uh, surface antigen and uh, envelope antigen right HPE antigen that's antibody to HPE it's secreted by the hepatocyte into circulation uh, not part of mature uh, hepatitis B viron uh, indicates uh, active viral replication and therefore high transmissibility and poor okay so it's not in the thing so this means our liver is producing this right so HPE if you see that and if you see this and you have uh, your anti HBC is uh, IgM it's going to be acute because you don't have basically it's going to be acute because you don't have antibody to either of these right then the window period uh, window period is this where you see uh, only H anti HBC right that's all you want to see sometimes you might see this because this one's a little higher the green one so anti HBE and again IgM or uh, anti HBC core antigen uh, antibody uh, then you have chronic hepatitis B uh, this is considered high infectivity when you don't have anti HBE right so if you have HBE antigen right so you have that and you always gonna have this right it just doesn't get picked up in the window period but you have that and then here you have now your anti HBC is turned into IgG right so now it's been some time it's been over uh, the pe window period as well because right? during the window period you have IgM so after the window period it becomes IgG so now it, you're in the chronic part of the thing and infectivity is uh, is considered upon this and this right? so this is high infect infectivity and then the low one is you don't have the E antigen now you have the antibody to it right and then recovery is when you have antibody to the surface antigen so anti HBS plus anti HBE and IgG so that's the everything is you have you're full of antibodies for everything now and that's when the recovery is considered uh, but this is the first time you see it right out of all, the, all of them and that's when the recovery is occurring and if it's just if you're just immunized you're just gonna have antibody to the surface antigen that's it nothing else because that's what the vaccine is for right so this is the surface antigen okay and uh, DNA polymerase uh, DNA E antigen uh, that our liver produces and core antigen is HBC that's it 
No, no, he took me. HIV envelope protein acquired through budding from host cells plasma protein I mean plasma membrane uh, these two are important uh, this is the transmembrane glycoprotein or GP41 and this one is important because it's the docking glycoprotein or GP120 both of these uh, are split from GP160 or glycoprotein 160 okay uh, then you have P17 that's the matrix protein you have p24 that's the capsid protein you have lipid envelope and you have the reverse transcriptase right uh let's read about it now deployed genome uh, two molecules of rna the three structural genes protein coded for so you have envelope the three structures are envelope uh, the gag and paul Okay. Uh, envelope is GP120 and GP41 formed from cleavage of GP160 to form envelope of glycoproteins. Okay, so 160 is cleaved and you get GP120. This is again the docking one. So it a attachment, it like its function is the attachment to host CD4 plus T cell. And GP41 or 41 is the fusion and entry glycoprotein. So that one causes the fusion and uh, entry. Uh, how does it do that? Since it's transmembrane, that's how it does it. So it goes through and through. And yeah, just know the function of these. So they're going to say in the research, there were. Uh, for HIV they were doing there was one protein that was able to transport something from here to here so that would be your GP41 right? or this one that was attaching itself to the surface of this cell so that would be your GP120 it attaches to the host CD T cell right CD4 T cell um, GAG GAG is P24 and P17 capsid and matrix protein respectively so 24 is the capsid and p17 is the matrix if you know the matrix uh, just think that neo was uh, 17 year olds 17 year old in the matrix so p17 and if you remember casper the friendly ghost uh, he was 24 when he became a ghost <laughs> it's stupid but it works so p24 caps it okay uh, then you have the Paul gene uh, you need to knit this one this is the most important one out of all of these uh, structures uh, it has the reverse transcriptase okay uh, integrase and protease so they'll tell you that there's this one structure part of this that's uh, doing the reverse transcriptase and it's uh, cleaving stuff right because that's what the protease does uh, what else can it do so it's integrase that's what it does I don't know what integrase does but that's gonna be it or they'll give you that this is happening this is happening so which gene or which part of the structure is this responsible for so then it's gonna be the paw structure gene right okay so reverse transcriptase uh, synthesizes double-stranded DNA from genomic RNA uh, double-stranded DNA integrates into host genome we already know this a virus binds CD4 as well as a co-receptor either 
remember these on CCR5 on macrophages or the infection or CXCR4 on T cells for late infection okay uh, homozygous CCR5 mutation is so say you have CCR5 right and it's it binds to CD4 as well as co-receptors either CCR5 or CXCR4 right so if it attaches to CCR5 uh, it's able to escape it right but then you have mutation on both of them then you have immunity against HIV right because now it's not gonna if it can't spread its stuff through the transmembrane glycoprotein it's not gonna function like in a virus it's just gonna stay there right so that's why you have immunity for that but then say uh, one of them is uh, mutated and the other one is still functioning right then it's a slower course because eventually like it will keep keep making keep making it and at some point the two strands uh, that it needs like the two alleles it needs uh, are going to match up so it's a slower course that way Uh, so just remember, homozygous uh, mutation causes immunity, heterozygous mutation causes slower course. Uh, HIV diagnosis, diagnosis with HIV 1 and 2, uh, antigen antibody, immunosay. Uh, these immunosays uh, detect a viral P24 antigen, uh, that's the CASPID, right, because CASPID was 24 years old. So P24 antigen caspid protein and uh, immunoglobulin G antibodies to HIV 1 or 2. Uh, very high sensitivity specificity but may miss early HIV disease if tested within first two weeks of infection. Uh, again, but again, that's important line. Very high specific sensitivity and specificity but may miss early HIV disease if tested within first two weeks of infection, right? So you gotta do it after the first two weeks for it to be correct. Uh, viral load tests uh, determine the amount of viral RNA in the plasma. So when they say uh, do it after two weeks of infection, it's not really infection, they're just saying do, one, do it once and then do it two weeks later as well, just to be sure. Uh, viral load tests determine the amount of viral RNA in the plasma and use viral load determined by NAT to monitor effect of drug therapy. Use HIV genotyping to determine appropriate therapy. Okay, uh, we'll look at this after we do this. So Western blot tests, if you remember, Western was for proteins. Uh, so Western blot today tests are no longer recommended by the CDC for confirmatory testing. Uh, we do this instead. HIV 1 and 2 antigen antibody testing. Never mind. We don't do that either. What do we do? NAT? Yeah, we do NAT. And it's somewhere here. Nope. Yeah, right there. So we use NAT. So HIV-1 and 2 antigen antibody testing is not recommended in babies with suspected HIV due to maternally transferred antibodies. Uh, so they might have find antibodies, but that might be from the mother. That's why we don't do it on babies. Uh, use HIV viral load instead. So we use do that instead. Now, uh, AIDS diagnosis is when you have CD count less than 200, right? So CD4 count less than 200 the cells per millimeter cube. Normal is 500 to 1500 or HIV positive with AIDS defining condition. AIDS defining conditions are like pneumocystis, pneumonia. Another one would be mycobacterium avium. Uh, okay. Uh, also, I think cryptosporidium uh, causing severe diarrhea. 
HIV-1 uh, and 2 antibodies and P24 antigen combination immunosay. So, oops. I think my PDF is tired. Okay, so HIV 1, two, 1 by 2 antibodies and P24 antigen co combination immunosay. So we do this, and then if it's negative, then it's negative for everything HIV 1 and HIV 2 antibodies and P24 antigen as well, because that's the one that checks, right? That's uh, this immunosay, it detects viral P24 antigen capsid protein. And the antibodies for HIV one and two, so negative for HIV one and HIV two antibody and P twenty four antigen. This is not what they're gonna. Oh my God! I think it's me pressing on it. For the third time, I won't press on it now. I'll stop touching. No. Okay. Uh, so if it's negative, uh, they're not going to ask you that this stuff what they're going to ask you is that they found uh, they did a test and it was positive but then when they uh, did the differentiation uh, immunosay uh, what they found was that it was negative for HIV1 so what is it so apparent I saw like there was like you know how they give you the percentage of uh, many people didn't know that there is something called HIV2 so they picked something different so if this is positive but negative for HIV1 it means uh, they have HIV2 right so if you have positive for HIV1 but negative for HIV2 then HIV1 antibodies are detected if it's negative for one and positive for two, then you have HIV two antibodies detected. And if you have uh, positive for one and two, then an HIV antibodies are detected. And then you have HIV one negative or intermediate indeterminate, and HIV two negative. Then you do the NAT test, right? HIV one NAT, okay. And then you do HIV one NAT. Uh, and you'll get either HIV-1 net positive, so you have acute HIV-1 infection. That's why it's not being picked up. I, you did it within the two-week uh, time, right? That's why. Or you have HIV negative net as well, so it's negative for HIV-1. But it could still be HIV-2 then, because you didn't do it for that. Positive indicates reactive test results. Negative indicates non-reactive test results. Net is nucleic acid amplification test. Okay, so we don't do Western blot. We do HIV one and two antigen antibody testing, and to confirm the findings of these, if it's still confusing, we do that. Okay. Uh, and how does NAT work? It uses viral load. How does immunosay work? Uh, it checks for viral P twenty four antigen capsid protein, and you know. Uh, it checks for antibodies against HIV-1 and 2. Cool. Next. Uh, time course of untreated HIV infection. Okay, so... Uh, time course. So we have, starting over here, uh, month zero, all the way up to 11 years. And we have CD count. City count. Uh, CD count for normal people is between 500 and 1500 right so sorry uh, okay so this blue part is the window period then this pink part is uh, with or without acute HIV infection positive or negative acute inf HIV infection viral dissemination seeding of lymphoid organs and then you have clinical latency, uh, skin and mucous membrane infection over here. And then you have severe immunodeficiency or AIDS defining illnesses over here. For this one, it's going to be below 400. Okay, so 
what are we looking at? We're looking at the blue line, which is HIV RNA. We're looking at the red line, which is the CD count or CD T cell. The purple line is the CD8 T cell and the yellow line is anti-envelope antibodies or GP120, right? GP120 was what? It wasn't the transmembrane, it was the docking one, right? It's the docking collector. Okay. And where do you find it? Uh, what gene uh, does it? It's the E or envelope, sorry. It's envelope, EMV. Okay. So when it starts off, uh, when you get infected with HIV RNA, right? It takes uh, about a month to, you know, have, I guess, arise over here and it peaks in the middle of between month one and two okay so as soon as you get infected it takes about a month or two for it to go it to peak so once it peaks it starts on spreading right so when it peaks it's still in the blood right that's why it's this much because when you're doing the markers you're doing the markers in the blood so you'll find the maximum amount of uh, this virus in the blood and between month one and two and then what happens is it starts spreading throughout the body and the organs bones and wherever it can go right so that's why it goes out of the blood and into the tissues and stuff the virus so that's why you get this drop and it drops below 400 okay so while this is happening what's happening to the CD count right you already have the CD T cells, CD4 T cells. Um, some of them is already there in the body. So when it senses that there is an infection, it's going to get active, right? So as this is rising, you can see this is also lowering itself. Uh, while this is at peak, this is at like uh, low, like 500. That's the normal amount it can go down to, right? for normal person so until now it's just doing what it normally does same thing with the virus it does what it normally does but then the virus spreads throughout the body and out of this uh, out of the blood so what's happening when it goes out of the blood CD uh, cells uh, function ma majorly in the blood right or lymph lymphoids uh, lymph and stuff uh, but lymph nodes and stuff or spleen but how does things get there right how do things get there it gets through blood so when it's out of the blood, uh, CD count actually has some time to recover. That's why there's a slow rise up there. Okay. Uh, then, after it's spread, uh, it's uh, replicated in the organs and stuff. After like three months, it starts rising again. Okay. Uh, as this rises, uh, it's get get picked up in the blood again. So again, this thing is gonna go and do its thing in the blood. So majorly it does it in the blood, right? So that's where it's gonna do. Uh, this goes downwards while this goes upwards. That's why it's related. So while it's over here and goes up, what we see is that there's also a CD8, cytotoxic T cell, right? While it's in clinical latency. What it means is uh, you're not gonna pick it up. Like you're not gonna see any symptoms here, right? that's what's happening so people don't know they're infected in this period they'll get sick initially uh, and they'll feel like the fever and stuff they'll feel the symptoms and then it will go away after like two months and they'll feel just fine but what's happening is it's replicating inside and then it's coming back for another fight so but that is going to take time uh, it takes like around as you can see three to four years for it to gain the peak for the second peak, right? Uh, then we have, uh, it does its thing over here and stuff. And now you're getting exhausted, right? Your immune system is getting exhausted now. So CD count, it cannot keep up with it uh, in the blood, so it goes down. So as this goes down, uh, the fight is gets easier for HIV. It keeps going up and up and up, right? So after this thing, uh, CD count goes lower than 400, that's when uh, AIDS, or you have AIDS, right? Or uh, you have, like, 
severe immune deficiency because now your your whole body is dependent on just the cytotoxic T cells. Uh, you don't have the cellular mediated uh, immunity or humoral immunity or anything like that because your CD can cell doesn't is what's responsible for all that as well, right? So when this goes down, this goes up, and this is where you start getting your skin and mucous membrane infections, right? You have your blisters and stuff and whatnot. And here is your pneumocystic gyrovichai uh, or uh, myobacterium avium and cryptosporidium stuff happening here below 200. Okay, so since this is exhausted, this is exhausted as well because this can only last like if you see like between uh the year eight and the year nine it took about one year it kept up the fight on uh, the cd8 but then even that one got exhausted right until now it was carried uh and it was strong so what actually happens here is uh since this is cd8 uh which is cytotoxic t cell uh this one is not called into action until like uh, this one falls, right? The CD can CD4 can't take care of it, so then it calls in for backup. So that's when the CD8 count has a peak. So when you uh, CD4 count is low, that's when the CD8 count is high. And yeah, and then after uh, when this goes high, you see this go down, right? Uh, below 400 so now it's under control so then this one also goes back down to its normal level normal level right and then it goes along because uh, then cd4 has enough time to recover and then it takes care of it uh, until like the eighth year uh, the year eight right when you started having this appearing and then it only holds on holds the fort for like a year and then that one goes down as well uh all of this uh the anti antibodies that you see for hiv the glycoprotein 120 the docking one uh it rises after about a month all the way up right because that's where as soon as uh cd count uh, cd4 count goes into action it also calls in the macrophages and uh basal plasma cells and b cells and stuff which makes your like uh, this antibodies right so the b cells make that so they go active and then you'll have once it peaks uh it just stays up there until you die okay or the person dies <laughs> okay and yeah i think that about covers it so let's read this uh dashed lines on cd4 cell count axis indicate more moderate uh, immunocompromise less than 400 cd4 cell uh, mill per millimeter cube and when aids defining illnesses emerge which is less than 200 right, so the blue thing i mean the cd4 count is less than 200 right here so that's where it starts uh, most patients who do not receive treatment eventually die of complications of HIV infections okay uh, but at this point I think the research has gone far enough that where a person with HIV can live a normal length of time for a normal length of time like an average person uh, four stages of untreated infection is flu like so that's the acute one that's over here where they feel the fever and all that stuff and then stage two is the latent uh, that's this one where they're feeling fine they don't even know that they have hiv uh, falling count that's this one right here the cd4 where this is happening and then the final crisis that's the aids defining illness uh, during clinical latency period phase, virus le replicates in lymph nodes. So that's where it replicates. Okay. So I said organs and stuff, but lymph node is an organ, so I wasn't wrong. Yeah. 
water break. Hold on. Okay. We saw it down. Uh, common diseases of HIV positive adults. Uh, decrease in CD4 cell count will react uh, will cause reactivation of past infections. For example, uh, tuberculosis or herpes simplex virus or shingles, right? Uh, dissemination of bacterial infections and fungal infections as well. For example, coccidiomycosis and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So this is where uh, your CD count is, you're going to pay attention to the CD count, right? Because they'll tell you that uh, this person is HIV positive with a CD cell count, CD4 cell count of this much. And then they're going to give you a few symptoms. Then you have to cancel out which one it can't be, right? Uh, we'll go through each one of them and it'll get easier that way. So CD4 cell count is less than 500. So for in these, uh, you'll get, you start getting uh, your fungal infection. So that's going to be oral thrush. This is uh, one of the, you know, if you have this, you have HIV. That's this thing. Because if, you, if your CD count is more than 500, you won't get uh, candida alkin or oral thrush, right? Uh, how do you know it's oral thrush? It's a scrapable uh, white plaque pseudo hyphae on microscopy you have to differentiate between this and leukoplakia what is leukoplakia it's right here uh, Epstein-Barr virus oral hairy leukoplakia it's unscrappable white plaque of on left side of the tongue right uh, then you have herpes simplex uh, sorry herpes 8 or Kaposi sarcoma uh, it kind of looks like shingles but darker we looked at the photo uh, perivascular spindle cells invading and forming vascular tumors on histology okay uh, they might say it's a round shiny uh, nodule it, it, that's also cop like Kaposi sarcoma uh, human papilloma virus that is uh, HPV and squamous remember uh, when we were doing HPV PV, I said, what did I say? That is associated with increased risk of HIV. So now we're going to talk about that. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma at site of sexual contact. So most commonly at anus, cervix, and oropharynx. So for that, it was made a side note for that too. Uh, this one condylomata acuminatum uh, HPV type 6 and 11 are wards they have a predilection for satisfied squamous epithelium so that's why it's found in square cervix vagina and anal canal and true vocal cords okay uh, yeah so if you see something white in the throat it's usually oral thrush uh, if they give you the CD4 cell count you know it's gonna be oral thrush because there's only many like so many things that are white in your mouth right one is gonna be candida albicin another time where this happens and they don't have HIV is uh, when they're doing using corticosteroid pump for asthma right um, you're supposed to when you use it you're supposed to wash out your uh, your mouth or gargle right so there's no more corticosteroid around that place because what does it do it suppresses immunity so if immunity is suppressed you're going to have fungal growth that's what basically this is uh, immunity is going down right uh, so EBV is oral hairy leukoplakia again uh, if it's not this it's going to be this uh, Kaposi sarcoma is just you gotta figure out it's herpes and then they'll tell you from the way it looks that is this uh, then 
HPV, we just went over it. And then you have mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, that's increased risk of reactivation of latent TB infection because all these, uh, basically all the CD4 counts, since it's fighting the virus, it's going to recruit everything it can. So it's going to recruit the macrophages as well. So the macrophages can't wall off TB anymore. So that's why you get this again. Now we're going to do CD4 uh, less than 200. Again, for TB, it's weight loss, cough, and um, maybe cavitation or some kind of, you know, thing on the apex. If there's a radio-opaque lesion on the apex of the lung, uh, it's only TB. Nothing else does that. If it's at the bottom, it could be this or it could be sarcoidosis. Uh, okay, so CD4 cell count less than 200 millimeter cube. Uh, this is when stuff gets serious. Height of uh, histoplasma plasma capsulatum. Uh, that's fever, weight loss, fatigue, cough, dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, oval yeast cells within macrophages. HIV, dementia. Uh, HIV causes dementia, HIV associated nephropathy. So you have cerebral atrophy of neuroimaging. They don't ask you about these. What they ask you about is this one. Uh, JC virus reactivation. It causes progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. It has a special brain scan. So you need to know what the brain scan for this looks like. I already went over it, but for thoroughness, I'll just do that. This is what it looks like. It's just multiple radiopicities you'll see on the brain. Right. So that's what that is. Uh, Non-enhancing areas of demyelination of uh, MRI. So it's not going to be so bright. It's just going to be, you know, pale like that. So these are too bright. But it's not going to be, you know, that bright on the scan. So this one is pretty good. So like that, that. Uh, then you have pneumocystis gyrovici, which is the uh, AIDS-defining disease, or pneumocystis pneumonia, ground glass opacities on chest imaging. If you have this, uh, you have AIDS. So if they tell you this person is suffering from this, it just means they're telling you that this person has is HIV positive. Uh, Okay, so CD4 cell count less than 100. So Bartonella species, you're now going to get bacillary angiomatosis. So yeah, that looks like this. Looks like a ball. So don't confuse it with uh, Kaposi sarcoma because it has a similar presentation. Right. Uh, it's multiple red to purple papules on no or nodules biopsy with neutrophilic inflammation uh, so this one happens when it's less than 100 and Kaposi happens it's between uh, 500 and 200 okay that's how you differentiate between the two they'll give you the count or they'll just tell you uh, that this person has uh, previous herpes infection and has a history of that or something or they have a cat because this was a cat scratch disease right so they might give you that too. Um, Candida elpkins, uh, esophagitis, uh, white plaques on endoscopy. Just because they have uh, enlarged lymph node because of this doesn't mean they have AIDS, by the way. Okay. Uh, Candida elpkins, uh, again, now it's going to cause esophagitis, white plaques on endoscopy, yeast, and pseudohyphion biopsy. So it happens uh, less than 100 in esophagus. Otherwise, it stays in the oral cavity. Uh, CMV, uh, cytomegalovirus, that's colitis, retinitis, esophagitis, encephalitis, uh, pneumonitis. Linear, uh, this is the one with the ally appearance on the histo uh, inclusion body, right? So you have linear ulcers on endoscopy, cotton wool spots on fundoscopy, 
um, biopsy reveals cells with intranuclear alloy inclusion bodies in there. Uh, Cryptococcus neoformans, meningitis, it causes meningitis, uh, encapsulated yeast on India ink, stain on uh, capsular antigen. So remember that this one causes meningitis. Uh, also remember this one causes encephalitis. Uh, they're similar but not the same thing. Uh, cryptosporidium species, chronic and watery diarrhea acid fast uh, oocytes and stool so again i told you if you have severe diarrhea and aids this is going to be the culprit uh, cryptosporidium ebv is uh, b cell lymphoma non-hodgkin lymphoma cns lymphoma cns lymphoma ring enhancing maybe solitary versus toxoplasmosis uh, if you see a ring it's always going to be toxoplasmosis and it happens in hiv right so you will go over that too. Uh, myobacterium avium, intracellular mycobacterium avium complex. This is also AIDS defining. Non-specific systemic symptoms: fever, night sweats, weight loss, and or uh, focal lymphadenitis. Most common if it's less uh, than CD count is less than fifty, and toxoplasma gondii is brain abscess, multiple ring enhancing lesions on this. How much time do we have? Four minutes. We have time to look at a brain scan for EBV. So if you have something like this, this is what it's going to look like. And you're going to be like, okay, so what is this? It looks like round, but I don't know what else it can be other than toxoplasmosis. Remember that in HIV, EBV causes this. Okay, so that's important to know. Uh, what other brain scan should we look at? Uh, encephalitis one. Uh, CMV, does that cause it? CMV, MRI. Uh, no, we don't. Is this the one? Cause Is it paraventricular? We'll figure it out when it comes. But mostly they ask about this and this. So uh, here, um, they also use the buzzword foamy cytoplasm. Okay, so remember that for this uh, and hepatosplenomegaly. I remember this one because um, there are birds everywhere, and avium is birds, right? So you don't get infected by birds normally, but you do if you have less than cd uh 50 sorry not 100 50 and then it starts affecting that's why it's also part of that and it has foamy cytoplasm because where it poops on you and it's kind of like a foam and yeah this one just remember it all right we'll take a break here and I'll so we're on primes now um this is an important subject they test you on this so know everything about this what are prions? They are disease. These are diseases which are caused by the conversion of a normal, uh, predominantly alpha helical uh, protein, termed prion proteins or PRPC, right? to a beta pleated form, so PRPSC, which is transmissible by via CNS related tissue, iatrogenic uh, CGD that's this thing or food contaminated by PSE infected animal products uh, variants of CGD uh, PRPCSC uh, resists protease degradation so this is uh, this is why this is bad right that's what they're going to explain now PRPSC resists protease degradation and facilitates the conversion of still more PRPC to PRPSC. So from alpha helical protein termed prion protein to a beta pleated form. Right? Uh, okay, so resistant to standard uh, sterilization uh, procedures. So this is why it's also bad. It's because uh, 
once it's on the instruments, uh, you can't get out, get it out by autoclaving it. So resin resistant to standard sterilizing procedures, including standard autoclaving. Accumulation of PRP uh, or prions uh, results in uh, spingiform, encephalopathy, and dementia, ataxia, startle myoclonus, and death. So here they will tell you that uh, there's a protein that's uh, escaping degradation, right? That's how they will explain prions. Or it's folded on itself because uh, that's what beta pleated form is. Or something like that where it's not being even though it's uh, it's bad uh, the cell can't get rid of it so accumulation of prions results in spongiform encephalopathy and dementia ataxia startle myoclonus and death so there are three types uh, there's Creutzfeldt and Jacob disease this is rapidly progressive dementia typically sporadic uh, some familiar form so it's going to seem like it's Alzheimer's uh, mostly it, that's what it seems like uh, with like Parkinsonism as well because of the ataxia and startle myoclonus uh, but for those they give other symptoms as well they won't tell you that the protein is like this right uh, in Alzheimer's like the tau protein is there and uh, in Parkinson they'll tell you that there's a lesion in the brain somewhere right in the base of ganglia somewhere so Creutzfeldt jacob disease so or cjd rapid progressive dementia typically sporadic some familiar form then there is bovine spongiform encephalopathy also called the mad cow disease this was also uh, back in like 2007 i think around that time uh, this was on the news and then there is crew uh, this is a tribe it's acquired prion disease noted in tribal population practicing human cannibalism right so then there's a person uh, that dies and they eat it and then that person had prions and then now they have prions because you can't get rid of it so you have ones then it spreads this one is from the cow, so it's called the mad cow disease. It's also made of prion, and then you have Creutzfeldt Jacob disease, which is uh, established by dementia, and typically, it's it's really fast. Like you'll see it in uh, a person who's like 30 year old, kind of like that, because dementia you usually see it at like 55 plus, right? So if you see it in so earlier, think of prions. Sometimes they'll just explain this bit right here uh, that there's a protein on a beat up pleated sheet or something like that. Uh, the crew, uh, just so you know what that is, I was. So that's what crew tribe is or are those. And they practice cannibalism and. And this disease is called the Kuru disease because of the prions. Okay. Uh, now we'll do the systems uh, like associated with the stuff. Normal microbiota, uh, dominant. Neonates delivered by C-section have microbiota enriched in skin commensals. Uh, so location skin it has uh, staph epidermidis uh, nose has staph epidermidis as well it's colonized by s aureus as well uh, oropharynx will have your verdance group streptococci dental plaque uh, verdance uh, sub section of verdance is s mutant mutants uh, that's the dental plaque uh, colon is b fragilis more than E. coli uh, so if you have appendicitis it's because of this this is the culprit uh, bacteroid fragilis more than likely this is the reason you have is it appendicitis uh, vagina lactobacillus so 
co and it's colonized by E. coli and group B strep as well. Okay, so if you have low levels of this, uh, that's when you get UTIs. Uh, sorry, uh, something that hold on, I got that backwards. I was right. Uh, the pH. That's uh, if the pH differs, because lacto. This it was keeps it uh, decreased, right? So acidic. Yeah, pH low, so it keeps it acidic. So if the pH goes up, that's when you get UTI. Okay. Right, so if this is low, then you get UTI. Uh, bugs causing foodborne illness. Okay, so S. aureus and B. cereus are food, po food poisoning. Uh, starts quickly and ends quickly for these two. Okay. Uh, this was in the potato salad, and this is from uh, fried rice. Uh, B serious so reheated rice food poisoning from reheated rice B serious uh, C botulinum that's improperly canned food in adults and raw honey in babies because of spores also in cans because it causes toxins to build up and in honey because of the spores uh, Clostridium perfringens uh, that's from reheated meat they don't ask about that one uh, e. coli they do ask about it's from undercooked meat uh, but they won't ask about this <laughs> uh, listeria they ask uh, deli meats uh, soft cheeses salmonella um, poultry meat and eggs uh, sres meats mayonnaise custard preformed toxin so the mayonnaise in the potato salad that's why that's where it will come up uh, then you have vibrio parahemolyticus or vibrio velnificus that's from raw and undercooked seafood or shellfish right um, this one also causes wound infection so V velnificus predominantly causes wound infection from contact with contaminated water or shellfish uh, bugs causing diarrhea. Uh, this is important because sometimes this is how you. This is like a determining factor of what it is, right? Uh, they'll say the person has diarrhea and it's bloody, or they have watery diarrhea, so it's going to be one of these or one of these. Uh, Campylobacter coma or s-shaped organism grows at 42 degrees celsius entamoeba histolytica is a protozoan amoebic dysentery liver abscess that's the anchovy paste one but they don't give you that they'll just say liver abscess uh, then you have this hold on. which one causes hydatus swiss Uh, echinococcus right granulosis okay. uh, then you have uh, EHEC or enterohemorrhagic E. coli uh, which causes hus so it has H in it so the one with H has a hus and it's similar to toxin because that also does hus uh, invasive one so E I E C uh, it invades the colonic mucosa that's why it causes bloody diarrhea and then so these two equalized is the e h and i ones okay uh, then you have uh, salmonella and shigella uh, this is the non-typhoidal one so not the type e one right it, the left one is the type e one so that was causing this one. Oh, they don't have it here oh never mind it was constipation and then diarrhea so but it wasn't watery or bloody okay so salmonella uh, you get lactose negative 
uh, flagellar motility has animal reservoir or especially poultry and egg okay so that's going to be your salmonella and shigella is going to be lactose negative very low uh, incubation so you don't need that much inoculum uh, then produces uh, it produces sugar toxin pus reservoir only and bacillary dysentery uh, Eucernia enterocolitis is there's going to, it's going to be a daycare outbreaks and pseudo appendicitis okay. uh, the watery diarrhea is C. difficile, so pseudomembranous colitis. You'll get some kind of membrane in the intestine. They'll tell you that. Or they'll tell you this person was in, uh, in the hospital for a long time. And uh, they, or they were going under some treatment which needed multiple antibiotics, especially clindamycin is the culprit. For this, uh, associated with antibiotics and PPIs, occasionally bloody diarrhea okay uh, C perfringens also causes gas gangrene uh, gases are co2 and h plus or h2 yeah enterotoxinogen uh, toxigenic uh, e. coli oh it was just hydrogen I'm sorry yeah so hydrogen and co2 uh, e tech E-tech, you tech, take your tech everywhere you go, wherever, everywhere you travel, right? So that's the traveler's diarrhea, T for travelers, H for hus, I for invasive, and P for pediatric. Okay. Uh, traveler's diarrhea produces heat label and heat stable toxins, protozoa, uh, uh, water diarrhea causing protozoas, right? So that's your giardia or uh, cryptosporidium vibrio cholera you should know about this one for sure it's coma shaped uh, organism rice water diarrhea often from infected seafood remember that that's the giveaway uh, viruses norovirus right so norwalk norwalk in uh, california so it's uh, one of the kelsey virus kelly c virus most common case in developed countries and then you have rota virus which was uh, real virus okay. uh, it decreased incidence in developed countries due to vaccination so in developed countries it's rare but it affects children and nor virus affects the adults so norovirus is most common in developed countries. That's why it affects the adults. And rotavirus uh, decrease in this country, but it still happens in children. Uh, enteric adenovirus. Okay. What do we know about adenovirus? That it's the only double-stranded linear DNA with no envelope. All the other ones have these two are at least circular right and this is a single stranded and these two are so it's just between these three and these three are I mean herpes and pox is uh, enveloped so adeno is the only one that's not enveloped and linear and double stranded okay so we did that uh, now common causes of pneumonia uh, this doesn't really help in the question it might tell you that the only thing that helps is this thing as pneumonia uh, in adults more than 40 years uh, so I'll go over it but it doesn't help just heads up <laughs> uh, neonates uh, pneumonia oh yeah this one is important sorry for neonates, this is the one they test you on, that's it, none of the other ones. So in neonates, pneumonia, uh, the causes are group B strep and E. coli. In children, viruses, RSV, mycoplasma, C. trichomatis, C. pneumonia, uh, S. pneumonia. Uh, in adults, it's mycoplasma, C. pneumonia, S. pneumonia, viruses, 
adults as pneumonia, age influenza, anaerobes, viruses, mycoplasma, and in adults it, above 65, it's as pneumonia, influenza virus, anaerobes, age influenza, and gram negative rods. Okay, uh, special groups alcohol overuse, Klebsiella, right? That's the number one if there is uh, abscess, but if there is no abscess. You gotta go for one of these uh, anaerobes. So Klebsiella and anaerobes usually due to aspiration. Right? Uh, this is when the patient is like found unconscious or has a history of alcoholism or they had like 10 beers or something. Uh, and what happens is like after that much they pass out or something and then they puke but then they are not up so they just puke and, and it some of it gets into their lungs uh, and while it does that the bacteria that were there get introduced into the lungs as well so that's how you get the aspiration pneumonia uh, so these are caused by peptostreptococcus fusobacterium Prevotella, and bacteroids uh, injection drug use is going to be as aureus uh, almost always it's going to be s aureus but it, uh, s pneumonia does that too and the way you differentiate between the two is that chart where it tells you it's coagulase positive or negative if it's in cluster or uh, chain you know if it's uh what was it optogen sensitive or not right and this is beta hemolytic and this is alpha hemolytic Okay, so aspiration, anaerobes, same thing, these are the anaerobes. Uh, atypical are your mycoplasma, mycoplasma is known for the walking pneumonia, chlamydia is known for being intracellular so you can't stain it, and when you treat it, you gotta treat uh, also gonorrhea, legionella is the one where it happens in water sources or like AC and you know, uh, in old age homes and cruise trips where the AC is closed system. If they mention something about AC or water or the person who uh, works and maintains the AC system, they're more prone to having this, okay? Uh, viruses, old age home have a lot of things. It can be, you know, even chlamydia can be there. Uh, Legionella and uh, uh, they can have norovirus, C. difficile. All of this can happen at old age home. Uh, then viruses. Atypical viruses are RSV, CMV, influenza, adenovirus. Uh, cystic fibrosis. Most of the time it's going to be this one. But if they tell you there are abscesses and stuff, it's going to be this. And then there's also S pneumonia and Bucharelia that you need to know about. So if they don't give you the first one, they'll give you the second one. If they don't give you that, they'll give you one of these two. But most of the time it's gonna be pseudomonas. They'll tell you the pigment uh, when they cultured it was blue or green. So that's pseudomonas. If it was yellow, then it's this, golden yellow. And for this, they'll just describe the test. Like it was optogen uh, sensitive. For this one, it was, I forget, was it right under it, as pneumonia? It's not even gram positive. That's why I couldn't remember it. I was thinking of the wrong place. It's pseudomonas. Okay. So it's along with pseudomonas. That's why. Okay. Okay, so Pseudomonas and Bucharelia oxidase positive, and 
something something uh, immunocompromised as SREs uh, enteric uh, gram negative rods so that's just anaerobes as well right you know, like your plebsiella I think was the rod gram negative rods never mind it's pseudomonas salmonella shigella protease eucernia E. coli and klebsiella fungi viruses and pneumocystis zero which I with HIV health associated healthcare associated uh, are Esorius, Pseudomonas, and other enteric gram negative rods. Post viral enteric ones would be, I guess, E. coli. I'm not sure if these are rods or not, so that's why I'm not naming them. But Klebsiella is, so you can name that. And E. coli. A bacteroid is, right, uh, Fragilis, I think. Uh, okay, so post viral S pneumonia, S aureus, and H influenza, and COPD. Uh, you get S pneumonia, H influenza, M catarrhalis, and Pseudomonas when you have COPD. Okay, catarrhalis is kind of like a uh, runny nose, right? So you think of that. That goes with COPD. And H influenza goes with that too. So remember, as pneumonia and pseudomonas, these won't come along with it. Uh, common cause of meningitis. This they ask again only in newborn. So that's important. So here it was for pneumonia, group B strep, E. coli for newborn. Here it's group B strep, E. coli again for meningitis as well. But also listeria. That's the only one you need to know about these. These ones they do ask, but it's always going to be S pneumonia first and N meningitis uh, second. That's all you remember. So in children six to six years, it's just S pneumonia and meningitis. And then if you want to remember these, H influenza type B, group B streptococcus, and enterovirus. Uh, then you have. So if they say that. Uh, this person has meningitis and it's viral and it's probably this it, then it's going to be your enterovirus okay all the other ones are bacteria uh, similarly if it's between 6 to 60 it's going to be S pneumonia or N meningitis but then if they tell you it's a virus then it could be enterovirus or herpes uh, then you have 60 plus uh, S pneumonia and meningitis, uh, but H influenza type B, group B streptococcus, and listeria as well. But definitely remember it for the newborns, for meningitis, and also this. Uh, give streptrigon, this is what you treat it with streptrigon and vancomycin empirically, add ampicillin if listeria is suspected. Viral causes of meningitis, enterovirus, especially Coxsackie virus, and herpes simplex 2 or 1, encephalitis. HIV, West Nile virus also causes encephalitis. We know that. And uh, rare soil zoster virus. Just know that this is what you give, right? And uh, you give rifampicin or rifampin. For close contact because family puts the fam in rifampin uh, okay in HIV uh, cryptococcus species causes meningitis sorry no uh, incidence of group B streptococcal meningitis and neonates have has decreased greatly due to screening and antibody prophylaxis in the pregnancy incidence of that's the this one right because you had to you 
you have to test the pregnant woman at 37 weeks I believe uh, and if it's positive you give them penicillin intrapartum so antibiotic prophylaxis and pregnancy incidence of H influenza meningitis has de decreased greatly due to conjugate H influenza vaccination with the pneumococcal uh, pneumococci one uh, today cases are usually seen in unimmunized children so that was pneumococci one is the PPSV 13 or PPV 13 uh, okay then you have cerebral spinal fluid findings in meningitis this is the most important one out of this page that you need to remember because this is how you're going to figure out if the meningitis is bacterial, fungal, or viral. Once you have that figured out, it's easy to answer a question. Because out of like four or five answers, uh, two of them will be like viral, two of them are bacterial, two of them are like fungal, or one of them will be fungal. Right? And then you have to figure out only between the two ones. So you have like 50% of getting it right then. That's why it's important to differentiate it between these. And the way you do it is this one they don't give you. So this is pointless. But anyways, uh, opening pressure is increased in all of them. Maybe it's normal and viral. That's it. Uh, this is the most important one. If you have uh, neutrophils, so they tell you that there is leukocytosis. Right, but then they tell you that 85% of it are, is neutrophils or uh, increase in lymphocytes. You know, that's how you figure out this. So if it's neutrophils, it's going to be bacterial cause. But you have increased lymphocytes, then it's going to be fungal or viral. So how do you differentiate between these two, right? Uh, you look at the protein and glucose. The protein is, can be normal in viral and glucose as well because virus doesn't need food right it doesn't need food to replicate what it needs is uh, DNA and RNA polymerase and stuff like that because it's RNA dependent most of them so this one is going to be protein is normal or glucose is normal what requires food bacteria and fungal right so protein is going to be normal but the food come food comes from here the energy comes from glucose so bacteria uses glucose fungus uses glucose and that's how we differentiate between these also they'll give you more than just this so it they usually just spoon feed you the answers in the question uh, infections causing brain abscess uh, most commonly virgin streptococci and staphylococcus aureus Okay, so most commonly in brain, causing brain abscess. So it's going to be written streptococcus staphylococcus aureus. If dental infection or extraction precedes abscess, oral anaerobes commonly involved. So that's going to be this one, I guess. There are only two reasons something to do with dentists or dental infection or extraction occurs, right? One of them is this and the other one is actinomyces. Okay. Uh, multiple abscess are usually from bacteremia. Okay, so multiple abscesses are... So if it was uh, dental extraction uh, precedes abscess, so abscess one was I think uh, actinomyces. Yep. So abscess one is actinomyces, and the uh, weirdness one is the one that causes endocarditis because of cavity and plaques. That's the S mutants. Wait, no. Yeah, S mutants. I think. Uh, then you have toxoplasma reaction 
reactivation in AIDS. I missed one, right? Multiple abscesses are usually from bacteremia, single lesions from contagious sites, uh, that's otitis media, well, and mastoid, 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 it is, okay, mastoiditis, which leads to temporal lobe and cerebellum. You need to know this path because they test you on that. Uh, so it goes from otitis media and mastoid, mastoiditis, which leads to temporal lobe and cerebellum. So then you're going to have temporal lobe uh, symptoms and they will be like, oh, where did this come from or what? where did this uh, originate, this infection? So then you have to know that it originated in otitis media and then it went through the mastoids and then it went into temporal lobe and cerebellum. Sinusitis or dental infection will go to frontal lobe. Uh, toxoplasma reactivation in AIDS. Uh, osteomyelitis, SREs, right? That we read in that mostly. And salmonella. It also happens in this area. Okay, so risk factor associated infection. Assume if no other information is available, then it's SREs if they don't give you anything else. Uh, sexual active, sexually active. Uh, if they give you that, then it's going to be Nizuria gonorrhea. Uh, or in gonorrhea uh, septic arthritis is more common though than osteomyelitis uh, sickle cell disease uh, salmonella and sorius causes osteomyelitis and sickle cell disease and prosthetic joint replacement again that's going to be majorly this one staph uh, epidermidis but then because that is the giveaway that there was a joint replacement, right? A joint replacement, hip replacement, valve replacement, any kind of those things, it's going to be this. But just know that it also happens because of this. Uh, vertebral involvement, SREs, and tuberculosis, pot disease, right? So pot is what tuberculosis in the bones, right? Uh, cat and dog bites was pasarella, so pasarella multocida, yes, uh, they ca that causes osteomyelitis as well, they'll just cause myelitis everywhere, wouldn't it? <laughs> Injection drug use uh, is SREs, also pseudomonas and candida, but majorly it's just SREs, unless they give you like the culture data and it was blue or you know the person has HIV then it's going to be like Canada or something like that but yeah uh, elevated ESR and CRP sensitive but not specific right CRP is just basically that there's some kind of inflammation so this is inflammation of the bone so you know there's something going on because of that ESR is just erythrocyte uh, sedimentary rate uh, this is increase because of the leukocytes uh, you'll have neutrophils increased right so that will increase the uh, a lot of stuff and then that will cause you know erythrocytes as well and all that so it will be heavier so a lot more stuff will uh, go down faster uh, also platelets and that stuff too so elevated ESR and CRP sensitive, but not specific. Uh, radiographs are insensitive early, but can be useful in chronic osteomyelitis. So early, in early, you can't really see anything different. This looks normal to untrained eye. But here, even though, you know, it just looks scary just by itself, even if you didn't know what this is. Uh, so on the left, okay, so that's the early and chronic, I guess. MRI, okay, MRI, never mind, this is an MRI, that's why it's scary. So, in chronic, you can tell, I can't tell anything from here. Maybe that little thing over there, but, yeah, I can't tell. That didn't help at all. MRI is best for detecting acute infection and detailing 
anatomic involvement so that's a right so that's this one biopsy or aspiration with culture necessary to identify organism okay so prior to that if you want to identify it so they don't give you this so you don't have to worry about it the only time you get x-rays for a uh, limb like this a femur or something is when they're discussing uh, dislocation hip dislocation or avascular necrosis of the head of the femur also sometimes for vitamin d deficiency rickets or you know osteosarcomas and all that stuff the cancer of bone those are the only times you see it uh, red red rashes of childhood okay so you have Coxsackie type A So you have Coxsackie type A, hand, foot, mouth disease. That's oval shaped vesicle on palms and soles. So that thing right there. Vesicle and ulcer in oral mucosa as well. That's why it's called palms and sole, hand, foot, and then ulcers in mouth. So mouth disease. This is classic presentation. They will give you this, that there's something here and here, and then something in mouth as well. They might not say it's a rash or oval shape. They might not describe it. But if they give you three things, palms and sole and mouth, it's going to be hand, foot, mouth disease. And it's part of what? Which family? Perch. Perch was picorna. Uh, herpes wi virus. Uh, six, roseola. Asymptomatic rose-colored macules appear on body after several days of high fever. Can present with febrile seizures usually affects infants uh, measles uh, measles is uh, we don't worry about that confluent rash beginning at the head and moving down proceeds by cough coryza and conjunctivitis with blue white uh, spots or complex spots on buccal mucosa pyrovirus b19 that's erythema infect Sheosome or fifth disease or also known as slap cheek rash on the face see this is why it's called the uh, slap cheek disease right and then now here are this rub rubella uh, it's part of what rub it on the mat uh, so meton metonovirus metonavirus that's what this one belongs to now uh, rubella Pink macules and papules begin at the head and move down, remain discreet. Find disquamating truncal rash and post-auricular lymphadenopathy. So that's the buzzword here. The rash, as you can see, it gets confusing, right? And even if you spend time remembering it, you're not going to recall it for like in 20 seconds. And even if you do, you're not going to be confident about it. But what you can be confident about is this post arcal lymphadenopathy for rubella, um, slap cheek for parvo, uh, blue white coplic spot for measles, and for Coxsackie, it's the hand foot mouth disease, it's in the name. For this one, you have fever, it gets resolved, then you get rash. Then you have uh, rubella, we did that, okay. Streptococcus pyogenes, it causes a scarlet fever. That one is known for uh, this thing, strawberry tongue. That's the most important one. That's the giveaway. Sore throat, sarcomboral paler. <coughs> uh, group A strep, rash, it's sandpaper-like from neck to trunk and extremities. This is a sandpaper-like rash is a buzzword, but they don't give you that. Uh, lymphadenopathy and atherogenic toxin so if you have sandpaper like or strawberry tongue it's going to be scarlet fever and scarlet fever it happens because of streptococcus pyogenes don't confuse it with pneumonia or something else right it's streptococcus pyogenes uh, varicella zoyster 
or chicken pox and shingles so vesicular rash begins on trunk spreads to face and extremity with lesions of different stages that's the buzzword for this they'll tell you that uh, there's fluid filled lesions on the body and some of them is dry some of them is like uh, big some of them are like small like that so they're all going to be different none of them are going to be like similar to one another they won't explain it that way so if it's a vesicular rash that's just or like fluid filled lesion or papule or something vesicle sorry uh, okay so urinary tract infection uh, cystitis presents with dysuria frequency your urgency suprapubic pain and WBCs but not WBC casts in urine right. uh, primarily caused by ascension of microbes from urethra to bladder you need to know this this is how it gets there uh, it's because women have shorter urethra than men that's why they're more prone to this uh, ascension to kidney results in pyelonephritis which prevents presents with fever chills flank pain uh, costo vertebral angle tenderness hematuria and wbc cast 10 times more common in females shorter urethra colonized by fecal microbiota risk factor is obstruction for example kidney stones and enlarged prostate kidney surgery catheterization congenital uh, genital urinary malformation like vesicle urethral reflux for example and diabetes and pregnancy all of these are risk factors right for uti for uti you need to know that uh this thing right here and this thing right here everything else is okay uh how do you differentiate it between uh uti and something else it's this thing right here so cystitis presents with dysuria frequency urgency suprapubic pain and wbc uh, but not the casts. The cast happens if it's because of something related to uh, kidney. That's when you get it. Okay, in the urine. So if you don't have casts in W, uh, and you have WBC in the urine, then it's because of something after the kidney that's going on. At, going on. Uh, species E. coli feature leading cause of uti colonies show strong pink lactose fermenting on mcconkey agar uh, remember that it's this on this and on emb it's green uh, staphylococcus saprophyticus that's in like uh, reproductive age women uh, second leading cause of uti particularly in young sexually active females uh, klebsiella pneumonia pneumonia uh, that's third leading cause of uti large mucoid capsule and viscous colonies viscous colonies sorry not viscous <laughs> viscous colonies okay for this uh they might tell you that it's uh, mucoid or they might tell you that they might just explain the whole you know gram negative rod uh and when it was cultured it was like I don't know, red, I think, or Sirisha was red, sorry. Not sure for this one, how they explain it. Normally, they would say that there's a red currant jelly like sputum, but you don't have sputum here, so I guess mucoid is the only way to go. But normally, if it's UTI, it's going to be this or chlamydia or gonorrhea that they're concerned about in the question. Unless they give you everything that, you know, they tell you it's not gonorrhea, uh, it was negative for that, it was negative for E. coli, there were no nitrates found on culture, uh, no pink colonies and stuff like that, then they'll give you that it's, it was uh, in cluster, a coca is in cluster, so then you go for this one. Uh, Cerisia is uh, some strains produce a red pigment, often healthcare associated and drug resistant. That's the red one. Enterococcus, uh, often healthcare associated and drug resistant. Uh, Proteus mirabilis, this is the staghorn one. Uh, motility causing causes warming, 
on agar so that have swarming motility that's different than tumbling motility found in listeria associated with struvite stone produces uh, urease pseudomonas arginosa blue green pigment on and fruity odor usually a healthcare associated and drug resistant know about this that it causes fruity odor and it looks like grapes because uh, they might or might not give you this but if they don't give you this they will give you this fruity order uh, but fruity order in the urine is different than fruity order and uh, around the UTI is different than uh, fruity order in the mouth right fruity order in the mouth is DKA fruity order in the urine is either ketones or uh, if it's in the diaper it could be they might say like it's burnt sugar uh, or you know sweet but that was for deficiency of arginine dehydrogenase deficiency something like that uh, then this one is this then diagnostic markers so positive leukocyte esterase evidence of WBC activity and there is the positive nitrate test so all of these give you nitrate I guess okay. uh, reduction of urinary nitrates by gram negative bacterial species for example E. coli so if they give you nitrates and leukocyte esterase was positive they're usually talking about you know E. coli or at least gram negative bacteria but most of the time when they mean this they only bring this up when they're talking about UTIs and it's usually E. coli uh, common vaginal infection so we're going to do bacterial vaginosis trichomonas vaginitis and candida vulva vaginitis right uh, for bacterial vaginosis it's going to be this clusa the buzzword so if you don't know what that is blue cells this is what it looks like this is I think the exact photo they use but it, just look at the different ones right. so that is a clue cell that's a clue cell it's look like it looks like a cell with garden around it so uh, no inflammation thin wait I think I said it wrong because that would be gardenella right what page is this 179 okay. okay I'm not spelling it right Okay, yeah, so Gardnerella, Gardnerella vaginalis also has clusos and also trichomatous vaginitis. Is it the same thing? Is that why I'm getting confusing? No, it's not. So this is non painful and vaginitis is. vaginosis so there's no inflammation uh, it's thin and there's a white discharge and fishy odor so if you see fishy odor and white discharge uh, this is going to be the one uh, lab finding will be that the pH is more than 4.5 remember uh, it needs to be uh, acidic so if when it's not acidic you get uh, infections there so that's why they don't recommend uh, douching or cleaning that area too much because that will lower because the use of soap lowers the acidity of that area so that's why they don't recommend that uh, two cell pH more than 4.5 uh, plus uh, KOH VIF test treatment is metronidazole or clindamycin 
Uh, Trichomonas vaginitis. Okay, so metronidazole and clindamycin for this and this, both of them. And both of them will be happen in pH more than 4.5. For this, you do the WIF test uh, and you get the fishy odor. And when you see it, there will be white discharge. And giveaway is that the lab finding is has the clue cell. Uh, Trichomonas vaginitis, this is the strawberry cervix uh, inflammation. Wait, so this was Gardnerella then. This is the vaginitis, my bad. Inflammation, uh, sir, uh, strawberry cervix, frothy, yellow green, foul smelling. This will be yellow green uh, discharge, right? Uh, and this is also foul smelling, uh, but this one is frothy, and this one was thin. Okay, uh, you have motile pear shaped uh, trichomonads. Apparently, it's these things that looks like pears apparently <laughs> yeah you're not gonna get it from this just know the findings if it's yellow green it's vaginitis if it's strawberry tongue cervix they'll give you that uh, pH more than 4.5 as well metronidazole treat sexual partners as well obviously uh, Canada vaginitis, vulva vaginitis, that's inflammation, thick, white, cottage cheese, and discharge. Oh. Okay. And this is what they give you, that there's like sort of high fee, or they might just give you a photo that has Canada in it, and like the germ tubes. Uh -huh. And and as always is the treatment. The pH here is normal. So it's between four to 4.5. Uh, water break. Uh, sexually transmitted infections, uh, disease, clinical features, and pathogens. AIDS. Uh, clinical features, opportunistic infections, like the also AIDS defining infection, Kaposi sarcoma, herpes, and uh, lymphoma, uh, non Hodgkin's. Okay. Uh, pathogen is HIV. you need to know cancroid that's the syphilis type 1 it's painful genital uh, genital ulcer with exudate wait painful so that's not the one they're talking about then in HIV uh, syphilis oh sorry no okay I know why I messed up that one is called canker right there canker Don't make fun of me, man. Oh my god. That's why I got confused. So, cancroid is the painful one, canker is the painless one. So, if you have cancroid, that's painful genital, genital ulcer with exudate and inguinal adenopathy. So, you're gonna have a uh, lymph node. Uh, adenopathy, lymphadenopathy, as well as uh, painful. So that's going to be age, do you cry? Do you see cry? Or do you, do you cry? I'll just say that. So it's so painful you do cry, right? So this is going to be the most painful one out of all of these. 